Foreword and Introduction of Women of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Céline Major. Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens. Foreword. The women of the French Revolution is so vast a theme that hitherto, even in France, it has not yet met with anything like exhaustive treatment. Michelet himself admits that the title of his book, Les Femmes de la Révolution, is misleading, and that he has written of a few heroines rather than of the mass of revolutionary women. A much later writer, M. Adrien Lasserre, in his work on women's participation in the Revolution, says that he has found it impossible to cover completely a field so extensive. The attempt which M. Lasserre has renounced cannot be made here. All I hope to do is to give some idea of the rank and file of revolutionary women, and of their famous leaders during little more than a brief period of five memorable years. That period extends from May 1789 until July 1794, with some glances now and then before and after. One aspect of this subject of revolutionary women, their connection with the secret societies of the day, I have purposely ignored. It is obscure and highly controversial. Unfortunately, though these societies have been much written about, and especially of late, it has often been in a partisan spirit. This book will constantly deal with parties, but I trust not in the spirit of a partisan. Of the three methods of treating this subject, the strictly chronological method, the biographical, and a classification according to the play of ideas and the modes and fields of action, I have chosen the last. Though it has its drawbacks, one of which is some slight repetition, it seems to me that this method gives the clearest impression of the movement as a whole, and of the part women played in it. I have spent some time in the Bibliothèque Nationale, consulting pamphlets published during the Revolution, and in the Galerie des Etampes, looking through portfolios of contemporary prints. Otherwise I can lay no claim to having made any original research. I have reaped where others have sown and gladly do I here acknowledge my debt and record my gratitude, first to Professor Ola for the interest he has taken in this book and the help he has given me in writing it, and then to the works of Professor Albert Mathieu, M. Louis Madelet, M. Adrien Lasserre, M. Léopold Lacour, M. Léon Abinsour, Le Baron Marc de Villiers, and other living writers on the Revolution, as well as to their predecessors who are no longer with us. Introduction Quote, Les femmes furent à l'avant-garde de notre révolution. Il ne faut pas s'en étonner, elles souffraient davantage. Michelet, Les femmes de la révolution. Write down the ten centuries of French history, there have been few political movements in which women have not played some known part. But never has there been one in which they have been so widely or so intimately associated as with the revolution. Mingling in all its most fundamental crises and most vivid scenes we see woman in her infinite variety. Women of every type, class, and occupation, from the most ignoble to the most noble, from the lowest to the highest. Women of every kind of attainment. Women of every shade of temperament. Women of the street. Women of the market. Police women. Blue stockings. Social butterflies. Club women. Platform women. Housewives, mothers of families, actresses, flower girls, servant girls, salon ladies, mystics, prophetesses, goddesses of reason. Not a tone, not a semitone in the whole scale of femininity is unsounded. From the vulgarity and hysteria of les insulteuses and les tricoteuses, to the culture of a Madame de Stal and the calmness of a Madame Roland, Differing widely in status and in secondary political opinions, these women were all ardent en civisme, as the phrase went then, the baser no doubt frequently because they were paid for it, but others because they were passionately devoted to the public wheel. Their views as to what constituted the public wheel varied, of course, according to position, intellect, and training. For the market women and housewives who took part in the hunger march to Versailles on the 5th October 1789, the public wheel depended mainly on a plentiful supply at a moderate price of the necessaries of life. For feminists, like Olympe de Gouges, it depended on the establishment of sex equality. For enthusiastic Girondists, like Charlotte Corday, on the overthrow of a political party and the death of its leader. For Democrats, like Madame Robert, Mademoiselle de Keralio, on the establishment of a republic. 
and there were a few who had a wider vision who although ardent patriots dreamed of an international brotherhood and of human solidarity among these rare spirits were madame roland and madame de condorcet who gladly welcomed into their salons and applauded in the parliament foreigners like tom paine and anarchasis clutz there was also poor tirouagne de mericourt the victim of an outrage perpetrated by her own sex who even in the ravings of madness was haunted by an overwhelming desire for unity among classes and factions and even perhaps among nations during this period of national upheaval while the foundations of society seemed to rock and reel french women displayed a faculty for cooperation and organization in public matters which they had never shown before and which they have seldom displayed since nowadays as they are the first to admit they lag far behind their british sisters in this matter a proof of it came to my knowledge only the other day when an international group of professional women applying for help to a distinguished frenchwoman received the reply that she was too much occupied by her own profession and her own family to take any part in the movement madame roland was an excellent maîtresse de maison and yet she never permitted her household duties to occupy her more than two hours a day she was her husband's secretary but she also found time to be the leader of a political party she was a woman of letters but when her husband was in ill health she found time to prepare all his meals with her own hand any one engaged in public work knows that it is always the most occupied who can find time to take on more work for the obvious reason that the more one has to do the better one has to organize many a woman of the revolution besides madame roland made this discovery perhaps this is one of the reasons why the woman's movement during the four years which followed the fall of the bastille attained proportions which in france it has never reached since these four years present us as we shall see in the last chapter of this book with a complete drama of feminism in four acts its dawn in the writings of that apostle of sex equality condorcet its zenith in the influence exercised by women in the revolution clubs and societies its decline when women fell into disfavor with robespierre and his colleagues finally its collapse when the anti-feminists of the convention closed the women's clubs and began to lay the foundations of the napoleonic code which was to constitute the most serious reverse ever suffered by the women's cause in any country but the majority of the revolution women were far from being feminists like olympe de gouges and claire lacombe or anti-feminists like madame roland and therese cabarus most of them were too concerned with the wider human interest to give feminism or anti-feminism a thought a conspicuous few supported the revolution by methods which were new as far as women were concerned they organized women's clubs harangued parliament and spoke on public platforms a still smaller group shouldered arms and one even wielded the assassin's knife but the majority were content to tread the more beaten tracks to exert their influence through their menfolk to bring up their children in revolution principles to knit socks and red phrygian caps for their heroes to make lint and bandages for the wounded to nurse in hospitals to encourage their men even in the darkest days by organizing fetes banquets processions and patriotic plays to beguile the tediousness of club meetings with songs music and dancing to sacrifice on the altar of la patrie their money and their jewels and when the need came to exercise that one political privilege which was never denied to them to offer up their own lives on the scaffold clever women of the leisured classes continued as long as they were permitted to exercise their influence in the time-honored french way of the salon these revolution drawing-rooms served as a meeting-place for the leaders of the various factions and in them many an important program was drawn up and decisive incident planned at the opposite end of the social scale the hooligan women of paris foregathered in the palais royal and suillery gardens and in the various markets of the metropolis there they were always ready to raise a riot whenever the commune or the sections or one of the clubs required it in the early years of the revolution women's assistance of every kind was constantly solicited by the men's leaders some of whom in those days were distinctly feminist in their sympathies the abbe Sayes would have given women parliamentary votes condorcet would have gone further and made a small number eligible for parliament the jacobin club entrusted to women highly important political missions the cordelier club listened in trance to feminine oratory and in that art members of the convention took private lessons from actresses 
the commune stooped to employ the lowest of women as insulteuse paid to hurl gibes at the condemned as they passed through the streets on their way to the guillotine even later in seventeen ninety four when it was a question of defending robespierre on the ninth of thermidor his faithful friend fleuriot lescaut demanded from the jacobin club de solides gaillards robust fellows femmes comprises including women during the first years of the revolution women were honored for services rendered medals were struck to commemorate their achievements a banner was given them behind which they were to march to public ceremonies and on the banner was worked in the motto thus they drove the vile tyrant like a prey before them this honorable treatment continued as long as women were content to follow meekly in the wake of their lords and masters but as the revolution proceeded and as the women's political education progressed they committed the unpardonable sin they began to hold opinions of their own they dared to criticize their masculine fellow-workers not sparing the incorruptible himself the robespierre whom they had formerly deified henceforth in the opinion of their masculine fellow-workers they could do nothing right they were too hot or too cold too extreme or too moderate too cruel or too lenient they must be got rid of banished from the political scene thrust down and kept in a subordinate position on the thirtieth of october seventeen ninety three the national convention suppressed all women's clubs and societies in the same year it closed their salons on the ninth of november it met to discuss whether women were capable of exercising political rights the ancien regime be it noted had never denied this capacity from King Philippe le Bel's convocation of the First States General in 1302, down to their meeting on the eve of the revolution, women of property had from time to time not only voted for local and central assemblies, but now and again, as in the case of Madame de Sévigny, had sat and deliberated in provincial parliaments. Now, after five centuries, women were to lose this right. With women's help, the Jacobin members of the National Convention had triumphed over their political enemies they could now afford to dispense with feminine assistance. Of the two champions of women's rights during the early years of the revolution, Condorcet was in hiding, and C.A.S., who had been the orator of the Constituent Assembly in the convention, had forsaken the platform for the silent benches of Le Marais. When the proposal to deprive women of political rights was brought forward, only one comparatively unimportant member spoke against it. With unconscious irony, these tempestuous administrators of the terror argued that the one essential qualification for all who would take part in politics is the possession of imperturbable equanimity. It was impossible for women ever to attain to the eventual element of calm. For women, therefore, there was no room in politics. Once and forever the gentlemen of the imperturbable sex slammed the doors of citizenship in women's faces. And with what result? Did the revolution purified from women's direct influence at once regain its balance? Let those who would know read the record of the convention during the next six months down to Robespierre's execution. So much for the effect of this measure on the government. As for its effect on women themselves, we have only to look at the type of woman who prevailed during the directory, irresponsible, empty-headed, and frivolous. The directory woman, say the de Goncourts, fleeing from the seriousness that had attempted to Romanize and Sparticize her, became a courtesan. The women of the directory drew France towards their patron, pleasure. Soon they were the mistresses, the queens of a country which was plunging into luxury, diamonds, festivity, and gallantry. That country fell a prey to pillow government. Napoleon married a typical directory woman, Josephine Beauharnais whom he had met in a typical directory salon, that of Thérèse Cabarrus, then Madame Tallien. Faced with Josephine's debts, harassed by her amours, Napoleon became convinced of the utter irresponsibility of woman. He had no doubt that if social order were to be secured, every woman must be as much the property of some man as a gooseberry bush is the property of the gardener. Consequently, Article 312 of the Code Napoleon decrees that a wife shall obey her husband. At Fontainebleau or some other museum there is, or was, I hear, the leather armchair in which Napoleon used to sit when discussing the draft code with his counselors. The leather cushions are terribly torn and slashed. Each rent represents a gash inflicted by this anti-feminist in his fury at his counselors' attempts to persuade him to alter the draft of the articles in women's favor. 
the articles remained as napoleon had planned them the code which deprived frenchmen of many political rights acquired during the revolution compensated them by making them tyrants in their own homes end of forward and introduction chapter one part one of women of the french revolution by winifred stevens this librivox recording is in the public domain one part one women agitators from the place de la bastille to the chateau of versailles quote, the inert were roused and lively natures rapt away wordsworth it is creditable to the women of the revolution that their first gesture was one of pity the fact that the pity was misplaced lavished on an unworthy object an impostor none other than the so-called latude a prisoner in the bastille does not lessen its merit neither need the date of this gesture some years before the revolution exclude it from these pages for it exercised a determining influence upon the course of the movement every reader of history knows that many a new era has been born of a misapprehension of some mensonge grand et saint glorieuse imposture the story of the revolution is full of myths and legends producing important crises and events among these fictions not the least determining were those that centred in the bastille by the time the revolution broke out this feudal fortress had almost fallen into disuse it contained only a few prisoners some of whom lived there in great comfort in well-furnished rooms ordering their own food and their own clothing on one occasion paris shops were ransacked for flowered silk of a certain pattern required by a lady prisoner in the bastille this was fact fiction painted a very different picture it showed a dungeon l'enfer de la bastille crowded with the king's enemies who languished there in conditions of indescribable horror that this imaginary picture was the one imprinted on the mind of the french nation was largely due to a woman to a woman of the lower middle class one madame le gros the wife of a parisian shopkeeper whether a grocer or a haberdasher seems doubtful it was a mere accident that aroused madame le gros interest in the bastille walking one day down the street called les fossés the dykes of st germain l'auxerrois her eye fell on a piece of paper lying on the ground she picked it up and saw it was covered with writing this she read and found to be the complaint of a prisoner when henri masser marquis de latude who for thirty-five years so said the paper had suffered unjust imprisonment in the bastille and other dungeons madame le gros seized with pity took the paper home showed it to her husband and together they resolved not to rest until the prisoner was set free they got into communication with latude and with amazing courage and enterprise started an agitation for his release madame le gros we are told had like stern's lady in the glove shop been in the habit of talking pleasantly on all manner of subjects to her husband's customers to them and to others she now began to talk about latude for the purpose of expatiating on his misery she made acquaintances wherever she could especially with servants in the houses of the great thus at length she gained access to influential people one of these was the cardinal de rohan this prince of the church was induced to take an interest in the prisoner he spoke of latude to his friends in that sentimental tearful age the wave of compassion quickly rose and spread it spread from house to house as madame le gros in her shabby clothes told the prisoner's tale and distributed in the most influential quarters the particulars of his sufferings described by himself she was immensely aided by her protege's eloquence latude was an adept at painting his woes in lurid colours indeed he had spent the greater part of his life in doing nothing else his story as he told it was irresistible great ladies madame de luxembourg madame de boufflers dissolved in tears as they read it the wife of the controller general madame necker and her brilliant daughter madame de stal became the prisoner's advocates the french academy took up his case its perpetual secretary d'alembert the great philosopher waxed indignant as he meditated on latude's sufferings not paris alone but the provinces joined in madame le gros campaign of mercy finally the queen marie antoinette herself was touched she pleaded for latude with the king but here madame le gros experienced her first rebuff she and her friends had heard of the marquis de latude's marvellous escapes from the bastille and vincennes 
they knew about the ingenious ladder one hundred and eighty feet long which he and his fellow prisoner had made out of pieces of wood and shreds of their own clothing but louis when he came to read latude's dossier knew much more than this he knew that the so-called marquis de latude was in reality a penniless army barber denry by name a wild impostor who as the result of an absurd stratagem designed to bring him to the notice of madame de pompadour had found himself lodged in the bastille where he had been kept in great comfort at the crown's expense louis knew more still for he read that more than once the pseudo latude had lost the chance of release by haggling over the sum to be paid him in compensation for his alleged sufferings louis moreover was from his personal knowledge aware that latude had actually been set free in seventeen seventy seven but that he had made such a bad use of his liberty extorting money from helpless females by threats and making false charges against louis's ministers that it had been necessary to rearrest him in face of these facts louis decided that latude had best remain where he was this was a terrible blow all the agitators were discouraged except one that was madame le gros she placed her hopes in the queen and she was not disappointed soon afterwards the queen's favorite minister de breteuil came into office what arguments he used with the king we do not know but louis relented latude was set at liberty but as a condition of freedom he was to go into exile that was not enough for the irrepressible madame le gros again she agitated again the king allowed himself to be persuaded the penalty of exile was removed madame le gros was permitted to receive her protege into her own house latude was now a hero and his liberatress a heroine they both became the fashion so much so that mesdames de stal de luxembourg and de boufflers condescended to dine with latude at the le gros humble board the lapse of years only increased their renown as late as the twenty sixth of january seventeen ninety two a member of the legislative assembly declared that no foreigner came to paris without visiting them le quatorze juillet the day of the capture of latude's prison the bastille is still regarded as the most glorious in the republican annals of france throughout the revolution les vainqueurs de la bastille as all those who had taken part in the fourteenth of july insurrection were called were fated and honored as national heroes nothing availed to dissipate the myth not even the discovery that the fortress far from being crowded with victims of tyranny contained not a single political prisoner only seven prisoners in all four forgers two madmen and one victim of sadism until recent years madame le gros tale of latude's sufferings in the bastille continued to be believed and to be related as gospel by republican historians such as louis blanc and michelet even as late as the exhibition of eighteen eighty nine in the model of the bastille there was exhibited personating latude a white-haired old man lying in chains on a bed of straw and groaning horribly here the guide would say you behold ladies and gentlemen the unhappy latude who remained in this position with his hands chained behind his back for thirty-five years yes rejoined one of the visitors to the exhibition and in that position that you'd made the ladder one hundred and eighty feet long by which he escaped women are said to be more gullible than men they are at any rate more easily moved to pity multitudes of men believed letude's story but it was the women who could not rest until he was set free the very mention of the bastille raised an image of dread in every sensitive french woman's mind at the citadel's capture and demolition women were present in large numbers madame de genlis who had brought her pupils the duke of orleans children to watch it said she saw women helping to pull down the towers fashionable women were there as well as women of the mob the elegant dames left their carriages some little distance away and walked on to the square chancellor pasquier found standing close to him mademoiselle Contat, a famous actress of the comedie francaise we all stayed till the end he writes and i gave her my arm to escort her to her carriage in the place royale in the records of the musée des archives nationales among the names of the men honored as vainqueurs de la bastille stands the name of one woman and one only marie charpentier among the many myths circling around the fortress and its capture is the story that tirouagne de Méricourt, carlyle's brown eloquent beauty having seized arms at les invalides came to the bastille and took possession of a tower 
but alas tirouin's most recent biographer m leopold de la cour cuts away the foundations from this romantic tale although it was told by lamartine michelet the de goncourts and another of tirouin's late biographers m marcelin pellet women whatever part they may have played on the quatorze juillet kept up their interest in the bastille they bought its stones as relics a pound of them was sold for as much as a pound of bread no small sum in those days of food scarcity our fellow countrywoman henrietta maria williams when she went to see madame de genlis at st leu found her wearing as her chief ornament one of these bastille stones nestling in a rosette of tricolour ribbons it was set in precious gems and crowned with a wreath of laurels if it was pity that first brought women into the revolution another impulse equally potent to provoke revolutionary action and even more characteristic of french women indeed of housekeepers all the world over kept them there this was the economic impulse the bread and cheese question thus on the eve of the revolution we find parisian women protesting to the king against men's usurpation of women's trades if only men will leave us the needle and the distaff ran the woman's petition we will leave them the plain and the all it was this bread and cheese question that made it possible to organize that women's manifestation the march to versailles on the fifth and sixth of october which was the second great insurrection of the revolution hunger le pain qui manque wrote de goncourt was at the bottom of all the early dramas of the revolution and whatever else it may have been the october procession was certainly a hunger march the corn problem was one of the many disastrous legacies left by that evil genius of his country louis the fifteenth turgot had tried to solve the problem by attempting to establish something like free trade necker by reverting to protection neither the one nor the other had improved matters and bad harvests made them worse the queues outside bakers' shops began in the early hours, lasted through the morning, and sometimes on into the afternoon. Profiteers were charged with throwing loads of grain into quarries instead of delivering them to the populace of Paris. The clergy were said to be bribing millers not to grind their corn. What is the price of the loaf? a foreigner inquired of a Parisian working man's wife. Three francs twelve sous the four pound loaf, was her reply. The sum sounds incredible this was how she arrived at it the controlled price is twelve sous the four pound loaf but you can't buy loaves at that price my husband is compelled to wait all day long at the baker's door he loses the day's work for which he would receive three francs so the loaf costs three francs twelve sous as distrust in the monarchy grew all sorts of wild suspicions came into being the government was actually accused of exporting corn and importing poisoned bread to sell at its weight in gold when minds were capable of believing rumors so extravagant anything might happen the october insurrection would seem to have been in part planned and in part spontaneous for some weeks politicians had been urging the people to march to versailles and demand from the king and the assembly an explanation of the food scarcity and these agitators are said to have induced women in the palais royal gardens publicly to incite the famished populace to join in the march further they have been accused of paying women to join and men to disguise themselves as women for the purpose on the other hand the immediate cause of the procession would not seem to have been planned and this immediate cause was no doubt a woman's matter the fraud of a baker in the st eustache quarter who was said to have given short measure to have sold a loaf of one pound nine ounces which purported to be one of two pounds only by the skin of his teeth did this baker escape being hanged from the nearest lamp-post he was rescued by a detachment of the national guard they hurried him to the hotel de ville to which he was followed by the infuriated housewives and market women of st eustache the story of their grievance had spread like wildfire through the working-class quarters and soon on the place de greve an angry mob was surging round the hotel de ville the malcontents forced their way into the building some say they made it the stronghold of femininity refusing to admit any who were not of their own sex but masculine force burst open a side door there was a scene of terrible confusion two of the women with lighted torches were about to set fire to the municipal archives when stanislas maillard an usher at le chatelet law court had an inspiration it saved the town hall and it led to much else allons à versailles he cried seizing a drum 
beating sharp with loud rolls the tall gaunt figure in an ill-fitting suit of black rushed down the town hall staircase shouting loudly a versailles the idea took at once the town hall and the cheating trembling baker were forgotten after all was not the king himself at the bottom of this trouble was it not from him that bread should be demanded surely he was the head baker what was he doing out there at versailles sheltering behind his flanders regiment ought he not to be in paris among his starving people to paris he should come and the housewives would bring him there so along the quays past the louvre past the tuileries gardens towards versailles they swarmed in the rain and mist of that october morning those menagères at the start there were only about five hundred of them not eight to ten thousand as many have alleged as in all such processions there were the serious processionists who desired a definite object and there were the mere roughs who wanted a riot and hoped somehow to benefit by it there were also among these hunger marchers women of various occupations housewives women of the markets of les halles of st catherine's market and st paul's there were lace-makers flower-sellers and no doubt women of the street maillard with his drum led the way before him went a banner from which hung baker's scales behind him came the women armed with spits broomsticks and any other implement of peace or of war which happened to be handy crowds of roughs joined them on the way peaceable citizens were compelled to join and by the time they reached sevres the procession of five hundred had swollen to such proportions that messengers galloped to the national assembly with the news that paris was marching on versailles these tidings borne to the king who as usual was pursuing his ancestral pastime of the chase in Midon woods rapidly brought the monarch home to his palace and there he was when about three o'clock in the afternoon the bedraggled horde reached versailles and came to the hotel des menus plaisirs where the national assembly was in session maillard succeeded in obtaining permission for himself and fifteen of the petitioners to present their grievances to the parliament maillard entered with a woman on each side one brandishing a sword the other bearing a pike at the end of which was something round whether it were a drum or a picture representing some indistinguishable object perhaps the baker's scales again no one could make out maillard had with great difficulty persuaded the remainder of the crowd to stay out of doors but soon they grew impatient of waiting in the rain what had happened to their spokesman they asked had they been poisoned some of the most curious contrived to effect an entrance others followed soon the galleries were crowded and in the body of the hall dishevelled market women in dripping garments occupied benches reserved for deputies there they listened to maillard demanding the withdrawal from versailles of the unpopular flanders regiment as being one thousand unnecessary mouths in that time of scarcity but when he went on to protest against the high price of the loaf and the impossibility of obtaining it without standing for hours in a queue outside the baker's shop the housewives in the hall thought they could tell that tale better than he refusing to remain mere listeners any longer they burst in all speaking at once and crying out that the assembly must fix the price of bread at two sous the pound and that of meat at eight sous the pound the cry known as the three eights then went round eight sous for the four pound loaf eight sous a pound of meat eight sous a liter of wine a certain amount of satisfaction ensued when another eight occurred at eight o'clock in the evening a deputy dr guillotin announced that loads of corn would immediately be dispatched to paris thereupon maillard and sixty of the most orderly manifestants went home those who remained were not so rational they soon abandoned their reasonable demands for the lowering of the price of food and began to insult the clergy a large number of the members withdrew when the president mouni entered the hall at ten o'clock he found only ten deputies surrounded by five hundred women one of whom a gigantic menad of the market occupied the president's chair where she was ringing his bell loudly mouni had withdrawn earlier in the day in order to conduct a company of women to the royal presence the king received them in his famous clock-room as to the number to whom this privilege was accorded there is considerable divergence of opinion it varies from five to twelve but all authorities agree in making a pretty young girl of seventeen louison chabri flower-seller or worker in sculpture or possibly both the heroine of the occasion someone has even gone so far as to reproduce or perhaps to imagine her discourse 
whatever she said or did not say she did not touch on politics perhaps she had none then but they soon became very pronounced for she apparently looked so charming and spoke so prettily that when she was about to kiss the king's hand he kissed her on both cheeks saying she was well worth it qu'elle en valait bien la peine of course that made her at once a staunch royalist there seems to be better authority for this story than for another version of the incident viz that embarrassed by the monarch's august presence the oratress of the deputation after murmuring the one word pain fell into a swoon from which she awoke to find herself in a hardly less embarrassing situation still surrounded by her fellow delegates but in her sovereign's arms whatever happened to the pretty flower girl the deputation seems to have been successful highly pleased with their reception and with the promises the king had given them they left the palace crying long live the king but their comrades waiting anxiously in the rain on the place d'armes were somewhat critical not to say jealous have you anything in writing they clamoured and when the deputation had to confess to having received nothing but some excellent wine the royal salute and the royal word certain of their fellow processioners grew furious taking off their garters they would have suspended the deputation from the nearest lamp-posts had it not been for the intervention of their less violent sisters and of the marechal du logis who led the petitioners back to the chateau there they were delivered from such dangers in the future by receiving a paper signed by the royal hand it recorded the king's promise that loads of corn destined for paris and said to be held up at lagny and Saint-Lys, should be immediately transported into the capital and that every possible measure should be taken for the provisioning of the metropolis provided with this royal charter the deputation was now permitted to leave the palace in peace its leader louison chabry and sixty other women no doubt the more respectable of the manifestants were then glad to return to paris in carriages which the court provided for them they did well for two or three of them had already been badly hurt in scrimmages outside the palace louison was the first to reach paris she came into the hotel de ville at two in the morning the others followed at intervals maillard arrived at four he bore the king's promises in writing and handed them to the mayor bailly the women were utterly exhausted by fatigue and hunger they asked for food and were given a supper or rather breakfast of meat bread and rice in a room adjoining the council chamber the hooligans alone remained at versailles many of these as we have said passed the night in the assembly hall others slept in the stables some even penetrated into the royal kitchens and at six the next morning their strident menacing voices ascended from the terrace of the palace gardens to the queen's bedchamber with the well-known tragic events that followed during the next few hours we are not here concerned for the women played no very prominent part in them though they mingled in the hostile crowd later in the morning they were in the marble court when the queen who had narrowly escaped assassination at male hands came out on to the balcony at half-past one they set forth in triumph on the return journey to paris they had achieved their object they brought with them not only sixty wagons full of corn but the baker the baker's wife and the baker's little boy in other words the king the queen and the dauphin a motley crowd they were still those parisian processionists but their aspect was different from that of the day before then they were suppliants now they were conquerors le bon papa as they called the king whom they had captured was not very clever they said but his wife the austrian woman whom they hated had misled him they the good women of paris would look after him henceforth so they were in excellent spirits their spits and broomsticks they had exchanged for tree branches tied with ribbons which once had adorned the elaborate coiffures of court ladies many of them wore helmets and armor belonging to the guards some rode in warlike fashion astride of cannon among immense crowds of onlookers they conducted the king and queen to the hotel de ville which it took them seven interminable hours to reach and even then the via dolorosa was not at an end not content with the appearance of their sovereigns on the balcony and the king's assurance of the pleasure it gave him once more to be in the midst of his loyal subjects those subjects refused to go home to rest until at ten o'clock they had seen the royal captives safely lodged in what henceforth became the prison of royalty the palace of the tuileries in following the conduct of the processionists after the sixth of october we again have to distinguish between the orderly and the disorderly 
This is especially necessary in the case of the market women, les poissardes, or fishwives, as they were called, who in large numbers took part in the procession. They were of two distinct orders. There were the respectable holders of long-established and well-known stalls in the market. Under the old regime, these poissards had been respected, even honored by royalty. The king received them on fete days, accepted the nosegays they offered, listened to their Billingsgate talk, and reserved for them special seats at royal pageants. Then there were the women roughs of the market, the loafers and hangers-on, vestales terribles, bacantes soules du nouveau dieu libère, drunken bacantes of the new god liberty. They threw themselves with fury into the revolution. They took part in every riot and hesitated at no atrocity. They filled the streets. They overflowed into the Tuileries gardens, roaring like lionesses deprived of their young. The terrace of the Fayam Monastery and Otto's Café hard by were the favorite resorts of these vixens, these menads, breathing forth a smell of brandy and cynical philippics. After the Versailles procession, these two classes of market women behaved very differently. The rapscallions allowed the king and queen no peace. As early as seven o'clock on the 7th of October, they gathered in a howling mob outside the Tuileries Palace, clamoring for the queen to appear, and when she did so, screaming insults at the Austrian woman, whom they held responsible for all their troubles. Then these viragos made the round of the parish shops, appropriating ribbons and other finery, which they claimed as rewards for their so-called patriotism in going to Versailles. Their more orderly sisters, later in the day and not without respectfully soliciting an audience, also went to the palace and were admitted. Marie Antoinette herself consented to receive them. Her ladies, thinking the fishwives presumed to come too near Her Majesty, intervened between the visitors and their queen, and held out their ample panniers to protect her. These orderly market women were eager to prove that they had nothing in common with their hooligan sisters, whose behavior they loudly denounced, and some of whom they handed over to the police. The Municipal Council of Paris also was at first careful to distinguish between the two elements of the Versailles procession. On the former they bestowed the title of Bonne Citoyenne. They struck a medal in their honor. They gave them the best boxes at the theater, and allowed them to come down onto the stage and dance national dances which were loudly applauded. But as the revolution went on and orderliness ceased to count for much, the hooligans, as well as les bonnes citoyennes, in fact all women who had gone to Versailles were elevated to the rank of national heroines. At a meeting held on the 6th of Niveaux, year 2, i.e. the 23rd of December, 1793, the commune decreed that, preceded by a banner, inscribed with the words, Thus they drove the tyrant like a vile prey before them, the heroines of Versailles should march to all public assemblies, and that there they should knit. This last injunction gave birth to the term tricoteuse, that famous designation of revolutionary women. Though received in all seriousness by such notable historians as Carlyle, it is now assigned to the irony of the anti-feminist Chomet, who drew up the official report of the session, and who could not refrain from this joke at the expense of the national heroines. End of chapter 1, part 1Chapter 1, Part 2 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of Women Agitators. Whether or no the knitting needles were so busy, whether or no they were plied in the gallery of the Jacobin Club, and even round the guillotine, as romantic historians try to make out, the term tricoteuse had come to stay. Henceforth, les bonnes citoyennes were known as the knitters. Not many names of individual women who took part in the procession have come down to us. We have already mentioned Louison Chabry who led the deputation to the king. Very little is known about her. Even her Christian name is doubtful. Was it Louise or Louison? Madeleine or Marguerite? At any rate, at the time of the procession she seems to have been living in the rue Richelieu, and later she was lodging with her father in a wine merchant's house in St. Catherine's Market. She was evidently a kind-hearted girl, for on the eve of starting for Versailles, she had given twelve francs all but four sous to the prisoners in the Hôtel de Ville for the purchase of shirts and shoes. She gave evidence at an inquiry into the doings of the 5th and 6th of October made by Le Châtelet Law Court at the instance of the court party. 
At the Châtelet, Louison, like other witnesses, as we shall see, appeared by no means proud of the part she had played in the affair, and protested that she had been forced to join the procession against her will. Later, however, she seems to have changed her opinion, and our last sight of her is collecting the offertory at a te deum in honor of the Versailles insurrection in the church of Les Petits Pères, at which were present la Princesse de Lamballe, the Duke of Chartres, and the Duke of Pontièvre. With Chabri on her deputation are said to have been Marie Nomery, Rose Barry, a lace-maker, Anne Forêt, a shop-girl, Françoise Robin, and three other women described as Les Dames Babet, Leclerc, and Laviot. Robin, not Chabri, had originally been appointed to lead the petitioners. But as on the arm of Mouni, president of the assembly, Robin was being escorted to the palace, a Swiss guard kicked her so brutally that her injuries prevented her joining the deputation until later. The two women who more than any others have been associated with the doings of those October days are Thirouane de Méricourt and René Audu. The former was one of the most impressive, and in the end, as we shall see, one of the most tragic figures of the Revolution. Legends have clustered thick round her life story. Lamartine, Michelet, the de Goncourts, and Carlyle relate many of them as sober fact. Even those who like ten ignore the myth of brown-locked Demoiselle Tirouang, seated on a cannon leading the procession to Versailles, assert that she distributed money among the troops on the square, hoping thus to bribe them to join the revolution. Poets from Barthélemy to Baudelaire have celebrated Tirouang as the leader of the procession. Erect on a cannon as on a shield, she inflamed the ranks with her gestures and her voice, sang Barthélemy. Lance in her hand, hair disheveled, she marched to danger like Penthesilea. Baudelaire, in his sonnet, Cecina, asked, « Avez-vous vu Tirouagne, amante du carnage, excitant à l'assaut un peuple sans souliers, la joue et l'œil en feu, jouant son personnage, et montant sabre au point les royaux escaliers ?» Of all these picturesque myths, Tirouagne's latest biographer, M. Léopold Lacour, who derives his story from Tirouagne's own confessions, makes short work. As one reads his closely reasoned argument, one begins to wonder whether he will allow Tirouagne to have been at Versailles at all, or even whether he will leave us anything of our martial heroine to believe in. Let us now see how much of her remains in Lacour's narrative. Anne-Joseph du Tirouagne commonly known by the name of Tirouagne, which was her usual signature, was born in 1769 at Marcourt, not Méricourt, a village on the Luxembourg and Belgian frontier not very far from Liège. Her father was a well-to-do peasant farmer. Her mother died when she was five. After her father's second marriage, Tirouagne and two brothers were left to the care of their stepmother, whose unkindness drove them from home to take refuge with relatives. But here, apparently, they fared no better. So Tirouagne, leaving her family, seems to have gone into service at Limburg, where she was employed in keeping cows. Then she suddenly became nursery governess or companion at Liège. Hence revolution records refer to her as La Belle Liégeoise. For this strange promotion we suspect Tirouagne's good looks to have been partially accountable. Although no authentic portrait of her exists, save one that was made towards the end of her life when she was ill and had lost all her attractiveness, there are numerous detailed descriptions of her appearance which show that though not strictly beautiful, she was very pretty, small, mignonne, and piquante. The dignity of her carriage made her appear almost tall, at any rate above the average height, said one who saw her. Her eyes were dark and flashing, her hair chestnut, and she possessed one of those retroussé noses which changed the fate of empires. These governess days of Tirouagne are full of mystery. From Liège she would appear to have gone to Antwerp and thence to England, how, why, and with whom is doubtful. But it is thought that in England she became the mistress of a wealthy English youth who promised to marry her. Other stories of her life in England, that she became the mistress of the Prince of Wales and was introduced by him to the Duke of Orléans, seem to be doubtful. These rumors have been recently used to bolster up the theory that Tirouagne was involved in the so-called Orléanist plot to replace Louis the Sixteenth by his Orléanist cousin. Tirouagne, when arrested for taking part in that October procession, which some consider to have been part of this plot, of course took care to deny any acquaintance with the Duke. Her denial may or may not have been true. Tirouagne gave her own version of the English episode in her story. 
This she told to her people at Marcourt after she had left England and returned home with a considerable fortune. She said she had married in England a rich Englishman, of whom she was then the widow. Relying on her relative's ignorance of English, the crafty Tirwang appears to have produced certain documents signed Tirwang Spinster, and to have told her family that Spinster was the name of her late husband. French biographers, as ignorant of our language as the Terwangs, have conducted endless researches with the object of identifying this English spinster, whom they suppose to have been the father of the child alleged by Terwang to have been born to her in England and said to have died in infancy. More reliable than Terwang's own story are the numerous records which show that somewhere about 1787 Terwang was in Paris, and that there she was receiving the addresses of an elderly French nobleman. Armand Nicolas Doublet, Marquis de Persan, who settled upon her for life an annual income of five thousand francs. He was soon to regret his generosity, for Tirouin, who possessed a fine voice which had been trained, probably in England, declared her intention of devoting her life to music, and went off to Genoa with a famous Italian singer, Tenducci. Her contract with Tenducci is extant. Here again she signs Tirouin spinster. It seems likely that Tirouin had financial resources other than and in addition to Persan's allowance. This she continued to receive and to apply for, sometimes in advance, in letters to the Parisian banker Perregaux, which still in existence form one of the most reliable sources of her biography. As pawn-shop records show, she possessed a great store of valuable jewels and plate, gifts, no doubt, from Mr. Spinster, and from other less hypothetical lovers. Tirouang returned from Genoa in the summer of 1789. She came back a very different woman from the gay courtesan who had set forth with the Italian tenor, from the brilliant Comtesse de Campinados, as she had called herself, in days when she was to be seen glittering with jewels in her box at the Paris Opera. Now her life as a courtesan was over. She had paid the price of her calling, for in Italy she had contracted the malady that ultimately was to lead her to the hospital of Salpêtrière. Her beauty was on the wane. Her Italian lover had spent the greater part of her money. Her vivacity, intelligence, and charm, however, remained for a while longer, and Tirouang proceeded to make the best of them. Unable to continue her old calling, she turned politician and tried, with considerable success, to pose as une femme savante. She sought for and made acquaintance with scientists like Rome, politicians like Pétion, and, though she failed to attract the Abbé Sies to her house, she induced his brother to visit her. Thus, as we shall see later, she opened a salon, and in it, as we shall also see, she founded a club. Formerly music had been her only serious concern in life. Politics had had no interest for her. But on the morrow of her return from Italy she found herself in the midst of them, for she was lodging in the Hôtel Toulouse near that Palais Royal, or Palais d'Egalité as it came to be called, where throughout the revolution the political cauldron was always at boiling point. It was here, if we may trust Terwang's own confession, that she first became interested in the people. Already the revolution seemed to her to have changed men's hearts, to have banished egoism and obliterated class distinctions. As she looked down on the poissard haranguing the passers-by, even the most ragged seemed to have a heroic air. Here, in the Palais Royal Gardens, Tirouang fell in love with liberty. The scene that Tirouang saw on the sultry days of that tropical summer of 1789, in some mild way, must have resembled our Hyde Park near the Marble Arch on a summer Sunday afternoon. There was the stump orator on a chair. On the fateful 12th of July, when the news arrived of Necker's banishment, the orator was the timid, stammering Camille Desmoulins, who had been forced to mount his impromptu platform. In halting, though passionate accents, he was summoning the people to arms in a social war. "'The beast is in the trap,' he cried. "'Now we must finish him. Never did richer prey await victors. Forty thousand palaces, mansions, and chateaus, two-fifths of the whole wealth of France will be valor's reward.' On the evening of that day, Tirouin took her first step on the political stage. Walking in the streets with her servant, she met a group of soldiers and asked them whether they were on the side of the States General. That question very nearly hurried her into prison. On the famous 14th, when the news of the capture of the Bastille was announced in the gardens, Tirouin saw people weeping with joy. 
Three days later, the ci-devant Comtesse de Campinados made her first appearance in a political manifestation. Wearing a white riding habit and un chapeau rond, she took part in the procession which went to welcome Louis the Sixteenth, coming from Versailles to give his blessing to the revolution's first triumph, the destruction of the royal prison. By this time, Terroigne had thrown herself heart and soul into the revolution movement. She was reading all the public announcements and newspapers, but she found them difficult to understand. So, in order to be in the heart of things, she went to live at Versailles, in la rue de Noailles. There she spent most of her time listening to the debates of the National Assembly. These also she found somewhat incomprehensible at first. But as gradually they grew more intelligible, they showed her the people oppressed by the privileged classes, the people with justice and right on their side. On the 5th of October, Terroigne was at the assembly when the approach of the women's procession was announced. We have already seen the story that she accompanied Maillard and his draggle-tailed throng from Paris to be nothing but legend. No contemporary evidence corroborates Carlyle's picturesque description of Demoiselle Terroigne, brown-locked Terroigne seated on a cannon. The two friends of liberty in their famous history of the revolution do not include Terroigne's name among those of the women processioners. It was not until some months after the event that the scurrilous newspaper Les Actes des Apôtres mentioned Tirouin as one of the leaders of the procession. However negligent Tirouin may have become later, in those October days of 1792, she had far too much regard for her appearance to join her disheveled sisters on their mud march. It was much more like the coquette Tirouin still was to keep herself spick and span, to don an appropriate silken riding habit, red this time, and to caracole on a warlike steed on the Place d'Armes. But, alas, even this picture of our heroine, historical accuracy relentlessly bids us discard. Her own account of her doings on the 5th and 6th of October was that on the procession's arrival at Versailles, she went out of the assembly hall to see what was happening, and then, having satisfied her curiosity, retired to her home for the night, taking with her a few miserable women to whom she gave bread. On the following day, so she said, having gone to the assembly hall and found the doors closed, she mingled for a while with the crowds on the square, then, when the hall was opened, returned there and listened to the debates for the rest of the morning. This story may or may not be true. We must remember that when Tirouin told it, she was eager to clear herself from the charge of having led the procession, or at any rate played one of the principal parts in it, a charge which was being brought against her by the Châtelet Law Court during the inquiry into the events of the 5th and 6th of October to which we have already referred. This inquiry opened on the 11th of December, 1789, and continued until the 29th of July, 1790. There seems little doubt that it was instituted by the enemies of the Duke of Orléans and Mirabeau, and with the design of proving them to have been the instigators of the insurrection. During the first six months, the evidence of some four hundred witnesses was taken. Among them were the king's aunt, Madame Adélaïde, his brother, the Comte de Provence, and even the queen herself. Marie-Antoinette is said to have refused to incriminate any of her husband's subjects. Her evidence was therefore entirely uncompromising. I saw everything, I heard everything, I have forgotten everything, she is reported to have declared. Out of the four hundred witnesses, only three said they had seen Terroigne actively engaging in the insurrection, and even these three were vague. One had been told by a lady whose name he had forgotten, that she had seen among the brigands who had come from Paris to Versailles, a lady, une dame, whom she thought to be Tirouenne de Montassur, dressed as a man with a tall nobleman dressed as a woman. The second witness, a priest, said that on the evening of the 5th, when the Flanders Regiment was in the Avenue de Versailles, a lady, some say several, wearing a long red coat, at least as far as could be seen in the darkness, was going up and down the ranks in her hand a basket from which the soldiers were taking little packets. Yet another priest, this one a student in theology of the Sorbonne, declared that on the night of the fifth, being at the window of the Hôtel Flamarant, rue de l'Orangerie, he saw arriving several women and men disguised as women. One of the former he noticed particularly. She was in a scarlet riding habit and on horseback. A jockey also in scarlet followed her. The witness was told she was Mademoiselle Thirouenne de Méricourt, whom he had previously seen at the assembly and whom he recognized later. 
she went up to the sentinel stationed at the orangery gate, which the sentinel, who wore the uniform of the Versailles militia, immediately closed. Everyone, said the witness, believed it to have been closed by order of Mademoiselle Tirouenne. It was on such slender evidence that the Châtelet Law Court on the 4th of August, 1790, issued a warrant for Tirouenne's arrest. But by that time she was outside the court's jurisdiction. Whether it was for that express purpose or not that in the preceding May she had gone to her native Marcourt seems uncertain. At any rate, she was out of France, and the Châtelet made no attempt to obtain her extradition. Whether the Paris law court may not have prompted the misfortune which, as we shall see later, was to overtake la belle liégeoise is another matter. After the first six months, the Châtelet inquiry had grown less vigorous. The inquiry had failed in its main object, to inculpate in the October insurrection d'Orléans and Mirabeau, whose names the Assembly had refused to allow the commissioners to drag into the affair. Thus, from interminable sittings and an immense mass of evidence, there resulted only one actual arrest, that of a woman and one so obscure that her very name is doubtful. Whether her Christian name was René or Reine or Louise, her family name, Le Duc, or Audu, or Ondu, seems impossible to discover. There is no doubt, however, that she was a market woman, and that because of her good looks she had, according to the time-honored custom, which still prevails in Paris today, been elected queen of the markets, la reine des Halles, or la reine de Hongrie, as the title went then. This may account for the appellation of reine, or even René. There is evidence that already on the 4th of October, René, in collaboration with the famous Maillard, with a ragged hunchback, Bernou, and with another, whom Ten calls a bird of prey, Fournier, nicknamed the American, had been working to create a disturbance and to turn popular attention towards Versailles. René's part was to make speeches in the Palais Royal Gardens, and to cry out in the streets that she would go to Versailles and demand from the king and queen the reason why Paris lacked bread. René would appear to have been one of the women at Maillard's side when he first entered the assembly hall, and she was apparently a member of the disorderly throng who remained behind after the more respectable processioners had returned to Paris. For, says one of the witnesses at the Châtelet trial, it was la première dame des Halles, Reine Audu, who, after the Bishop of Langres had been compelled to put his thumbs on the table as a token of submission to their demands, cried, Now we are pleased with you, so you must kiss us. The Châtelet charged René with having announced her intention of going to Versailles, and bringing back the Queen's head on her sword, with having helped to massacre the King's bodyguards, and with having taken part in other disorderly scenes. Her cross-examination opened on the very anniversary of the day of her alleged crimes, the 5th of October, 1790. When called to the witness-box, Queen Audu began by denying her presence at Versailles. However, after the overwhelming testimony of no less than fifty witnesses who swore to having seen her there, had refreshed her memory, she changed her tactics, and, like other women whom the tribunal had interrogated, Louison Chabry, for example, Audu maintained that she had been compelled to join the procession against her will. As she was passing by the Hôtel de Ville, she said a band of women, some of them very badly dressed, had thrust a broomstick into her hand, and insisted that she should go with them to demand from the king and the assembly reasons for the scarcity of food. René declared that the procession advanced in perfect order. She carefully omitted any reference to her own conduct in the assembly hall, or even to her presence there. She said that, with other processioners, she had passed the night in the stables of Monseigneur le Comte d'Artois, and that they had slept badly, being constantly roused by the beating of drums. The next morning they went out into the streets and broke their fast on a bag of plums and a bottle of water given them by a soldier of the king's guard. Later, while the mob were invading the chateau, Audu confessed to having drunk something stronger than water with some gunners of her acquaintance. Her sweetheart was said to be a soldier, perhaps he was one of these. Audu did not deny that she was in the crowd that brought the king and the royal family back to Paris. But she resolutely refused to admit that she had been guilty of any crime whatsoever. Thus did this usually garrulous and bombastic person, with affected modesty and restraint, attempt to minimize her achievements in an all-important crisis. Her counsel, Chenot, when he stood up to plead, told a very different story. And here we actually have an advocate giving the lie to his client. 
Cheneau, aware doubtless that the tribunal would desire to save its face by making at least one conviction, and that it had chosen this market woman for a scapegoat, determined, if he could not get his client acquitted, at least to make a heroine of her, whether she liked it or not. In this he completely succeeded. His speech, adding one more legend to those already enlivening the annals of the revolution, handed down this well-nigh nameless woman to posterity as a second Joan of Arc. Cheneau represented his client as a noble patriotic woman inflamed with the warlike ardor of her family. Were not her five brothers all serving with the colors? Moved with pity for her country's wrongs, this Penthesilea resolved to right them. She had assembled more than eight hundred women in the Champs-Élysées, marshaled them in perfect order, and led them by the way of Sèvres to Versailles. There, outside the assembly hall, she had left four hundred of her band to overawe the Parliament. With the rest and three cannon brought from Paris, she had continued her way to the chateau, and, accompanied by twelve of her comrades, had succeeded in penetrating into the royal presence. But not, said Cheneau, until she had passed through many adventures. She had had to tackle the commander of the Versailles National Guard, Estang himself, to advance beneath the shot and shell of his troops, to be wounded in the breast and right arm, to push aside or to creep under two infuriated war-horses, who in some unaccountable manner had revenged themselves by kicking off René's toenails. So much suffering and so much courage had not been without its effect on King Louis. When ultimately Odu had reached her monarch, she had found him all docility and compliance. Without a murmur the king had granted the Poissard's request that he would subscribe to the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and reveal the whereabouts of the government stores of corn and flour. In triumph, René and her friends had left the palace. But on the square fresh troubles had beset them. The market queen had again been wounded, this time in the left arm. Utterly exhausted, her mutilated body had been placed on a cannon. After a wakeful night on this martial couch she had been up betimes, and at eight o'clock, despite her wounds and orthopedic disability, had dragged herself a second time to the king, to persuade him to grant his people's demands and go with them to Paris instead of fleeing to Metz, which was said to be his intention. Again Louis was compliant. He returned to Paris, and with him on her cannon had gone the lacerated queen of the markets. With her arrival at the Hôtel de Ville, said Cheneau, her exploits ended. To such a heroine, how could any tribunal refuse the martyr's crown? The Châtelet condemned René to imprisonment, for what period does not transpire. Straightway her fame went forth throughout the length and breadth of the land. The Châtelet was bombarded with petitions for the gallant prisoner's release. And when, on the 6th of September, 1791, after eleven months of a wild agitation on her behalf, Audu was finally liberated, she received an ovation. By that time, any woman who had taken part in the Versailles insurrection was considered a national heroine, and among them Audu, as their leader, was of course supreme. Parliament declared her to have deserved well of her country. The town council of Paris girded her with the sword of honor. The Jacobin Club collected on her behalf three hundred fifty-seven francs, five sous, with which the recipient was not satisfied, considering it far too trivial a sum for so distinguished a deliverer of La Patrie. René clamored, but in vain, for a pension for life. Its refusal, however, did not prevent her from continuing her martial efforts in the revolution cause. In the attack on the Tuileries on the 10th of August, 1892, she was again wounded. Soon afterwards, the victorious Jacobin began to find the services of women more embarrassing than helpful. Two years later, on the 27th of July, 1794, we find Audu in the prison of Saint Pélagie for some unknown crime. Her release on the following 5th of September is the last we hear of her. Rumor relates that she died mad. A critic desiring to make light of women's achievements will say that their debut in the revolution does not enhance their reputation for intelligence or show them capable of independent action. He will point out that Madame Le Gros was the victim of an impostor, that the Versailles processioners were the agents, probably many of them the paid agents, of political agitators, and that even if the women of the 5th and 6th of October sincerely went to Versailles to obtain food for their hungry families, they failed because the loads of corn they brought back were but a temporary relief. 
but another critic, less anti-feminist, might reply that women were not alone in believing Latude's story, that as he lectured and exhibited his ladder throughout France and England, he received enthusiastic applause from masculine audiences, that though economically the Versailles insurrection did little, politically it achieved its object. It struck a fatal blow at the old absolute monarchy. It brought the king out of the age-long monarchical aloofness of Versailles into Paris, where he was among his people, and more or less under their control. It made him, in short, the king of the French instead of the king of France. It was this thing that the women had done. Men took the Bastille, even there the women helped. Women took the king, says Michelet. Further, by bringing the king into Paris, women had made Paris the center of the revolution and the capital of the new France in a sense in which, for a hundred years and more, it had never been the capital of the old. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2, Part 1 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 2. Part 1. Salons and Salonnières. Quote, Woman alone can organize a drawing-room. Man succeeds sometimes in a library. Benjamin Disraeli. While in street, market, and on the high road, French women of the humbler classes were making history in ways new to their sex, up in the higher walks of society, cultured dames were exercising a no less potent influence in the time-honored French way of the salon. Sociability is the most characteristic quality of the French nation, and the salon, the incarnation of sociability, is the most typical of French institutions. From the salon through four centuries have radiated wit, grace, and gallantry, in a word, the indefinable esprit français. The French Renaissance of the sixteenth century owed a debt to the salon which is not usually recognized. In the following century, as we all know, polite society, in the French sense of the term, was cradled in Madame de Rambouillet's blue room. Fifty years later, Louis the Fourteenth was framing his policy in Madame de Maintenon's apartments. Fifty years later still, the social philosophy which was to transform France during the Revolution was evolving in Madame de Tancay's salon out of the conversation of Montesquieu and the encyclopedists. The revolution which destroyed so much of l'ancien régime was powerless to destroy the salon. It persisted in spite of the convention's decree in 1793 abolishing it. What did you do all that time? Somebody once asked of a member of the convention during the period known as the terror. I lived, was the reply. While the salon as an institution succeeded in living, many individual salons died. Only one. That of Madame Helvétius, the philosopher's widow, persisted right through without a break from 1772 to 1800. Some were but temporarily suspended, like the salons of Madame de Condorcet and Madame de Stal. Others were closed forever, like the salon of Madame Roland, when their hostesses were taken away, first to prison, then to the guillotine. Never did the French passion for sociability assert itself more powerfully than in those tempestuous years. Never was social intercourse felt to be more indispensable than when prison gates closed on Salonnière and her guests. Then within those gates, at the end of some lugubrious corridor in l'abbaye or la conciergerie, dimly lit by a few tallow candles, men and women, having dressed with all the care then possible, would assemble to discuss topics of the day, or to try and forget them by composing a madrigal or repeating a bon mot. Why should one be awkward and morose, they would say? merely because an accident has placed one in uncomfortable quarters. But though even in those grimmest days gleams of cheerfulness would keep breaking in, it was inevitable that the rough blast of the revolution cyclone should fatally nip the fine flower of French wit and gaiety. Well might Talleyrand say that he who had not lived before 1789 could not know the sweetness of life. One of the greatest charms of the pre-revolution salon had been the lightness and grace with which it had treated fundamental subjects. Whether, like Madame de Condorcet, academically equipped, or like Madame Suard, self-educated, or like Madame Geoffrey, not educated at all, the salonniere ever carried off gracefully her learning or her lack of it. I would give half my geometry, said the husband of Madame de Condorcet, for the talent which Madame Suard possesses without knowing it, she is eloquent as soon as she is moved, 
as soon as her heart or her taste is wounded, and I notice that women whose self-love is tempered by adroitness are careful not to wound her. For some years before the taking of the Bastille, this special charm of the French Salon had been threatened by the tide of intense seriousness flowing in on society. Madame Geoffrey nobly did her best to stem it. When conversation in her salon in the Rue Saint-Honoré was on the point of declining into controversy, she would change the subject with her well-known phrase, Voilà qui est bien. Those words would be the signal for Diderot, the worst sinner in this respect, to gather his friends round him and withdraw from Madame Geoffrin's salon to a certain tree in the Tuileries Gardens opposite, where the conversation would be continued. Madame Geoffrin died in 1777. Had she lived a few years longer, she would have found her little phrase as powerless as Canute's to resist the incoming ocean of seriousness. Salons became so deadly in earnest that their old habitués did not recognize them. "'All France has turned into legislators,' sighed Horace Walpole. And all France meant for him the France of the Salons which he knew so well. "'The country,' moaned Grimm, and again the country meant the Salons has been transformed from une jolie terre de petits scandales into un vilain pays de gros événements. Ségur, on his return to France from the Empress Catherine's court, went the round of the Paris salons which had been the joy of his youth, but he groaned as he found that political passion had turned them into arenas where contrary opinions battled and hurtled incessantly, whence disputation had driven out discussion, and where the entire fair sex was political, dealt with nothing but politics, and turned everything into politics. Our fair hostess of the revolution, quivering with a political excitement, which threatened to upset the teacup she was handing to her guest, would feverishly demand of him not the latest madrigal or the newest bon mot, but a ticket for the gallery of the Constituent Assembly or of the Jacobin Club. While Grimm and Walpole deplored the new seriousness, to Madame de Stahl it lent the Salon an additional charm. Never, she writes, was society at once so brilliant and so serious as during the first three or four years of the Revolution reckoning from 1788 to 1791. The change that had come over even women of fashion was heralded by the woman's newspaper, Le Véritable Ami de la Reine, or Journal des Dames. When, ran an article in this paper, our ladies were the wives of elegant talons rouge, of gay magistrates, when they had to shine in circles where the talk was all of the rain, of the fine weather, of a stage player, or of a whiskey, a kind of car, they never read anything but ditties and novels. Le Journal des Dames, full of love idols, madrigals, and pretty nothings, was as precious as it was indispensable. But, since their husbands have become men, since in their children they have to breed men, the rouge box and shoulder knots have been discarded, the tender Dora, the genteel Bernard no longer lie upon their toilet tables. The moniteur, or some political essay, have taken their places. And, in order to please them, le journal des dames must become serious. Over teacups and round the dinner tables and the breakfast tables of the revolution important political events were planned, and political parties were founded. In Madame Roland's salon, in l'Hôtel Britannique Rue Guénégo, the Girondist party was born. On Madame Robert's sofa, says Professor Ollard, the Republican party came into being. Round Madame Daudin's breakfast table at number 5, Place Vendôme, Vernieu and other deputies of the Legislative Assembly drew up the program of the first Girondist ministry. In Madame Duplay's parlor in la Rue Saint-Honoré, her famous pensionnaire, Robespierre, and his friends discussed the King's deposition. Thus completely were the bureau d'esprit being metamorphosed into Salon d'État. Madame de Beauharnais's charming blue and silver salon, once famous as une excellente auberge because of its succulent Tuesday and Thursday dinners, came to be known as the egg went sprang the National Assembly. Madame de Genlis's drawing room at Bellechasse, once the abode of the Muse, came to be little more than the antechamber to the Palais Royal, i.e., to the Orleanist party. So much the fashion had the new seriousness become that the gayest and most frivolous effected it. In days when la tragédie de Brutus and la mort de César were all the vogue at the Théâtre Français Richelieu, when Horatius Cocles and Miltiada Marathon were being played at the opera, little society butterflies, like the actress Louise Fusy, would study Greek and Roman history, would read Plautus and Menander and rave about the century of Pericles. 
but there were times when for a brief space the new seriousness relaxed then madame de genlis's husband the ci-devant marquis de sillery forgetting his gout would go down on his knees and polish the floor ready for the voluptuous russian dancing of his daughter henriette and of the mysterious pamela was she egalite's daughter no one ever knew then madame de genlis herself might be persuaded to attune her harp and sing to its accompaniment her favorite and perhaps appropriate hymn to inconstancy even Tiroigne de Méricourt, as we have seen for a while, turned salonnière. We find her soon after the October insurrection entertaining to supper at her Hôtel de Grenoble in la Rue Boulois, serious politicians, deputies even, who apparently were totally ignorant of her past. For in those days Tiroigne's only lover was liberty. She now posed as a prude and blushed at an equivocal story. On the left bank of the river, in a little hotel in la rue de Chantraine, which was to be Josephine's later, amidst flowers and perfumes and statues, to the sound of Mademoiselle Condé's divine touch on the piano, Julie Talma, wife of the great tragedian, received poets and artists, David and André Chénier, philosophers and men of science, Condorcet and Lavoisier. But such moments, all too rare and too fleeting, were liable to rude interruptions. One of these occurred at Madame Talma's on the 16th of October, 1792. Julie was giving one of her most brilliant fêtes in honor of General Dumouriez, who was spending his four days' leave in Paris. The Talmas had invited artists, musicians, and members of the convention, Brissot, Vergniaud, Santerre, to meet him. Mademoiselle Condé was playing the piano when suddenly there burst into the salon three uninvited guests, ferocious Jacobins. One of them was Marat, in Carmagnole, with a dirty red scarf round his head, from which escaped locks of greasy hair, and round his neck a handkerchief loosely knotted. He and his comrades came to accuse the general of having unjustly punished two volunteers in his army. The guest of the evening had never seen Marat before. Having been informed of his identity, Dumouriez, with all the hauteur of the Frenchmen of the world, scornfully looked him up and down, and then said, Ah, so you are Marat. I have nothing to say to you. And with those frigid words, the general turned his back on the intruder. Marat was furious. This house is a hotbed of counter-revolutionaries, he howled as he went out, followed by one of the guests bearing a red-hot shovel on which were sprinkled drops of perfume, intended to purify the air infected by the Jacobin's pestilential presence. The noise of the incident, this fête offered by the daughter of Talia to the son of Mars, was soon bruited abroad. The next morning newspaper boys were crying in the streets, Great conspiracy discovered by Marat! Great assembly of Girondins and counter-revolutionaries at Talmas in honor of the traitor Dumouriez! Names of the conspirators who intended to assassinate the people's friend! The hero of this incident never forgave his hostess for bringing him into such painful notoriety. In his memoirs he accused all the revolution women, with the exceptions of Madame Roland and Madame Necker, of being intrigante or forcenée madwomen. Had he been just he would have made other exceptions, and one of them would have been Madame Talma's friend, Madame de Condorcet. Daughter of le Marquis de Grouchy and sister of le Maréchal de Grouchy, who fought at Waterloo, Marie-Louise Sophie, afterwards Madame de Condorcet, was born in 1764 at her father's chateau of Villette on the borders of Normandy and l'Ile de France. Those who labor under the delusion that the whole of the French nobility on the eve of the revolution was merely frivolous, if not corrupt, should read the story of the serious upbringing of Sophie and her brothers and sisters. The education of boys and girls alike included Latin, Greek, modern languages, especially English, as well as for the girls, music, drawing, and painting. In her serious studies, Sophie soon became so proficient that, when necessary, she could take the place of the family tutor. Philosophy was her favorite study, and her favorite book, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. The grouchy children were encouraged to take an interest in people who were not of their own class. On their expeditions into the woods, they would cut faggots and bring them home to the cottagers. Madame de Gouchy had invented a wonderful potato bread, which her daughters used to bake and distribute in the village. When Sophie was twenty, she had to leave her adored home and set out on the one journey of her life. This was to Neuville-en-Bresse, near Lyon, where there was one of those institutions of old France known as Chapitre. 
They were societies of ladies who were called canonesses and who belonged to the most aristocratic families. The head of the chapter, La Doyenne, alone took religious vows. The others passed through an elaborate form of dedication but lived comparatively secular lives. The Neuville canonesses, of whom there were forty-six, not all in residence at the same time, were bent on making the best of both worlds. Sophie, the year after her entry, was going to so many balls and reading so many philosophical works by Voltaire and Rousseau, besides translating Tasso and The Sublime Young, that she lost both her health and her faith. The latter she never recovered. The former came back to her when she returned home, as she was soon obliged to do. Then, in the following year, 1768, her recovered charms conquered the heart of a hitherto confirmed bachelor of forty-three who came to stay with her father. This was none other than the great Condorcet, the famous philosopher and mathematician, the friend of Voltaire and a member of two academies. Sophie did not return his passion. But few French girls in these days, and fewer still in those, expect to be in love with their husbands. It was not until four years later, when her only child, a daughter, was born, that Sophie was to fall in love with hers. At the time of her marriage, celebrated on the 26th of December, 1786, respect and admiration had to suffice. Condorcet was not rich. Mademoiselle de Grouchy had no dowry. There was no law in those days to prevent Monsieur de Grouchy from bequeathing the whole of his property to his sons, and this he had done. Condorcet's biographer, Arago, can find no authority for the frequently repeated statement that the Duc de la Rochefoucauld promised the young couple an income of five thousand francs a year. Condorcet was one of the least cupidinous of men. When his friend Turgot had appointed him inspector of coinage, he had refused to accept a salary. His income when he married was probably about eighteen thousand francs. But his taste and his wife's too were simple. Neither desired to cut a figure in fashionable society. They refused invitations to court, but they willingly entertained a king when, like Christian the Seventh of Denmark, he happened to be a philosopher. Their salon at the Mint, l'Hôtel des Monnaies on the Quai de Conti, soon became the resort of poets and philosophers, of André Chenier, the Abbé Morellet, the constant brothers Charles and Benjamin, Monsieur Suard, whom to know was to know everyone who used a pen with distinction, and Madame Suard. Among distinguished foreigners visiting Paris, few were those whose due feet failed to mount the staircase leading to Madame de Condorcet's drawing-room. England was represented at her assemblies by My Dear Lord Stanhope, as French revolutionaries called him, by Adam Smith, whose theory of moral sentiments Madame de Condorcet was later to translate, by Tom Paine, who, as representative of the Department of N., was to be Condorcet's colleague in the convention by Sir James Mackintosh, and by that eccentric David Williams, the founder of the Royal Literary Fund, the friend of Franklin, who probably brought him to l'Hôtel des Monnaies. Thither, too, came the Prussian, Anacharsis Klutz, the Swiss Grimm, and the Italian tragic poet, Alfieri, who was to marry the unhappy Countess of Albany. Possibly, the Condorcets were more appreciated by these foreigners and by their fellow countrymen, with many of whom, even with those who belonged to the same political party, Les Girondins, with Madame Roland, for example, they were not popular. Perhaps the Condorcets were a little priggish, a little ponderous. At this time, on the eve of the Revolution, their ideas were in advance of the average opinion of the day. They were regarded as utopians. Condorcet went so far as to maintain that women should have votes, and anticipating Metchnikoff and Bernard Shaw, that a time would come when human creatures would be able to prolong their existence through several generations. In religious opinions, the Condorcets went further than most of the revolutionaries. In politics, they were among the first revolutionaries to avow republicanism. When, on the king's flight in 1791, they demanded a republic, the monarchists were furious. Condorcet, replying to the remonstrances of one of them, exclaimed, It is my wife's fault. I allowed her to persuade me. And would you disturb domestic peace for the sake of one king, more or less? Though the boldness of Madame de Condorcet's opinions lost her certain friendships and closed against her certain salons, the influence of her own salon, Le Foyer de la République, as it was called, grew apace. Her husband's advice on all sorts of political questions was constantly sought. He did not sit in the first revolution parliament, but he was constantly to be found in the precincts of the assembly, 
and his wife, from her seat in the gallery, eagerly followed the debates. When, in the autumn of 1791, the Second Revolution Parliament, the Legislative Assembly was elected, Condorcet sat as representative for Paris, and for the third, the Convention, he was elected by no less than five departments. His outline of a constitution and his project for a state system of education exercised considerable influence on subsequent legislation. Condorcet and his wife were always interested in education, and they were intimately associated with an interesting experiment inaugurated in the year of their marriage. This was a fashionable lecture society known as Le Lycée, and not unlike La Société des Annales of today. It was founded in a house at the corner of the Rue Saint-Honoré and the Rue Valois by Monsieur Louis the Sixteenth's eldest brother, the Comte de Provence, afterwards Louis the Eighteenth, the Comte d'Artois, afterwards Charles the Tenth, Monsieur de Montmorin, secretary to foreign affairs, and Monsieur de Montesquieu. Lectures were given and classes conducted by the most distinguished scholars, notably La Harpe, Marmontel, and Condorcet. The society was an enormous success, especially among women. The members soon numbered seven hundred, and included the most brilliant society and court ladies. Here, at the Lycée, the beautiful Sophie, surrounded by the habitués of her salon, and saluted as la Venus Lycéenne, carried all before her. A popular versifier of the day compared the poverty of Greece with her one Aspasia to the wealth of France with her numerous Lycéennes. In France... Tout le beau sexe s'amuse du carré de l'hypoténuse et de Newton. Women of genius are seen to étudier l'anatomie en vrai savant approfondir l'astronomie, and to learn all such trifles without even knowing it indeed, with such ease that they run the risk of becoming mere parrots. The lycée closed during the most tempestuous years of the revolution, was revived later and was imitated in another institution, l'Athénée. In 1790, Condorcet's office of inspector of coinage was suppressed by royal decree. Consequently, the inspector with his wife exchanged l'Hôtel des Monnaies for a flat, number 50, rue de Lille, at the corner of the rue de Bellechasse, where Madame de Condorcet continued her salon. In the spring of that year, her only child, a daughter, Alexandrine Louise Sophie, generally known as Elisa, had been born. Barely more than a year old, the baby in her mother's arms was in the crowd fired on by Lafayette's soldiers on that famous Sunday, the 17th of July, 1791, when the people assembled on the Champ de Mars to demand the king's deposition. In the October of that year, Condorcet was, as we have said, elected a member of the Legislative Assembly. In the previous month he had been nominated to a post in the Treasury, and Horace Walpole had written ironically to Conway, Good Monsieur Condorcet has got a place in the Treasury with a salary of one thousand pounds a year. Later it is. Condorcet and such monsters. Later still, Walpole can believe. Any villainy of such a fiend. As these epithets imply, the Condorcets were becoming more and more pronounced in their revolutionary opinions, in their republicanism especially. In the autumn of 1791 they refused to allow their names to be included among those suggested as tutors and governesses of the Dauphin. Between the 20th of June and the 10th of August in that year, Madame de Condorcet had received some 400 delegates from Marseille, who had come to Paris for the Feast of the Federation, in her house in the Rue de Lille, and as we might expect she had completely bewitched them. A few months later the Condorcets, with Madame and Mademoiselle de Grouchy, took a furnished flat at Auteuil, in the house of the citizeness Pignon, number two in la Grande Rue. There they intended to spend the summer months returning to the Rue de Lille in the winter. Auteuil is now a suburb of Paris, not more than half an hour's tram ride from the Gare Saint-Lazare. In those days it was a separate village. For some years before the Revolution, Auteuil had been a favorite resort of literary Paris, so, of course, it had salons. Three of them were famous. The Salon of Madame Helvetius, the philosopher's widow, the Salon of la Comtesse de Boufflair, and the Salon of the general and military engineer, Le Michaud d'Arson. The first alone can, strictly speaking, be called a revolutionary salon, and this is what had attracted the Condorcets to Auteuil. Madame Helvetius was an old friend of Condorcet's. He had known her in her husband's lifetime when, in la rue Saint-Anne in Paris, she presided over assemblies so brilliant that they were named the States-General of Human Intelligence, 
les états généraux de l'esprit humain. Some of the guests of Madame Elvisius, however, were shocked by the frankness which prevailed, and Fontenelle implored his fellow guests not to speak evil of the devil, who might well be God's businessman. Messieurs, ne disons pas de mal du diable, c'est peut-être l'homme d'affaire du bon Dieu. Madame Elvisius herself, when the conversation grew too profound or too profane, would draw her special friends apart, leaving her husband to continue with the rest what she called his hunt for ideas. Despite her comparative superficiality, however, when Elvisius died in 1772, his widow kept her husband's friends. And Condorcet was not the only one who followed her to Auteuil, whither, having married her two daughters successfully, she retired to a house and park bought from the famous pastelist, Comte de la Tour. Thither, soon after their marriage, Condorcet had brought his young bride. Madame Elvisius loved men adored children, doted on animals, and, like many other salonnières, disliked women whom she considered proud and heartless. It says much, therefore, for the grace and charm of Sophie de Condorcet that, as soon as her husband brought her to Auteuil, this remarkable and difficult old lady made her an habitué de la maison. For Madame Elvisius would have agreed with a later salon dame, la Comtesse d'Agout, Daniel Stern, who advised her young friend Juliette Lambert, Madame Adam, about to open a salon, that she must have four times as many men friends as women. If your friend be a man, bring him, said another salonniere, Madame Mole. Men, animals, and children returned the affection of Madame Elvisius. Turgot and Benjamin Franklin, who lived at Passy to be near her, sighed in vain for her hand in marriage. Children flocked to the terrace of her house to see her tame birds feed out of her hand. They appreciated much more than their elders her colony of cats and her fierce bulldog brought from England by Franklin's nephew as an offering to Notre-Dame d'Auteuil, which was the American's name for his lady. The dogs and cats that invaded the whole house were the despair of two non-practicing and later non-juring abbés, Morellet and La Roche, who were Madame's permanent guests. After the bulldog had bitten La Roche, Morellet wrote to Franklin, who had returned to America, that they were trying to persuade Madame to send Franklin's gift to a bullfight. Also, that they proposed to present Franklin with a boatload of the eighteen cats, which were on the point of becoming thirty. End of chapter 2, part 1 Chapter 2, part 2 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two of Salons and Salonnières The Condorcets at Number Two La Grande Rue were but a few minutes' walk from their friend Madame Helvetius at Number Twenty Four. Her house, like theirs, fronted on the street. The Grande Rue of Auteuil, like that of certain other villages near Paris, which have now become parts of the metropolis, then contained a series of noble dwellings. One may see some of them still with street fronts so unpretentious as never to suggest the charming prospect of sylvan glades, undulating lawns, and sparkling fountains that may be viewed from the other side looking on to the park. At number 24, one found on entering a handsome vestibule on the ground floor, which, with that exception, was given up to kitchens and offices. An escalier d'honneur with a balustrade of wrought iron, the admiration of all beholders led to the first story, where were the living rooms, the dining room, and la chambre de madame. The salon, which communicated with the garden by a flight of steps, was large, as well it might be, considering that madame's guests frequently numbered fifty. Its prevailing colors were blue and white. The furniture included an inlaid rosewood chiffonnier with marble top, a spacious couch in blue damask, bergère armchairs, and causeuses upholstered in damask, and plentifully provided with cushions. Over the mantelpiece was a gilt mirror, in front of it a candelabra and a huge porcelain basket of blue porcelain flowers. That blue porcelain posy, forever blossoming for eight and twenty years, six of them the most tempestuous in French history, gazed down serenely on varying scenes, on guests coming and going, some bringing news of momentous events in Paris, others passing away to prison, to the guillotine or to escape it by dying with their own hand. Many were the heated discussions which raged in that blue and white drawing room. After one of them, its mistress found herself obliged to part from her old friend Morellet, who could not share her sympathy nor that of his fellow guests with the new order that was dawning. 
for Madame Elvisius, Cabanis, La Roche, and the Condorcets were the leaders of the revolutionary party at Auteuil. La Roche was the first revolutionary mayor and Cabanis a member of the municipal council. At the magnificent ceremony which inaugurated the new town hall, the young girls of the district marched in procession, escorted by a detachment of the National Guard, to the new building, and crowned with garlands the busts placed there of Voltaire, Rousseau, and Elvisius. When they reached the last, the band played the air of a popular song, beginning with the line, Where can one be better than in the bosom of one's family? Où peut-on être mieux qu'au sein de sa famille? At this signal, the philosopher's friends and relatives advanced, laid garlands upon the image of Elvisius and embraced one another, while the crowd, deeply moved, looked on. The Condorcets were probably present on that occasion, which was in the summer of 1791. Some months earlier we find Madame Elvisius heading the list of the Auteuil subscribers to patriotic funds. Her contribution was 4,500 francs, Cabanis followed with 1,200, and La Roche with 900. In 1791, number 24 in La Grande Rue was one of the chief revolutionary centers. The revolutionary leaders were accustomed to meet at Mirabeau's in the Chaussée d'Antin in the morning, at the assembly in the afternoon, and at the house of Madame Helvisius in the evening. The death of his friend and patient Mirabeau was a great grief to Cabanis. He sought consolation for his loss in friendship with Condorcet, whose sister-in-law, Charlotte de Gouchy, he was later to marry. As the political horizon darkened, Condorcet began to disagree with the party in power. This was ominous, and he may have had a presentiment of his fate when, in the summer of 1793, he accepted from his future brother-in-law a certain poison, a powdered mixture of stramonium and opium which he concealed in his ring. Later, Cabanis is said to have given some of the same poison to Napoleon Bonaparte. Since the king's attempted flight in 1791, Condorcet, and with Condorcet we always include Madame Condorcet, for their political opinions were identical, had been in the vanguard of revolutionary opinion. Towards the end of the following year, however, as the king's trial approached, Condorcet had tended to drop behind. He, who had been among the first openly to advocate the suspension of the kingly office, he who later had hailed the king's deposition and the proclamation of a republic, had not been able to bring himself to vote for his former sovereign's death. He had protested against the death penalty in all cases. He demanded that Louis Capet should suffer the severest penalty short of death. From that moment he had been regarded as a moderate, and moderation in those days was dangerous. Power was then passing from La Gironde to La Montagne. Condorcet had drafted a constitution which he had presented to the Assembly. It had been ignored. Another had been drawn up of which he disapproved. By a public letter he had appealed to the nation against it and in favor of his own. Thus he virtually signed his death warrant as he found, for on the 8th of July, 1793, the convention decreed his arrest. For twenty-four hours Madame Elvisius concealed him, but if he had been found in her house it would have meant certain death for La Roche who lived there and who, as we have said, was mayor of Auteuil. So the following day Condorcet went forth. This time, for a brief space, he actually found a hiding place with the Minister of the Interior, his friend Garat. By this deed, Garat, often a vicar of Bray, attained to something like heroism. He would have kept Condorcet longer if he would have consented to stay. But meanwhile, Cabanis was seeking a place of concealment where his friend's presence might be less dangerous to his host, and he had found one. It was in Paris, on the left bank, in a narrow dark street, then known as the Gravedigger Street, La Rue des Fossoyeurs, now La Rue Servandoni. There, at number 21, dwelt a widow, Madame Bernet, one of those noble and beneficent characters that show us how high humanity can reach. Madame Bernet had been accustomed to let lodgings to medical students, and it was through two of these, Pinel and Boyer, both of them later to be famous doctors, that Cabanis had heard of her. Is he an honest and virtuous man? was all Madame Bernet inquired when asked to receive Condorcet. In that case, do not stay to tell me his name. Let him come and do not hesitate a moment. While we talk, he may be seized. Condorcet went and lived for nine months at Madame Bernet's in strictest seclusion. His possessions at the Rue de Lille and at Auteuil had been placed under the government's seal, and his property confiscated. 
Madame Condorcet was reduced to sore straits, for she had to provide not only for herself and her child, but for an invalid sister and an aged governess. Neither her resourcefulness nor her talents failed her. Every morning she tramped from Auteuil into Paris, contriving to pass through the city gate unquestioned and unobserved among the daily crowd of market women. Once inside, she swiftly made her way to a little shop in the Rue Saint-Honoré, taken in the name of the brother of one of her husband's secretaries. There she sold that delicate lingerie for which her race is famous. And when customers were scarce, upstairs in a studio on the first floor she painted portraits. In those days when life was so uncertain and photography undreamed of, relatives were eager to possess pictures of loved ones of whom they might soon be bereft. And to fix their semblance on her canvas, Sophie de Condorcet had often to work in the cell of the condemned. Occasionally towards nightfall she would venture to her husband's retreat. There she found him engaged in writing for posterity a justification of his political conduct. This work, tending to concentrate his mind on his personal sorrows, plunged him into the depths of despair. Distressed by his low spirits, Sophie and Madame Bernet put their heads together and urged him to abandon the self-justification, and to take up something less personal. Condorcet adopted their excellent advice and wrote his Outline of the Progress of the Human Mind. To that we owe his greatest work. The composition of this aspiring treatise, without the aid of a single book, would alone be an amazing achievement. But the character of the work itself, when one considers the position of the author, is still more astounding. Here was Condorcet, with a bloody death staring him in the face and threatening those who were dearest to him, disappointed in his most cherished hopes for his country's future, yet writing throughout this book with all the confidence of the most untroubled optimism, and leading up to this final paragraph, which it is almost impossible to believe was written by the pen of an outlawed man. Everything indicates that we are on the eve of one of the greatest revolutions in the human mind, and that it will be happy as augured by the present state of human intelligence. This book, which has now become a classic, was published a year after Condorcet's death by and at the expense of the repentant government. In the same year it was translated into English. As the terror advanced, concealment became more and more difficult, and nothing could convince Condorcet that it was right to expose Madame Vernet to the danger in which his presence in her house involved her. But she refused to let him go, and watched him narrowly to see that he did not escape. On the 4th of April he learned that on the morrow government officials were to search his place of refuge. "'If I am discovered under your roof,' he said to Madame Bernet, "'you will share my sad fate. I am an outlaw. I must not stay.' With a French woman's logic and concision, and with a heroine's courage, Madame Vernet replied, "'The Convention, sir, has the right to place you outside the law. It has not the right to place you outside humanity. You will stay.' But Condorcet was determined to go, and the next morning, a little before ten o'clock, he contrived to give his hostess the slip, and to steal away disguised as a workman in jersey and white woolen cap. He was observed, however, by the concierge. She raised the hue and cry. And soon after the fugitive had emerged from the Rue des Fossoyeurs into the broad thoroughfare opposite the Luxembourg Palace, he was joined by a cousin of Madame Vernet, one Serret, to whom she was secretly married. This brave man insisted on remaining with Condorcet, and together they made their way out into the country. At three o'clock they reached a village, Fontenay-aux-Roses, which, like Auteuil, was the centre of a literary coterie. Thither had retired Monsieur and Madame Suard. In pre-revolution days they had been among Condorcet's intimate friends, and, being poorer than he, had received great kindness from him. But the Suards were among those who strongly disapproved of Condorcet's republicanism. They had avoided him on account of it, and they had not met since the king's death. The Suards, too, were in danger of their lives, and their one thought was to live quietly and unobserved. It was at their house that the hunted Condorcet, worn out with walking after months of inactivity, presented himself on that April afternoon. Arrived at what he believed to be their gate, Serret bade him farewell and returned to Madame Vernet, whom he had left in a fever of anxiety. But before Condorcet actually reached the Suarez, he had by accident made a serious blunder, which may have determined his fate. He had knocked at the wrong door, that of one of his political enemies, and had been recognized by the servant. 
when he arrived at the Suarez, he found the master of the house at home. They had a long conversation together. Whether Condorcet told of his blunder is not related. Probably he mentioned it. At any rate, he spoke at length of the danger which threatened him and his family. Then Suarez told his visitor that he could not keep him in his house, but that he was willing to help the fugitive in any way short of harboring him under his roof. He suggested that Condorcet should return at eight the next evening. Meanwhile, Suarez would go to Paris to try and obtain some false papers of identity, which might take the place of the civic certificate which Condorcet was without, and the absence of which placed him in the greatest danger. Giving his visitor some food, a copy of Horace, and a screw of tobacco for which he asked and which, with characteristic absent-mindedness he left behind, Suarez dismissed his illustrious guest. Then, immediately, Suarez set out for Paris. He went first to Garat. Garat advised him to apply to Cabanis, who, as doctor in the municipal hospital at Auteuil, might be able to give him papers belonging to some deceased patient. Accordingly, Suarez went to Auteuil, where Cabanis gave him an old license, lettre de passe, made out in the name of a soldier whom it permitted to go from one department into another. With this document, Suarez returned to Fontenay. At eight o'clock on the 6th of April, having sent away his wife and servant, he awaited his visitor in an empty house. He waited in vain. At half-past nine, Madame Suard and her maid returned. Throughout the next day, the 7th, there was no sign of the fugitive. On the 8th, the Suard spent the evening at the house of friends in a neighboring village. There they heard that at Clamart a man had been arrested who was thought to be Condorcet. It was true. After leaving Suard on the 5th, Condorcet had spent the night in the Verrière Wood. The next morning, worn out with fatigue and having hurt his foot in a quarry, he entered a tavern at Clamart and ordered an omelette. "'How many eggs do you want in it?' he was asked. Condorcet, always absent-minded and totally unskilled in the making of omelettes, replied haphazard, "'A dozen.' Such an answer was quite enough to arouse the suspicion of a revolution spy who happened to be present. Questioned as to his identity, Condorcet, with the white, well-kept hands of an aristocrat, replied that he was a carpenter. Such a discrepancy was more than sufficient to warrant a search, and the discovery of a Latin book in the pocket of the so-called carpenter was additional presumption of guilt. He was taken to the nearest prison at bourg la reine There, the next morning on the 7th, he was found dead in his cell. On leaving Suarez two days earlier, he had said, If I have a night before me, I do not fear them, but I will not be taken to Paris. By them, he meant doubtless the officers of the revolution. And it was probably in order to escape being taken by them to Paris that he had sought and found deliverance in the powder Cabanis had given him. The prison doctor attributed to apoplexy the death of Pierre Simon, the name Condorcet had given. For months his wife and family were ignorant of his fate. Madame de Condorcet believed that her husband had emigrated. The state disposed of a great part of his property as belonging to an émigré. Six weeks after his unknown death, we are surprised to find the municipal council of Auteuil pronouncing Sophie's divorce from her husband. The divorce, so the Auteuil records show, had been demanded by her in the previous January. On reading this record, one cannot help thinking of the rumors of Madame de Condorcet's infidelity circulated by her enemies. They said she had already an entanglement before her marriage with Condorcet, that she had had lovers since, and we know that after her husband's death, though she never married again, she had more than one liaison, that in 1798, for example, she was openly the mistress of the naturalist Fauriel. The Abbé Morellet, in his account of Condorcet's last conversation with Suarez, relates that the fugitive spoke of his little daughter with affection, but of his wife with indifference. But Morellet had, by that time, ceased to be Condorcet's friend. He had separated from him, as we have seen, for political reasons. And when he disagreed with anyone, Morellet could be unjust and bitter, as Voltaire's nickname for him, Marlet, indicates. The Condorcet's friends, on the other hand, were unanimous in praising Sophie's devotion to her husband and his solicitude for her. We may therefore dismiss these unkind rumors. They were probably as unfounded as the absurd story that Sophie had been the mistress of Louis the Fifteenth, whom she never saw, and who died when she was ten. As for the divorce proceedings, they may have been a mere formality, not unusual in the case of émigrés, 
entered into at Condorcet's own suggestion, and intended to save the lives of his wife and daughter, whose danger, as we know, caused him constant anxiety. Sophie herself, though she survived her husband for eighteen years, never completely recovered from the horror of that terrible time. Her daughter, Madame O'Connor, used to say that her mother could not bear to hear the word Girondet mentioned. Madame O'Connor could not bear to hear the name of Suard, for both she and Madame Bernet execrated him as Condorcet's murderer. For some months in 1794, deprived of her husband's revenue, Madame de Condorcet continued in great poverty. Then, after the reaction of Thermidor, her circumstances improved. Less than a year after Robespierre's death, Condorcet's memory was rehabilitated, and his widow received from the government such of his property as had not been sold, with the value of that which had been disposed of. She then took a small flat in Paris in la rue de Matignon, where she was joined by Madame Talma, who had divorced her husband. But most of her time Madame de Condorcet continued to pass at Auteuil. In that literary village salon life was once more beginning to flourish. Those who had achieved the miracle of living through the revolution were returning. La Roche was back again in the salon of Madame Helvetius. Madame de Boufflers, released by Le Neuf Termida from la Conciergerie prison, was reopening her salon, ready to receive the exiled Talleyrand when he returned from America in 1897. Lucien and Joseph Bonaparte were now frequently at Auteuil. Thither, in the last days of the century, they brought their triumphant brother, Napoleon, recently returned from Egypt. Napoleon visited Madame Helvetius, and, fresh from the vastness of the desert, remarked on the tininess of her park. Ah, General, said the old lady, you don't know how happy one can be on four acres of ground. The future emperor could not tolerate repartee, so he vented his displeasure on Madame de Condorcet. I dislike women who meddle in politics, he said, but she too was a match for him. And the widow of the first French advocate of women's suffrage retorted smartly, You are right, General. But in a country where their heads are cut off, it is natural they should wish to know the reason why. With Napoleon was coming in a new era, which Madame Helvetius was not to live to see. She died at the age of eighty-one on the 13th of August, 1800. For Sophie de Condorcet, Auteuil had now lost its attractiveness. She took a house in Normandy, not far from the home of her childhood, where she spent the summer months returning for the winter to Paris, to a flat in La Grande Rue Verte, now La Rue de Pontièvre. There she had a salon. During her last years at Auteuil, Sophie had been editing and publishing her husband's works, and with them her translation of Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments, to which she added a work of her own, Lettre sur la Sympathie. The appearance of these letters in 1798 brought their author an enthusiastic letter from Madame de Stahl. Immensely superior to Sophie as a writer, Madame de Stahl's literary flair had been quick to discern in Madame de Condorcet's writings the kind of talent she herself did not possess. The letters display, wrote the author of Corinne, an authority which emanates from reason, a true but controlled sensibility which makes you a woman apart. Then showing a self-knowledge astonishing in one so impetuous, Madame de Stahl added, I believe I possess talent and wit, esprit, but I govern none of my faculties. They govern me, and I cannot control my use of them. This effusion surprised Sophie. The two women, though not unacquainted, though about the same age, though they commenced Salonnières in the same year, 1786, had never been friends. Indeed, they had very little in common. Madame de Condorcet, as we have seen, was a freethinker, inclining to atheism, and a republican. Madame de Stahl was a deist with Christian sympathies, and always at heart a monarchist, though she came to support the Republic when she found it inevitable. Moreover, Madame de Stahl had never liked Condorcet. She had found it difficult to forgive Turgot's friend for his failure to appreciate Turgot's successor, Necker. Madame de Stahl, one of the most brilliant talkers that ever lived. If I were queen, said one who knew her, I would command Madame de Stahl to talk to me all day was not an ideal salonniere. She was too restless, too impulsive, too loquacious. The business of a salon lady is not so much to talk herself as to make her guests talk, to draw them out and set them at their ease. This Sophie de Condorcet achieved to perfection. 
Madame de Stahl never succeeded in mastering her friend Madame Récamier's art of listening with seduction. Neither did she possess that other quality, so indispensable in every good hostess, the quality of tact. Herein her Helvetian ancestry revealed itself. Her tactlessness was sometimes mistaken for malice as when at a large dinner party addressing Garat, who years before had had a scandalous love affair, she asked loudly, By the way, Garat, did you ever marry that girl? Nevertheless, there is no denying the influence exercised by Madame de Stahl's salon during the early years of the Revolution. We see her standing in front of the chimney-piece, her hands clasped behind her back, her large black eyes flashing fire, her dark hair falling in massive curls about her neck as her lips pour forth eloquence. Her social dominance had begun early when she was a little girl at home. When seated in her mother's salon on a little wooden stool at Madame Necker's feet, Germaine had held entranced by her childish prattle a group of great personalities, Marmontel, Gibbon, Grimm. She ought to have been well trained in the Salonnière's art. For a while, indeed, after her marriage to the Swedish ambassador, she imagined herself to be governing France from her salon in the Rue de Bac. For a while she succeeded in that most difficult of social experiments, especially in France of making men of opposite political opinions dine together. But Madame de Stahl soon found neutrality impossible. Gradually she became identified with a party, that of such constitutional royalists as Talleyrand, Narbonne, Lalit Hollandal, and because this party was not in the ascendant, her salon ceased to count. Most of her friends emigrated. She herself stayed on until the autumn of 1792, trying to save the Queen, succeeding in saving Narbonne, constantly risking her own life for the sake of her friends, until, finding she could no longer be of service to them, she herself took flight during the September massacres, and, after narrowly escaping arrest, safely crossed the frontier and reached her father's house at Copet. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Part 1 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 3. Part 1. Clubs and Club Women During the Revolution. Quote, L'insurrection ne sera possible que si les femmes s'en mêlent. Mirabeau. Today, if you ask an intelligent, public-spirited French woman of the middle class to what club she belongs, she will look at you in amazement and exclaim, What should I do with a club when I have my home? If she is well-to-do, she may add, when I have my salon. Neither men nor women in the France of today are so addicted to the club habit as we are in London. But during the revolution it was different. Then, among women as well as men, there raged a veritable club mania. Clubinomanie, the French called it. They had caught it in England. It had been a symptom of the 18th century Anglomania. Before the revolution, French clubs were for men only. A pamphleteer of the time deplores the habit Frenchmen were contracting of avoiding women's society and isolating themselves in clubs. With the introduction of this pernicious practice, he says, set in the decadence of French manners and the substitution of something called energy, which was in reality nothing but rudeness and roughness for the earlier social virtues and charm. These clubs were mainly social. Members met to talk and play cards. One of the earliest of them, founded in 1782, called itself Le Club Politique, though it paradoxically tabooed political as well as religious subjects. Another, Le Club de Boston, ou des Américains, was founded in 1785 by the Duke of Orléans after one of his visits to England. Others followed, and so rapidly that the government began to fear a political danger. Whatever attempt might be made to exclude politics in those days of political ferment, politics would keep breaking in. Consequently, in 1787, the Controller General Calonne closed all clubs. But he could not prevent people meeting together to discuss the questions of the hour. One of these little groups, consisting mainly of lawyers, used to meet during the election of the States General in 1788 and 1789 at the house of Dupas, a councillor in the Paris Parliament. In this gathering some have discerned the origin of the most famous of the Revolution clubs, the Jacobins. After Calonne's dismissal from office, the government stopped trying to check the club mania. Then, all over France, clubs began to spring up like mushrooms and to vanish in many cases almost as quickly. 
The club fury, writes a contemporary author, spread through all classes, all ages, all sexes. In certain towns, artisans left their work to go and déraisonner in clubs. There were clubs for everyone, not only for men and women, but separate clubs for old men, for old women, for young men, for young girls, and for children. Clubs for every type of character, for every shade of temperament, and political opinion. Clubs for the furious, les enragés, for the impartial, for the poor, who wore woolen caps, les indigents or les bonnets de laine. Clubs for loyalists, for the enemies of despotism, for the defenders of the republic, for the conquerors of the Bastille. A club for the federated, a club for divorced women, a club for les noirs, a club for servants, a club for ladies, a club for the electors of 1789, a club from twelve till fourteen o'clock. Most of these clubs were political, but not all. The last, for instance, the club from twelve till fourteen o'clock, which met at the house of one Calava in the Palais Royal, was a purely social club of jovial old men, the youngest of whom was sixty. The veterans occasionally invited young women to their assembly. Louise Fusy, the actress, tells how she was once their guest and how witty, amiable, and gay she found her elderly hosts. But it is with the political clubs that we are mainly concerned here, and among them we may distinguish three categories. First, clubs for men only. Second, clubs for men and women. Third, clubs for women only. In all three we shall find women for a while exercising a certain influence. They threw themselves into the club movement, says the patronizing Michelet, with all the blind ardor of a woman's heart, with the passions of the Middle Ages employed in the service of the new faith. It would be difficult to exaggerate the immense importance of these clubs. The power of the Jacobins for a while rivaled that of the National Assembly. This club, whether or not it originated in the assemblies at Dupas, dates from the earliest days of the Revolution. When the States General assembled at Versailles, some of the deputies began to meet together to discuss the deliberations of the assembly. As many of them came from Brittany, their gatherings were called Le Club Breton. It was essentially a club of professional men discussing political matters in private. After the 6th of October, Le Club Breton followed the assembly to Paris. The assembly had established itself in the riding school, Manège, in the Rue Saint-Honoré, on the site of the present Rue de Rivoli, where it is now joined by the Rue Castiglione. The Bretons rented for their club hall the refectory of the Black Friars or Jacobin Monastery, which henceforth gave its name to the club. These monastic buildings were on the site of the present Saint-Honoré Market. As time went on, and as the Jacobin Club expanded, it and its affiliated societies came to occupy not only the Black Friars Refectory, but the library also, then the crypt, and finally the church itself. Arrogating to themselves the high title of Friends of the Constitution, Amis de la Constitution, our quantum Bretons regarded themselves as aristocrats among clubbists. When they deigned to admit women it was by ticket, and as a rule only to certain parts of the hall. But sometimes, from their special seats, women addressed the club and even proposed amendments and resolutions. More than once they were voted the honors of the session. In 1792, on the 29th of February, a member was severely reprimanded for having introduced three women into his private box. Perhaps the severity of this reprimand may have been due to the fact that one of the women was Madame Roland, who was not popular in the club. With her were Madame and Mademoiselle Pache, wife and daughter of the future war minister and mayor of Paris. Counter-revolutionists, who never hesitated to bring the vilest charges against their opponents, accused Pache of sending his daughter to the club to be kissed by drunken Jacobins. Madame Roland, unlike most of the revolutionary women, was not a clubiste. In fact, neither she nor her husband can have been in the least clubable. More than once both Monsieur and Madame Roland were denounced in the Jacobin Club. One of the members, when he wanted to be ironical, announced that Madame Roland was about to found a woman's club at the Tuileries. Ultimately, Roland's name was erased from the role of members. But there were other prominent women who, for a time at any rate, were great favorites with the Jacobins, and large numbers appear to have been fortunate enough to obtain tickets of admission. Madame Julien, to whose diary we shall refer later, says that when she went to the club on the evening of the 5th of August, 1792, she found there some two or three hundred ladies dressed as if for the theatre. The journalist, Madame Robert, often addressed the club. 
Two days after Madame Julien's visit, she told how three men had attacked her in the street and tried to make her pluck the national cockade out of her hat. Of the first, the sight of a little knife and a firm refusal made short work. Against the sword cane of the second, she defended herself with a roll of engravings she was carrying. When the third was pulling off her hat, a fourth came up and said, "'You fools! Don't you know this is not the day?' The last remark referred doubtless to the counter-revolution that most revolutionaries believed the royalists to have planned for a certain day. The voice of Terroigne de Méricourt was also frequently heard in the club. The de Goncourt's right of the pitiless Herodias, who revealed herself eloquent and legal-minded at the Jacobin Club. We have already seen Terroigne in three revolutionary parts, as a rebel in the October insurrection, as an assiduous attendant in the galleries of the National Assembly, and as the foundress of a salon. We left her in May 1790 at her home at Marcourt, whither she may have gone to escape prosecution by the Châtelet Law Court, which, as it will be remembered, issued a warrant for her arrest in the following August. Tirouin was absent from Paris for nearly two years. On her return she received an ovation from the Jacobin Club. And, well, she deserved it for her experiences had been strange and her sufferings many in the revolutionary cause. While staying with her Flemish relatives in the autumn of 1790, she had been secretly seized and carried off to the Austrian fortress of Kufstein in the Tyrol, where she was imprisoned during the emperor's good pleasure on the charge of having attempted to take the life of the emperor's sister Marie Antoinette, Queen of France, during the insurrection of the previous October. One may readily believe that so inveterate an agitator would leave no stone unturned in the effort to obtain her release. Europe resounded with Terroigne's complaints. They resulted first in her being taken out of her dungeon and placed in a private house, then in her being granted something like freedom to go and come in the immediate neighborhood, and finally in her complete liberation. By the end of 1791 she was back in Paris and on the 26th of January, 1792, a member of the Jacobin Club declared that he had to announce a triumph for patriotism. Mademoiselle Tirouigne, famous for her civisme and for the persecutions she has endured, is here in the ladies' gallery. Immediately several Jacobin rose, went up to the gallery, and escorted the heroine down into the main body of the hall. There, for the first time, she addressed the club. Her oratory was wonderful. Only the pen of a de Goncourt can do justice to her eloquence. It was extraordinary, audacious, unbridled, overwhelming. It proceeded from a brain packed with the confused and jostling memories of miscellaneous reading, from lips on which the French language halted. Yet notwithstanding, down the torrent of her emphase rolled the grandeur of Pinder, the majesty of the Bible. In her voice were the imperiousness and the threatening of a people in wrath. The great club received her, with all the interest due to her sex and her misfortunes. She accepted an invitation to write the story of her sufferings and to read it at the club's next meeting. The reading, when it occurred on the 1st of February, produced a veritable feminist manifestation, the only one to which the Jacobin ever gave expression. Unfortunately, the actual document, which in an expanded form the writer promised to publish, does not exist. But references to it may be found in newspapers of the day, in Le Patriote Francais, for example, which reports Terroigne as having said that the only way to establish the revolution on a firm basis was to make war on the rebels and despots who threaten us with war, but who fear it more than we. The heroine went on to give encouraging reports of the progress of the revolution in the Low Countries, in Germany, and even in the Emperor's own household. The chairman of the meeting, Madame Roland's friend, Lantena, Ignoring Terroigne's cry for war, congratulated her on having triumphed through that passive resistance, which in civilized countries is woman's role, which has so often caused tyrants to grow pale, and which to unenlightened nations appears supernatural. He adjured the oratress to repeat her story whenever citizens assembled in great numbers. After Lantena, Manuel took the floor and waxed even more enthusiastic. He hailed Tirouigne as one of the first Amazons of liberty, as a martyr to the Constitution. He referred to a society of men that had once presumed to question whether women had souls. But those men were priests, double-faced, calumniating women in order to appear not to love them. If our fathers, said Manuel, had so poor an opinion of women, it was because they were not free. 
liberty would have taught them that nature can create Portia's as easily as Cibola's. In conclusion, the orator demanded for Tirwang the honors of the session. She received them, and not of that session only, but of many that followed. For the next few months, la belle liegeoise was as free of the assemblies as were any of the men members. The Scotsman, Dr. John Moore, when he visited the club, saw Tirwang not relegated to the gallery with her sisters, but sitting in the body of the hall with the men, and wearing a semi-military costume. Her favorite attire was, as we have seen, a riding habit, white or red, green or blue. But at one festival she appeared in Greek drapery, une robe à la grecque. But alas, Tirwang's popularity with the Jacobins endured but a few weeks, for she spoke too long and too often. The same may be said of another woman clubist, Rose, or, as recent research has it, Claire Lacombe. Lacombe was born in the south of France at Pamiers in Ariège about 1765. Very attractive with dark hair, eyes, and eyebrows, she went on to the stage and enjoyed considerable success in provincial theatres, until the violence of her revolutionary opinions involved her in a quarrel with the managers of the Lyon Theatre. Then she came to Paris, where she made her first public appearance on the 25th of July, 1792, at the Jacobin Club. There she read amidst much applause a petition which she was to present a few hours later to the Legislative Assembly. Of that petition we shall have more to say in another chapter. Apparently living on her savings, as she said, Lacombe now devoted herself to promoting the revolution. Her conduct on the 10th of August, during the attack on the Tuileries, won for her a civic crown, for which a fortnight later she publicly thanked the assembly amidst loud applause. The second in influence of the great revolutionary clubs, the Cordeliers, was also the scene of women's activities. Founded on August 5, 1790, the Cordeliers met on the left bank of the Seine, at first in the monastery of the Grey Friars, or Cordeliers, which was in the street of that name now called la rue de l'école de médecine the monastery from which the club took its name was as vast as that of the jacobins on the other side of the water it had a large library one of the finest in paris and it was in the library hall that the club held its meetings but only for the first eight months of its existence in may seventeen ninety one it was compelled to seek other quarters for months it wandered from hall to hall until it finally settled in a house known as l'hôtel de jean lys at twenty four rue dauphine though in popular parlance the club retained the name of the monastery which had been its first meeting place its correct title was la société des amis des droits de l'homme et du citoyen as the title implies the club was occupied rather with the rights of individuals than like the jacobins with broad legislative measures and political machinery at the head of all their documents, the Cordeliers had engraved an open eye, intended to designate the vigilance of the society, ever on the watch for any official delinquency, especially for any miscarriage of justice. The Cordeliers, having protested in vain against the imprisonment of René Audu, subscribed for her to have a private room in the Châtelet prison, and sent her clothes by one of their most active adherents, Mademoiselle Lemort. The successor of the Cordeliers in France today is la Ligue des droits de l'homme et du citoyen, which was founded during the Dreyfus affair, and of which Professor Ollard, the great historian of the revolution, is one of the most prominent and active members. The Cordeliers were completely democratic. Their members belonged to all classes. Women played a prominent part in their proceedings. Whether women were ever actually admitted as members of the club is doubtful. Monsieur Ollard thinks it possible. Another reliable authority, Professor Mathieu, merely mentions women as being present and sometimes taking part in the deliberations. There remain to us two striking accounts of the appearance of women at the Cordelier. The first, an address given by a woman. The second, a woman's description of a debate. But in neither case was it probably the Cordelier Club. The first, the speech of Thérouin de Méricourt, was to the district of the Cordelier before the club was founded. The second was the visit of Madame de Genlis to what she calls the Cordelier Club, but which was more likely to have been the Cordelier Fraternal Society that was closely connected with the club. It was in February 1790 that Thierwang visited the club and there achieved her most brilliant oratorical success. The account of it and a full summary of Thierwang's oration was given in his Révolution de France et de Brabant by Camille Desmoulins, who heard it. 
Camille had come to enroll himself on the register of the Cordelier district and was about to leave the hall when the usher informed the president of the assembly that a lady was asking permission to enter. She was thought to be some ordinary petitioner and great was the surprise when it transpired that she was none other than the famous Mademoiselle Tiroigne. Enthusiasm seized the members and one cried, It is the Queen of Sheba come to see the Solomon of the districts. Tiroigne, who was already on the platform with never-failing readiness, replied, Yes, it is the renown of your wisdom that brings me among you. Prove that you are Solomon that to you it is given to build the temple and hasten to build one for the national assembly then la belle liegeoise let loose the flood of her oratory with flowers of classical allusion and biblical imagery tirwine drove her point home the assembly was unworthily housed moving from the jeu de pomme to the hotel de menu plaisir at versailles then to the manege at paris it was like noah's dove sent out from the ark of the covenant it had no sure and certain place whereon to lay its foot Meanwhile, the site of the dungeons of La Bastille stood empty. One hundred thousand workmen were unemployed. What more is needed, O Cordelier, model of all districts, patriots, republicans, Romans? Lose no time. Open a subscription list. Invite your architects to send in tenders. Cut down the cedars of Mount Lebanon, the fir trees of Mount Ida. Ah, if ever stones were to move, it would not be to build the walls of Thebes but to construct the Temple of Liberty. Then, calling on her woman hearers to give their jewels to the cause, Tirwang set the example by taking off her own ornaments. Amidst violent applause, the meeting resolved that the officers of the district should draw up an appeal to be addressed to the districts and to the departments. But, like many another appeal, if ever made, it was fruitless. That glorious Temple of Liberty never had any existence outside Tirwang's feverish brain. Madame de Genlis, when she visited the Cordelier, said she heard women declaiming there with loud, deep voices, voix de poitrine, against the nobles and priests. They waxed most eloquent in attacks on the rich. A fishwife, in Poissard, repeated over and over again that préjugé mobilière, she meant nobilière, could not be tolerated. But no one paid the slightest attention to this little slip of the tongue, and the speaker was warmly applauded. It seemed to Madame de Genlis that the great delight of all these people was to imitate, contrefaire sérieusement, the President and members of the National Assembly. The third in influence of the Revolution Clubs was Le Cercle Social, or, to give its full and formal title, L'Assemblée Fédérative des Amis de la Vérité. It met twice a week, on Mondays and Fridays, in the huge partially subterranean circus which had been constructed by the Duc de Chartres in the middle of the Palais Royal Gardens in 1788. The Friends held their first meeting on the 1st of October, 1790. Apportez-y chacun un rayon de lumière. Bring each of you a ray of light, was the motto inscribed over the platform. If that requisition were complied with, the light must have been dazzling, for no less than five thousand are said to have been present. The club immediately became one of the great institutions of the capital and the favorite resort of fashionable ladies. At the end of the first six weeks, its members numbered three thousand. The subscription was eight livres a month. Condorcet was a frequent speaker there. The grandiloquent title of the club could not fail to provoke the irony of the journalists, one of whom wrote, Truth has set up her throne in the circus. That place is put to many uses. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays it is a concert room. On Wednesdays and Saturdays nymphs of the neighborhood turn it into a dancing saloon. On Mondays and Fridays people come there to tell the truth. Not oratory alone was provided. Those who were bored by Condorcet's eloquence, as many were, might play cards or billiards, drink coffee or read in the library. Le Cercle Social was the daughter of an earlier group, Le Club Philosophique, a gathering of cultivated doctrinaires with cosmopolitan and feminist sympathies. While the Jacobins, within closed doors at first, were occupied in preparing the deliberations of the National Assembly and the Cordelier with the rights of the individual, the social circle was a kind of political academy concerned with the theoretical side of the revolution. Its most active member was the Abbé Fauchet, described in one anti-revolutionary newspaper as Bishop by the Wrath of God. Like many other clubs, Le Club Révolutionnaire des Arts and Le Club des Dames, for instance, 
The Cercle Social had its own organ in the press, a weekly paper which Fauchet edited. It was entitled Bouche de Fer, Iron Mouth because at the door of its office in la rue de l'ancienne comédie stood an open iron box ready to receive in writing the expression of every grievance the paper entirely occupied with the ventilation and discussion of these complaints contained no news though women were not denied the privilege of paying a monthly subscription to the social circle they were debarred from exercising any control over the society its direction remained entirely in the hands of the little band of masculine philosophers who had founded it there would seem to be no doubt that some of the well-known men's revolution clubs actually admitted women as members, for Thierwang and La Reine Audu were members of Le Club des Minimes, and Thérèse Cabarus, afterwards Madame Tallien, writing to the Journal de la Cour et de la Ville to protest against certain allegations made against her, described herself as membresse du Club des Électeurs de 1789. But on the whole, in these clubs we have mentioned, women were kept at a certain distance. We now come to a different kind of club, the Société Fraternelle, in which women played a really important part, as is shown by the fact that many of them were called Société des Deux Sex. The society stood in relation to the clubs in much the same position as in the religious world of present-day England the mission hall stands in relation to the church. These fraternal societies were popular assemblies, often the resorts of whole families, of children as well as of parents. As the revolution went on, each of the great clubs came to have one of these popular societies attached to it, and they multiplied rapidly, especially in the provinces. Their importance in instructing the mass of the people in revolution principles can hardly be exaggerated. The subscription, only a few sous a month, was small enough to admit the lowliest. End of chapter 3, part 1 Chapter 3, Part 2 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of Clubs and Club Women. This movement, like that of the clubs, had its chief center in the St. Honoré quarter, and the earliest of these popular societies, instituted in 1790, met in the Jacobin monastery of the Rue St. Honoré. Its founder was a schoolmaster, when Claude Dansart. At a time when Robert Rakes and Hannah Moore were starting Christian Sunday schools in England, it occurred to this Parisian schoolmaster that he might profitably employ his Sunday and holiday afternoons by gathering together the costermongers of the St. Honoré market and other tradespeople of the neighborhood, in order to make clear to them the mysterious ways of the National Assembly. So he invited them to come to the crypt of the Blackfriars. They accepted his invitation in large numbers. Women especially, lone females, who found it hard to keep their feet in the world in which they were living, and who came to M. Dansart for advice and consolation. As the darkness of the crypt thickened in the winter months, the schoolmaster would draw from his pocket a tinder-box and a bit of candle, and, by its faint glimmer, supplement the light of his own cogent reasoning. As the assembly grew, other candles became necessary. To provide for them, the hat was sent round, and thus arose the habit of paying a small contribution. Soon the society began to attract the attention of the leading Jacobin club members who met above, and of other politicians of the day. And as the society grew famous, the good Dansart found himself ousted. Some say he withdrew on account of a scandal about his daughter. At any rate, he was replaced by a committee of which the eminent journalist François Robert was a member. Now, side by side, with the tradesmen of the district, sat such exalted personages as the Duc de Chartres, Danton, Tellien, Roderer, and Manuel. In this, its glorified state, the society called itself by the loud-sounding title of Société Fraternelle des Patriotes de l'un et de l'autre sexe, de tout âge et de tout état, later to be amplified still further by the addition of Défenseur de la Constitution. The society had now, as well as two men secretaries, two women, whose duty it was to keep a list of the names and addresses of the women members and to deal with the women applicants for membership. All applicants, men and women alike, must be proposed by one member and seconded or supported by two others. If the application were questioned, a committee of six citizens and six citizenesses reported to the assembly of the society, which admitted or rejected the member in question. From every new member the following oath was exacted. I swear to be faithful to the nation, to the law, and to the king, later to the republic, 
and to maintain to the best of my ability the liberty of France and the rights of man and of the citizen. I promise to remain faithful to the regulations of the society as long as it exists. Among the rules of the society was one which attempted vainly, it is probable, to ensure the order of debate. Seeing, it ran, that a free interchange of thought and opinion is one of man's most imprescriptible rights, no member of the society shall be at liberty to interrupt a speaker, nor to refuse him a hearing, but merely to refute him at the close of his speech. By the time this elaborate organization had been completed, i.e., by April 1791, the Jacobin Society had emerged from the shadows of the crypt into the daylight of one of the upper rooms of the monastery, where it met at four o'clock on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday afternoons. Meanwhile, similar societies had been springing up in the provinces and all over Paris. Well, nigh every section had one. Women were admitted to membership in most of them, but not in all. In some of the meetings they were separated from men, though in one case only by a tricolor ribbon. In others, the sisters had their own special galleries. From one of these at Colmar, they were urgently entreated to come down and to help their brethren engage in a mouse hunt. More courageous than Chaucer's friaress, the Colmar ladies accepted the invitation and gloriously vanquished the four-footed intruders. In some societies, women were not asked for regular subscriptions, but only to pay for the printing of the rules. In some, again, they were not permitted to vote. In others, when they did vote, their votes were not counted. Certain of these fraternal unions, following the Pauline tradition, prescribed silence on the sisters, exhorting them to make bandages and to leave the brethren to do the talking. Children, as we have said, were frequently admitted. Now and again they were received into membership. Twelve was the age limit in one society, but there are many examples of the presence of much younger children. In one case a young priest, un curé assermenté, brought his whole family to the society's meeting. My eight months old daughter, Cornelia, he said, will be presented to you by her mother and placed on the platform by her nurse. Thus she will learn betimes to savor the sweetness and the joy of true republicans. We read of a little girl of six reciting the Declaration of the Rights of Man with such charm that the whole audience rose and embraced not her, but her mother. Was it the daughter's eloquence or the mother's attractiveness that aroused such enthusiasm? Another child of six, taken to the meeting by her governess, rose and spoke with so much vigor that the whole assembly loudly applauded. Throughout the provinces these societies multiplied rapidly. Lantena, a friend of Madame Roland, wrote to her that they seemed to personify the majesty of the sovereign people, and that their ardent patriotism moved him to tears. Madame Roland herself, though at first disdainful, and always objecting to women openly taking part in politics, came round in the end and joined the Jacobin Fraternal Society. Robespierre regarded the societies as the finest of forcing grounds for republican opinions. Their activities were varied. In Paris, they seem to have been mainly occupied with deputations, receiving them from and sending them to other societies and clubs, and sending them also to the bar of the National Assembly. Thus, in 1791, after the King's flight and humiliating return to Paris, fifty-five presidents of fraternal societies petitioned the Assembly to consult the communes of France as to what should be done with the captured fugitive. The societies were always eager to denounce traitors and to bring them before the Revolution tribunals. They were ever on the watch for conspiracies against the government. One day the Jacobin fraternals in the crypt were honored by a visit from Mirabeau and Barmave, who had been deputed by the Jacobin club above, to descend and thank the society for its vigilance in detecting the theft of a quantity of bullion. Many of those fetes and ceremonies which were so numerous in the Revolution period were organized by the societies. When, in the hall of the Jacobin club, the bust of Rousseau, Franklin and Voltaire were unveiled, eight women members of the society, simple as equality, beautiful as liberty, received from a procession of boys and girls one of the Bastille stones, deposited it amidst the bust and crowned them with civic wreaths. Then, with the high moral earnestness of that time, a prominent citizen addressed these simple, beautiful ones. Mothers and wives, he cried, you who have done as much for the revolution as we do yet more. An honorable task remains for you. Great revolutions are born in tempests which time alone can calm. Teach your children to lisp with the words, 
father, mother, those of fatherland and liberty. At these words, let your child's eye flash, let his heart beat fast, as he grows up, let the nation be indebted to you for a citizen, a defender of the nation's rights, one who, like his father's, shall be the horror of tyrants. Some of the societies had attached to them philanthropic committees composed mainly of women engaged in helping the poor, the sick, and the orphan, and as soon as war began in making lint bandages and clothes for soldiers. Cousin Filon, cousin bien, ran the popular song. Allons, ça va, ça va. V'là des habits de notre fabrique pour l'hiver qui vient. Soldats de la République, vous ne manquerez de rien. But these social gatherings were not always serious. Sometimes they wound up with a dance. Women would sing patriotic songs. They were more or less commandeered to act patriotic plays, being told that if they refused, they would be regarded as traitors to their country. In some societies, women presided. The sisters Garros, for example, at a club near Osh. One was chairman, the other secretary, while their father was the mover of resolutions. After a time, feminine influence became too dominant in the societies. At Air sur Lys, women came in such numbers that there was no room for the men, and when one female insisted on space being found for her foot warmer as well, such an outrageous demand was seized upon as a pretext for expelling her. It was a gross injustice, because in other societies foot warmers were expressly permitted. As the influence of women grew in the societies, men lost interest in them. The men of the Jacobin society preferred to listen to the debates of the club to taking part in their own assemblies. This annoyed the other sex, and women of the revolution were not accustomed to suffer in silence. When aggrieved, their way was to organize a deputation. So now, on July 12, 1792, we find a deputation of Jacobin sisters airing their grievances before the Jacobin club. They complained that men disdained to pursue their instruction among us, but by that time women had begun to have clubs of their own. The fact that they often met under the same roof led to a good deal of confusion, both in the contemporary records and in subsequent histories, between these purely feminine clubs and the popular societies of the two sexes. Many of the fraternal societies, as we have already indicated, tended to become women's clubs. It is clear, however, that there were certain clubs founded by women and for women alone. A considerable number, and by no means the least influential, were in the provinces, notably at Lyon, Macon, and Dijon. At least two were in Paris, Les Amis de la Vérité and Les Citoyennes Républicaines Révolutionnaires. Of all the women's provincial clubs, that of Lyon was the most influential. It was founded in June 1791. The members were called upon to take the following oath. I swear to be faithful to the nation, to the law, and to the king. I swear on every occasion to urge my husband, my brothers, and my children to do their duty to their country. I swear to teach my children and all others over whom I shall have authority to prefer death to slavery. When in 1792, as the result of profiteering, Lyon was on the verge of starvation, the women's club took matters into their own hands. Having failed to obtain satisfaction from the town council, they placarded a notice all over the city, fixing the price of no less than sixty necessities, including bread, wine, oil, fresh and dry vegetables, cheese, fruit, candles, etc. Then a well-organized body of women police took possession of shops and markets, and for three days, the 16th, 17th, and 18th of September, until such time as the municipal council decided to fix prices, the women's club practically ruled the city. At Paris, the earliest women's club seems to have been Les Amis de la Vérité. Founded in 1791 by a Dutch woman living in Paris, Etta Palm Delters, it was an offshoot of the social circle Les Amis de la Vérité, which, as we have seen, met in the Palais Royal Circus, and where Madame Delders was one of the most frequent and popular speakers. She is said to have been the first woman of the revolution to address a public meeting. As in the cases of other revolution heroines, a veil of mystery hangs over much of the life of Etta Palm Delders. Was her father an innkeeper, as her enemies maintained, or a manufacturer of wallpaper, as others have asserted? Was her husband an obscure student, Lodoric Palm, or the Baron Delders? Mysterious and inconsistent throughout, Etta changed her name from time to time. 
About 1774, though married, she was calling herself by her mother's name, De Sitter. A few years later, she reverted to Palm, and added to it Von Delders. She would appear to have been born at Hronehen in 1743, and to have married at 19. Her husband seems to have disappeared after a few months, leaving Etta to console herself for his absence, first with the Dutch consul Jan Munich at Amsterdam, then with the Comte de Maillebois at Paris, and during the revolution with Bazille, a member of the Jacobin Club. When the revolution broke out, Etta was living in a charming little flat, an entresol, at 348 Rue Favard. In her salon was the portrait of an officer and an ottoman six feet long, upholstered in crimson and white damask. In her bedroom were four mirrors, one at the back of the bed. She is said to have been well-educated, intelligent, conversant with public affairs, and having powerful friends in diplomatic circles. Of the part she played in the social circle we shall have more to say later. It was in one of her public orations that she first proposed the foundation of Les Amis de la Vérité, or Société des Dames Patriotiques et Bienfaisantes, and her idea, though she never realized it, was to establish these societies throughout France and to place them under the supervision of the social circle. The patriotic and philanthropic ladies met every Saturday at the office of the newspaper La Bouche de Fer. The questions discussed were rather social than political, the granting of outdoor relief, women's education and their apprenticeship, homes for nurses and for young girls. Three young girls at least the society thus provided for. Two were apprenticed to dressmakers and one to a lace maker. Systematic efforts were made to increase the number of members. Each section of Paris was asked to send two representatives to the society. Madame Le Gros, the deliverer of L'Etude, joined, so did La Duchesse de Bourbon. But after a few months, for some reason or other, was it that the subscription of three francs a month was too high, or that the mainly philanthropic objects of the society were not sufficiently interesting? The members dwindled, and in the autumn of 1792 the society broke up. The other women's club at Paris, Les Femmes, or Les Citoyennes Républicaines Révolutionnaires, was founded in May 1793. During its short existence of but a few months it was extremely active and influential. On May the 10th, 1793, a band of women came to the secretary of the Paris Municipal Council and declared it to be their intention to found a club to which women only should be admitted. They explained that their object was to discuss how the designs of the enemies of the Republic could be thwarted. This club was to be called La Société Républicaine Révolutionnaire, and it was to meet in the library of the Jacobins in the Rue Saint-Honoré. The majority of these revolutionary women belonged to the extreme party known as Les Enragés. They out jacobined the Jacobins and in a few months we shall see their violence and disorderliness furnishing the convention with an excuse for the suppression of all women's clubs. The proximity of the revolutionary Republican women to the Jacobin Club and to the Jacobin Society of the Two Sexes soon became a nuisance. Three clubs under one roof was really too much. Moreover, the women were constantly leading deputations to the club and taking up the members' time with their interminable harangues. Consequently, after a few weeks, the women's club was removed from the library of the Rue Saint-Honoré to a much less aristocratic quarter, to the charnel house of the Church of Saint-Eustache in the market. It is an interesting coincidence that the revolution clubs, which in their influence on the people to a certain extent superseded the church, should so often have met under an ecclesiastical roof. We may notice also that when the Apostles of Liberty appropriated ecclesiastical premises, they assigned the church to the aristocrats of the clubs, to the Jacobins, for example, the crypt to the tradespeople of the popular fraternal societies, and the charnel house to the newest arrivals on the political scene, the women. The club's first president was Pauline Léon, a chocolate maker. She was succeeded by three women in turn, who are mere names to us, Rousson, Champion, and Le Cointre. Then came Claire Lacombe, whom we have met already and of whom we shall have more to say. Even before her presidency, she had been the moving spirit of this club. The president, whoever she was, wore the red Phrygian cap of liberty. Lacombe once said that the members numbered more than four thousand. That was a gross exaggeration. They were probably about one hundred and seventy. 
their main business seems to have been to lead deputations to other clubs and to the convention. These deputations demanded, among other measures, the establishment of a military force in every town, the raising of the Paris force to forty thousand men, the establishment of military workshops on every public square, the conversion of all the iron and steel in the country into weapons of war, the exclusion of ci devant nobles from all offices, and laws to prevent profiteers from starving the people. From the beginning, the meetings of the Republican revolutionaries were no more orderly than were the meetings of the men's clubs, or, for that matter, those of the convention. And it did not conduce to harmony in the charnel house at St. Eustache, when the ex-president Léon married Leclerc, who had had for his mistress the president de facto Lacombe. The women of the Jacobin Fraternal Society, which now met in the Jacobin Library, where the revolutionary Republican women had once held their meetings, were anxious to make it perfectly clear that they had nothing whatever to do with this women's club. Indeed, the society went so far as to request one of its members, La Citoyenne Baudroix, lessee of the Chinese bath, to insert a notice in the newspapers declaring that the society was quite distinct from the club now meeting in the St. Eustache Journal House. This notice suggests that the society, in its anxiety to hold aloof from the club, may have been responsible for the latter's removal. About this time, Terroigne de Méricourt, not far away in the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, was having trouble with another fraternal society, calling itself Défenseur des Droits de l'Homme et Ennemis du Despotisme. Terroigne had started a club for working-class women on La Place Royale, now La Place des Vosges. To induce women to join, she showed them the signature of Madame Santerre, wife of a well-known revolutionary leader, and the owner of a large brewery in the district who, said Tirwang, had promised to become a member. Then, to celebrate the inauguration of the club, which was to meet three times a week, Tirwang, in the names of Robespierre, Collot d'Herbois, and Santerre, invited the women to a civic banquet. Civic was the great word in those days. With extreme French progressives, it is still a favorite expression. But the men, defenders of the rights of man, apparently did not recognize those of women. At any rate, they considered that Terroigne was tempting their wives to neglect their duties, and they sent a deputation to the Jacobin Club to complain of her conduct, which they said had thrown the whole Faubourg into a tumult. They alleged, moreover, that Madame Santerre's signature that had been shown round was obviously a forgery, being in Terroigne's own handwriting. Robespierre, never one of Tirouin's friends, was eager to deny that he had any connection with the matter. Collot d'Herbois followed his example. Santerre was much more chivalrous. He excused Tirouin, saying she had never pretended that his wife's name was written by her own hand. He argued that if there had been a riot in the St. Antoine quarter, it was not Tirouin's fault, but originated with the women themselves, who had insisted on the girls from a certain convent of pity attending the club against the wishes of the mother superior. But he added that at the bottom of all the trouble was the men's fear lest their wives would be attending club meetings when they ought to be looking after their homes. Santerre proposed a resolution closing the incident. But though the resolution was carried, the incident was by no means closed. Tirwain could not forgive Robespierre and Collot d'Herbois. At a session of the club ten days later at which Tirwain was present, d'Herbois publicly congratulated himself and Robespierre on having forfeited Mademoiselle Tirwain's friendship. Thereupon, that lady, infuriated by the insult, jumped over the barrier separating the women's seats from the main body of the hall, and, pushing back those who tried to restrain her, made her way to the platform and demanded the right of speech. No one would listen to her, however, and she was forcibly ejected from the club. As the fever of the revolution heightened, scenes of this kind were constantly recurring. In the St. Eustache Charnel House, revolutionary Republican women were getting out of hand. Their meetings were becoming more and more tumultuous. Rushing forth from their grim clubhouse like veritable furies, they are said to have paraded the streets and to have insisted on every woman they met, donning the tricolor cockade, then the red cap, and finally, so the story goes, masculine trousers. Such tyranny could not be tolerated. Outside the club, women themselves opened a campaign against it, protesting to the Jacobin Club, to the Commune, and to the Assembly, against the infringement of their liberty to dress as they pleased. A deputation of women from the popular societies on the 28th of October, 1793, 
petitioned the convention to close the club of the Republican and Revolutionary women. By that time, as we shall see, the convention was only too glad of the excuse. For the feminism of the early revolution had been succeeded by a virulent anti-feminism. A commission of the Comité de Sûreté Générale was appointed to inquire into the whole question of women's clubs and societies, and as the result of the committee's report, which was presented on the 30th of October, 1793, they were suppressed. Thus in this, as in so many episodes of the women's movement, women had proved themselves their own worst enemies. Men's clubs and the popular fraternal societies went on for some time longer. Of the latter, women continued to be members. But more and more it came to be realized that these political groups were a danger to the central government. Accordingly, one of the last acts of the convention was, on the 23rd of July, 1795, to revert to Calonne's policy and to suppress them all. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 4. Women Writers, Madame Roland. Quote, she whose glory casts in shade France and her best and bravest. W. S. Lander. For centuries no period of French history has been without its women writers. The Middle Age had its Marie de France and Christine de Pizan. The Renaissance its Marguerite de Navarre. The seventeenth century its Madame de Sévigné. The eighteenth is Madame de Lambert and it's Madame d'Epinay. And so we come to the revolution when authoresses were more numerous and wrote more than ever before. The revolution established the title of women to rank among the great writers of their period. In truth, the most brilliant of all the revolution authors was a woman, Madame de Stahl, and next to her comes Madame Roland. A comparison between the two is inevitable. While in several branches of literature Madame de Stahl was unequalled in her day, in one particular branch, the memoir, Madame Roland was unsurpassed in her own time and almost in any period of French literature. In the actual making of the revolution during its three most critical years, 1790, 1791, and 1792, Madame Roland was more intimately involved than Madame de Stahl. Though the two women lived in the same city and worked in the same cause, there is no reason to believe that they ever met. Madame de Stahl, in her books on the Revolution, never even refers to Madame Roland. Madame Roland only once mentions Madame de Stahl, whose name she does not even know how to spell correctly. In a letter found among the papers of Brissot, the Girondist leader after his death, Madame Roland writes from Lyon on the 22nd of November, 1789, Stories are told here of Madame de Stahl, who is said to be very assiduous in her attendance at the assembly, where she is reported to have admirers among the speakers, and to send them notes to encourage and support them when they move patriotic resolutions. It is added that the Spanish ambassador at her father's table reproached her with doing this. You can't think the importance our aristocrats attach to such trifles, which very likely proceed from their own imagination but they want to represent the assembly as guided by a few wild enthusiasts and animated by some ten women. In influence, character, and temperament, Madame de Stahl and Madame Roland differed widely. Madame de Stahl's influence was mainly literary, Madame Roland's mainly political. They regarded the revolution from different angles, for each was essentially of her class. Madame de Stahl, a great lady, Madame Roland, a bourgeoise. With Madame de Stahl the heart came first, with Madame Roland the reason. Nevertheless, the emotional effervescent Madame de Stahl succeeded in producing one of the sanest judgments of the revolution, and this because she wrote it years after the events she was considering when the fever of the great upheaval had cooled down. Rational Madame Roland, on the other hand, when she came to her memoirs, thought with her heart, as she said, for they were penned in the white heat of the revolution in prison, while the knife of the guillotine hung suspended over her head, and over the heads of all those she loved most dearly, and to whom she had looked for her country's salvation. No wonder that even this reasonable woman, who had kept herself so well in hand through four years of party strife, now let herself go and wrote bitter pages. Les mémoires envenimées de la citoyenne ministre, Robespierre called them. One bond, however, there was between them. 
Madame de Stahl and Madame Roland drew their literary inspiration from the same source. They were both ardent disciples of Jean-Jacques. But the genius of Madame de Stahl molded part of the master's teaching to her own use. The rest she never fully realized. His love of nature, for example, was utterly foreign to the nature of the town-bred Salonnière, who, when gazing on the Bay of Naples, longed for the gutters of the Rue de Bac, and who said that she might have taken some interest in agriculture if only it had smelt less of manure. Madame Roland was also town-bred, but she followed her master implicitly, and she instinctively shared his passion for the country. Elle savait écouter la nature dans ses secrets solitudes, says Sainte-Beuve. But in following Rousseau along other paths, especially in an excess of candor, we may hope she was doing violence to her own nature. That Madame de Stahl could ever have followed her master in this direction is unthinkable. Marie-Jeanne Flippon, later Madame Roland, was born in 1754, the only living child of an unsuccessful Paris engraver. For dowry, her mother had little more than a heavenly soul and a charming countenance. Marie-Jeanne's parents, therefore, could endow their child with no great store of worldly goods. Nature was kind to her, however, lavishing upon her rich gifts of body and spirit. Though in the detailed portrait of herself at fourteen that Madame Roland paints in her memoirs, she does ample justice to her virtues, she underrates her physical attractiveness. True, it resided rather in the charm of her expression than in the regularity of her features, although, as she tells us, her mouth was large, her hazel eyes small but prominent, her nose too big at the tip, her forehead high and imposing, there were many who found her loveliness entrancing. One who knew her before 1789 wrote that, her eyes, figure and hair, of hazel color, were of remarkable beauty, and her delicate complexion was of a freshness and brilliance which united to her air of reserve and purity, made her appear singularly young. At a very early age, Manon began to develop that intellectual curiosity which was to render her the best educated woman of her time. Il fallait toujours que j'apprise quelque chose, she writes. Her father, though otherwise no ideal parent, knew the value of a good education and saw to it, despite his narrow means, that his daughter had excellent teachers. Her mother, a woman of culture, taste, and judgment, was admirably fitted to aid and direct Manon's studies. Manon was unable to remember a time when she could not read. At eight, she was carrying Plutarch's lives with her to church in lieu of a breviary. She had discovered the author whose influence was to dominate her life, as it did that of so many other leaders of the revolution. Her admiration for Plutarch's heroes, as well as other incidents and preferences described in her memoirs, show how early she developed tendencies which, growing more and more pronounced, were to determine her career and lead her to a martyr's heroic death. The injustice of social inequalities troubled her even in childhood. When paying an afternoon call with her grandmother on some lady of title, she wonders why ever the hostess should sit in an armchair and her visitor on a stool, tabouret. Manon was indeed a born Democrat. Her Republican sympathies were strengthened by her reading of eighteenth-century philosophers, and some years later by a visit to Versailles. Through the influence of a powerful friend, Madame and Mademoiselle Flippon were actually invited to stay in the palace. There they enjoyed the inexpressible privilege of occupying two insanitary odoriferous garrets, separated by only a slight partition from the apartments of no less a personage than the Archbishop of Paris. For most of the inhabitants of the palace, the great event of every day was watching the royal family feed. But Manon was never happy except in the gardens. She was born a Democrat, and this week's visit made her a rabid Republican. So when after a little of this royal splendor, her mother asked whether she was pleased with her visit, she replied, Yes, provided it soon comes to an end, but in a few days my loathing for these people will become uncontrollable. Her first great sorrow came to her at the age of nineteen when she lost her wise and excellent mother. This sad event closed what she has described as the happiest period of her life. By this time she found herself without any orthodox religion, although she had at one time been so ardent a Catholic that she had thought of becoming a nun. The years that now followed, she writes, made me acquainted with adversity. This was largely on account of her father's conduct. 
Deprived of his wife's counsel and influence, M. Flippon speculated rashly and indulged in other excesses which threatened to dissipate Manon's meagre competency inherited from her mother. As a protection against her father's extravagance, she was obliged to have recourse to that typical French institution, the family council, on whose advice, after she had attained her majority, at the age of twenty-five, she went as boarder to the convent where she had taken her first communion. By this time, according to the ideas of that day, Marie Flippon was drawing dangerously near old maidenhood. The position, however, was of her own choosing, for she had received numerous offers of marriage from suitors of all ranks and conditions in life, from a doctor to a diamond merchant, from an accommodation to a grocer. But none of them pleased her, none realized the high idea she had formed of a husband. One admirer, however, she favored. This was a grave and learned gentleman, twenty years her senior, Roland de la Platrière, who was government inspector of factories at Amiens. She had permitted him to ask her father's consent to their marriage. Monsieur Flippon had refused, and somewhat brutally. That was before her majority. At twenty-five Manon took the matter into her own hands, and when her elderly suitor next visited her at the convent grate, she promised to marry him. She never pretended to be in love, but looked to find her happiness, so she wrote to a girlfriend, in the inexpressible charm of contributing to his. Then followed eight tranquil years of daily duties punctually performed. She became a mother, the mother of a daughter, Eudora, who long survived her. She traveled in England and Switzerland. She and her husband were living at Lyon when the revolution broke out. They hailed it with delight. It seemed to them to promise the millennium. At the Feast of the Federation on the 30th of May, 1790, representatives of half the nation assembled at Lyon. Madame Roland was up betimes mingling with the crowds of holiday-makers on the quays, intoxicated by the sight of this new brotherhood of mankind, this wonderful birth of a new world. That evening she wrote for the patriotic newspaper, Le Courrier de Lyon, edited by her friends Lantenat and Champagneux, an anonymous account of the day's proceedings. Sixty thousand copies were sold. It was not her first literary effort. From her earliest childhood, writing had been one of her favorite recreations. Her ready pen in later years was to render service and perhaps disservice to the revolution. Roland, at that time government factory inspector at Lyon, had become a member of the municipal council, and in the following year he was appointed to go to Paris to represent the commercial difficulties of the city to the legislative assembly. Accompanied by his wife, he arrived in the capital on the 20th of February, 1791. The Rolands lodged in the Hôtel Britannique Rue Guénégaud. And now Madame Roland plunged into the intellectual joys of the metropolis. There is no place like it, she wrote. Nowhere are the sciences, arts, great men, intellectual resources of every kind so admirably united. The moment of her return to Paris was one of the most critical in the whole revolution. Much that it had set out to accomplish had been achieved. Class privileges had been abolished. Something like a constitutional monarchy had been established. The moderate party of Lafayette and la bourgeoisie were fairly contented, but among the lower orders a seething mass of discontent was beginning to make itself felt, and its spokesmen were new and young men, Robespierre, Brissot, Pétion, Buzot, Vernieu. They and others of like opinion soon formed the habit of meeting at the Rolands Hotel four times a week. One of Madame Roland's friends, and probably one of her guests at that time, may have been the eccentric Englishwoman Helen Maria Williams, then living in Paris, who was later to share Madame Roland's fate of imprisonment, although she escaped the final sacrifice. Most of those who frequented Madame Roland's first salon were members of the Jacobin Club, and all, except Robespierre, became prominent in the Girondist party. Madame Roland, as we have said, joined the fraternal society which was affiliated to the Jacobin Club. But she cannot have attended their meetings often. Neither, except during the first days after her arrival, did she go much to the constituent assembly, where the interminable debates leading to nothing, the insolence and ill-breeding of the left, the superciliousness of the right, irritated her. I lived chiefly at home as was my custom, she told her judges at her trial. I was not in good health, and I saw few people. Those few people, however, were the people who counted— and though on those four evenings a week when they assembled in her rooms she would sit apart, apparently absorbed in needlework or letter-writing, 
not a word of their discussions escaped her, and ere long her subtle influence made itself felt. She was far from being one of those who considered the revolution had gone far enough. She and her friends soon began to desire a republic, even if it involved civil war. In fact, she was not by any means averse to civil war. Towards the autumn of 1791, the Rolands returned to Lyon, but only for a short time. The 15th of December found them back again in Paris, lodging this time in gloomy apartments in the Rue Saint-Jacques. Roland's post of inspector having been abolished, he returned to claim the pension to which he was entitled after thirty-eight years of service. During the months that followed he attended assiduously the meetings of the Legislative Assembly and became one of the most strenuous members of the committee of the Jacobin Club. His stern and compromising virtue so won the respect of the legislators that when in March 1792 the King was advised to form a ministry of patriots, Roland was invited to take the portfolio of the interior. Madame Roland tells how the suggestion came to her as a complete surprise. Brissot dropped in one evening when she was alone and spoke of it. She took it as a joke. But Brissot insisted, and she promised to sound her husband on the subject. Three days later he accepted the office. Then we see the Quakerish Roland, in Puritan costume, round hat, and strings in his shoes, kissing hands at the Tuileries. Ah, sir, no shoe buckles! The horror-struck master of the ceremonies whispered to General Dumouriez. Ah, sir, all is lost, replied the general who tells the story. Roland now took his wife away from their dull lodgings in the Rue Saint-Jacques to the sumptuous gilded saloons and the Venetian mirrors of the Ministry of the Interior. Here, once a week, during her husband's first term of office, twice during his second, Madame Roland gave a dinner party to men only. The extravagance of these entertainments was one of the many charges brought against her during her trial. In her memoirs, she insists on the simplicity, even the austerity of these repasts, served with taste and care, it is true, but without profusion and consisting of one course only. The guests numbered usually fifteen, sometimes eighteen, and once twenty. These gatherings, like the revolution itself, had an international character. An achercis cloutes. Tom Paine, and David Williams sat at the ministerial board. On other days of the week, the Rolands spent the evening tête-à-tête, -tête, busily occupied with public affairs, postponing the hour of their simple meal until it became so late that their daughter could not join them, having supped upstairs in her own room with her governess. From a psychological point of view, Madame Rolland's description of her life at this time is one of the most interesting chapters of her autobiography for here we find her with unconscious inconsistency attempting in one sentence to prove that she had nothing whatever to do with public affairs, and in the next showing how deep and how potent was the influence she exercised over them. In one of these notable passages Madame Roland wrote, I love study as much as I hate cards and am bored by the society of fools. Accustomed to stay at home, I shared Roland's work and cultivated my personal tastes. I continued this simple life at the ministry. I never kept a salon. I gave a dinner twice a week to ministers and deputies whom my husband needed to see and to talk to about his work. They discussed state affairs in my presence because they knew I would not interfere and that my associates might be trusted. Out of all the rooms of the vast apartment, I had chosen for my own daily habitation the smallest of all, a little cabinet in which I had my books and my bureau. It often happened that friends and colleagues who wanted a confidential talk with the minister instead of going straight to him in his room where he would be surrounded by his clerk and others, would come to me and ask me to call him into my cabinet. Thus, without either intrigue or vain curiosity, I found myself in the heart of things. Roland delighted afterwards to discuss these matters with me in private, and with that confidence which ever reigned between us and caused us to hold all our knowledge and all our views in common. Thus it came about that friends who had any information to communicate or opinion to express certain of always finding me, would come and ask me to pass it on to the minister at the first opportunity. No wonder that Louvet, the author of Faublas, once said to Roland, Thy wife is a greater man than thyself. She was indeed the soul of that Girondist party, which had been cradled in her boudoir in the Hotel Britannique. Why do they not take a man for their leader? cried Danton, the most deadly among Madame Roland's many enemies. In the spring of 1792, the Girondists, who were now at the height of their power, were very sanguine. 
Madame Roland says she did not share the illusions of her husband and his colleagues. They were delighted with the frame of mind in which they found the king. They flattered themselves that the revolution was over and a better order of things assured. Every time I see you set out for the council in that mood, said Madame Roland to her husband, I feel convinced that you are about to commit some folly. And even for these buoyant ministers disillusionment did not tarry. It soon became obvious that the king was incapable of real seriousness. The most important and urgent decisions were postponed, while priceless time was frittered away in meaningless discussions. When the question was war, the king would discourse at length on travel. When negotiations, he would discuss the customs of various lands. "'The royal council is little better than a café,' exclaimed Madame Roland. "'It would be better for you,' she told her husband, "'to spend three hours in solitary meditation on weighty affairs than to waste your time in such futilities.' Roland soon began to share his wife's opinion, and when the king at length made up his mind to refuse his sanction to two decrees, one condemning to banishment all priests who refused to take the oath to the Constitution, and the other establishing a camp of twenty thousand men near Paris, the Minister of Interior felt himself useless. A letter was composed chiefly, it is thought, by Madame Roland and sent to the king. This epistle, though the writer was proud of it, appears today a sorry document, long-winded, tactless, and worse, impertinent and foolish. Of course, it produced the desired effect. Roland and his Girondist colleagues were dismissed. On the 12th of June, 1792, Madame Roland exchanged her gorgeous apartments in the Ministry of the Interior for a flat on an upper floor of the old house in the Rue Saint-Jacques. But here she was hardly less influential than at the Ministry. Here she continued to gather around her a steadily increasing circle of friends, most of them young men, whose adoration of her was a part of their politics. Then, on the momentous 10th of August, Roland, with his Girondist colleagues, was recalled to the ministry. The five months of Roland's second ministry were fraught with disaster for his country, his king, his party, and his own reputation. Madame Roland admitted that throughout she was her husband's counselor. She advised him badly. But who would have done better? For there was never a more perplexing situation. The opposition between la Gironde and la Montagne or the Jacobins was coming to a head. Yet both parties were represented in the ministry. Roland had therefore to contend against enemies within the cabinet. These enemies actually presumed to bring an accusation against Madame Roland. She was charged with having treacherous dealings with England. Madame Roland appeared before the bar of the convention came, writes Carlyle, in her high clearness, her beautiful voice trembled amidst the favorable and the attentive silence of the assembly, this voice of a lovely woman heard for the first time at the convention's bar. It convicted her accuser of impudence. It dissipated him into despicability and air. The friends of order applauded. Robespierre himself despised the ridiculous conspiracy against her. He smiled for the last time at his former friend's beauty and innocence. While Madame Roland triumphed, her husband, alas, had been steadily losing ground in public opinion and in that of his colleagues. Barely a fortnight after his accession to office on the 23rd of August, when the rapidly advancing Prussians took Longwy, Roland had urged the government's retirement to Blois, and had given Danton the opportunity of successfully opposing that unpopular suggestion. A week later began the massacre of prisoners. The Minister of the Interior either could not or would not stay their hideous progress. Fabre de Glantine said in the Jacobin Club on the first day of the massacre, September the 2nd, that he had seen Roland in the garden of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, beating his head against a tree, while he cried out that the government must fly to Tours or to Blois. Later he publicly announced that at the beginning he had not completely disapproved, that he merely blamed the continuance of the massacres. When the convention met on the 21st of September, the opposition between La Montagne and La Gironde had intensified. During a debate on the condition of the country, an accusation was made against Robespierre, of which Roland had 15,000 copies printed, at the government's expense, for circulation in the provinces. Then, in November, came the affair of the Iron Safe. A locksmith revealed to Roland its existence behind a secret panel in the Tuileries. 
and the minister, instead of at once putting all the documents it contained under seal, until they could be examined on the spot by a commission of the assembly, had them placed in a portfolio and brought to the ministry. This unwise action laid him open to the charge of having destroyed certain papers which might have incriminated his party. About this time, Roland and the Girondists were further weakened by the discussions which began as to the king's fate. The minister of the interior and the Girondists strongly advocated the taking of a plebiscite. Roland, probably under his wife's dictation, appealed to the nation in its favor in a pamphlet entitled, Can it be contested that the sovereign people has the right to pardon Louis Capet? And how can it exercise that right if it not be consulted? The king's condemnation on the 18th of January, 1793, and his execution three days later, determined the fall of la Gironde. On the following day, Roland sent in his resignation. Four months later, on the 31st of May, a warrant was issued for his arrest. While, having been mourned by a friend, he fled to a place of safety, his wife, remembering her recent triumph at the bar of the convention, demanded to be heard in his defense. Instead, on that very night, by order of the commune, she herself was arrested on no specific charge and lodged in the Abbaye prison. As the doors of her prison closed on this brave woman, writes Lamartine, all the virtues, the faults, the hopes, the repentance and the heroism of her party seemed to enter the dungeon with her. On the 24th of June she was released from the Abbaye. But barely had she entered her house when she was rearrested and sent to St. Pelagie, the prison for prostitutes. For five months she was kept in prison without any definite accusation being brought against her. Then her fate became strangely linked with that of another great heroine of the Revolution, Charlotte Corday. On her arrival in Paris, Marat's assassin had, as we shall see, gone with a letter of introduction to the Girondist deputy Duperret. Duperret's association with the slayer of the People's Friend had led to his arrest. And, during his trial there, had been found among his papers letters from Madame Roland, sympathizing with the Girondist deputies who, after the movement in Paris against them, had taken refuge at Caen. This was enough to involve Madame Roland in the accusations then being brought against her former friends, Brissot, Vergniaud, and others. She was summoned to appear as a witness at their trial. The long silence to which she had been condemned in prison had irked her even more than her confinement. She remembered her triumph at the bar of the convention in the previous winter, and now she welcomed with delight the opportunity of using her eloquence on her friend's behalf. I had resolved to thunder without reserve, she wrote to her friend Busk, and then to make an end. So she had written to Busk asking him to send her poison. This she had intended to take as soon as her speech was over. But she was denied both the poison and the opportunity of thundering. Busk refused her the means of self-destruction, the court the occasion for a display of her eloquence. Though summoned to the trial, she was not called as a witness. All she could do was write a protest against the trial. Observation rapide sur l'acte d'accusation contre les députés par Amar. This and her memoirs, three hundred pages written in twenty-two days, and a correspondence with her friends occupied the wearisome days of her captivity. She was also rereading Tacitus, who was now her favorite author. She had to write almost under the eyes of her jailers, with the warders always at her heels when she received her rare visitors. Nevertheless, throughout her correspondence and to all who were permitted to visit her, she appeared amazingly self-possessed and even cheerful, ever deeply solicitous for her friends. For myself I have nothing to lose, she wrote, but I am so apprehensive for all who approach me that yesterday, at the Palais, Palace of Justice, I hesitated to return the salute of a man I knew, and for whom I feared the imprudence of recognizing me in public. When at last, on the 1st of November, she was brought to trial, her heroism persisted to the end. Throughout the two days of interrogation, followed by the passing of the death sentence, throughout all the terrible preparations for death on the scaffold, she remained perfectly calm. Do not come into court tomorrow, she said to her counsel, Chauvenou Lagarde, on the eve of her execution. You would ruin yourself without saving me. With complete self-possession as she passed by her fellow prisoners to her cell, she smilingly drew her hand over the back of her neck, making the agreed sign that the death sentence had been passed. 
on the tumbrel as she journeyed for the last time through the streets of her beloved Paris, from the conciergerie prison to the Place de la Révolution, amidst the howls of the mob, she maintained perfect serenity. Her one concern seemed to be to cheer her companion, an assignat printer who was seized with panic. Finally, arrived at the guillotine, fearing lest the horror of seeing her suffer would be too much for him, she asked the executioner to permit him to be the first to die. Do not refuse a woman's last entreaty, she implored when he hesitated. And her prayer was granted. Thus, in the deepening twilight of a November afternoon, the ninth of the month, this beautiful, courageous woman died. Whether turning towards the colossal statue of liberty on the square, she uttered the words tradition has attributed to her, whether she sighed, O oh, liberty, what crimes have been committed in thy name? Or, according to another version, O oh, liberty, how they have tricked thee, matters not. For whether or no she expressed them, these sentiments had been hers through all the bitter days of disappointment and disillusion. A male mind, a stoical heart, some have called her. And so at times she appeared in those admirable memoirs, which seem often to have been written rather by the sword of a Cato than by the pen of a woman. But there was another side to her nature. In prison, Putting away her pen, alone save for the presence of one female attendant, she would lean on the window-sill and weep for three hours at a time. Despite that grandly courageous demeanor, there were tears in her eyes as she turned away from the judgment-hall, where her doom had been pronounced. And all the greater was her courage because of the tenderness and fears of which her heart was capable. Femme très femme, St. Beuve calls her. Separate Madame Roland from the Revolution and she appears quite different wrote the Comte de Bugnot of Madame Roland in prison. No one could better define the duties of a wife and mother. When she spoke of her daughter and her husband, her eyes filled with tears. The party woman had disappeared. Lamartine's opinion of her is that, happy and beloved, she would have been but a woman. Unhappy and lonely, she became the leader of a party. But beloved. Surely few women have been more beloved. Her husband in his austere way adored her. When the news of her execution reached him in his place of refuge, he went out, and by the wayside, took a dart which he had concealed in his cane, and, resting the hilt upon the trunk of an apple tree, leant upon it so that it pierced his heart. For the leaders of the Girondist party, their adoration of Madame Roland was a religion. The poor fallen women who were her fellow prisoners at La Pilagie worshipped her. Immediately she appeared in the courtyard, all brawls and disputes were silenced. The squalid crowd pressed around her as if she were a tutelary goddess. But Lamartine used that word beloved, in a special sense, to indicate the craving of a passionate woman's heart for something more than the stern affection of a pedantic husband, more than the filial devotion of a daughter, or the esteem of political partisans, or the ardent admiration of many intimate friends, or the loving gratitude of those whom she comforted in prison. Lamartine, when he employed that word beloved, may have had in mind allusions in Madame Roland's memoirs, which long aroused the curiosity of her readers. Here is one of them. I honor, I cherish my husband, as an affectionate daughter adores a virtuous father, to whom she will sacrifice even her lover, but I have found the man who might be that lover, and while I remained true to my duty, I was not clever enough to hide the sentiment, which I never allowed to prevail over my sense of duty. My husband, extremely sensitive, wounded in his affection and his self-respect, could not endure the idea of the slightest derogation from his sway. His mind grew somber. His jealousy irritated me. Happiness fled from us. He adored me. I sacrificed myself to him, and we were unhappy. Earlier she had written of a tempest of passion from which an athlete's vigor barely succeeded in delivering her mature years. Who was the man who might have been her lover? Who had aroused that tempest of forbidden passion? This beautiful woman had always around her a band of devoted admirers. Être dévoué et doux, Sainte Beuve calls them, telles que les femmes honnêtes pourraient en garder près d'elles sans inconvénient pendant une éternité. Was the man who might be loved one of these? Was it Bosque, always devoted? Was it Lantenat, the friend of the family? Was it Barbarou, the Antinous of Marseille? Michelet thought it was Bancal des Isards. 
St. Beuve believed that a sacred veil would forever hide the object of the passion which, more and more tumultuously as death approached, surged through that noble soul. But Michelet and St. Beuve were alike mistaken, and St. Beuve was to live to see the rending of that sacred veil. Twenty-nine years after he had written those words, a Paris bookseller, the father of Anatole France, announced for sale by auction, among other revolution documents, a packet of Madame Roland's letters. Straightway two gentlemen, a Monsieur Dauban and a Monsieur Faugère, each separately engaged on a new edition of Madame Roland's Memoirs, took their way to the shop of Père France on the Quai Voltaire, each intending to purchase the letters before the sale took place. The first visitor, M. Faugère, did not succeed in making the desired bargain. It was M. Dauban who acquired the precious manuscripts. These letters contained the key to the mystery. By a curious irony of fate, however, their happy possessor, whose siege was done, apparently neglected to make full use of them. It was left for his rival Faugère, when the manuscripts of the letters were deposited in the National Library, to complete his edition, to re-read the original in the light of the letters, and to restore the passages in the memoirs which earlier editors had omitted. One of these passages, which had most perplexed earlier editors, was the following. Le malheureux ne supportera pas longtemps un tel coup. Madame Roland referred to her death. In the blank space was an initial, indistinctly written. It might be an R, but it more closely resembled a B. Busk, the first editor, had suppressed the passage. Dauban reproduced it with the initial R, which he took to indicate Roland. Faugère insisted that the enigmatical letter was a B, and why? Because of information contained in these letters. For here, in these pages, clasped the hands of two hitherto unrecognized lovers. These letters, over which Dauban and Faugère had quarrelled, solved the mystery. They were passionate love letters written by Madame Roland to Buzot, a member of the Convention and a Girondist leader. To Buzot she referred when she wrote of the man who might have been her lover. The suppression of that passage by Busk, who published the memoir for the benefit of the writer's daughter, if the enigmatical initial referred to Buzot, was perfectly comprehensible. Had it indicated Roland, its omission would have been inexcusable. In these letters, written in prison, with death on the scaffold awaiting her, she tells Buzot that she welcomes her captivity because, suffering instead of Roland, it enables her in some measure to atone for her heart's infidelity to her excellent husband. Also, do you not see, she adds, that, being alone, I remain with you? Do not pity me. Others admire my courage, but they know nothing of my joys. When his letters came to her in prison, How many times I reread them, she exclaimed. I press them to my heart. I cover them with kisses. I had lost hope of receiving any letters from you. Until I heard of your escape, I suffered the cruelest anguish. It was intensified by the news of your accusation. Your courage merited such an atrocity. As soon as I knew you were in Calvados, my anxiety was allayed. Now, in the full light of this new discovery, could be read that eloquent passage in the Mémoire, mes dernières pensées, addressed to Bizot, Toi, que je n'ose nommer. Thou who shall be better known on the day when our common misfortune shall be recognized. Thou, whom the most terrible of the passions hindered not from respecting the barriers of virtue. Wilt thou grieve when thou seest me precede thee to a place where we may love one another in innocence, where there shall be nothing to prevent our union? Buzot, included in the general accusation brought by the Jacobin government against the Girondist leaders, had fled first to his native province Normandy, then to la Gironde. There, some few weeks after Madame Roland's execution, in company with his comrade Pétion, he died by his own hand. Femme, très femme, as we have said, has been the usual verdict passed upon Madame Roland. Yet there was one who, manlike, no doubt thinking to praise her, described her as une femme qui était un grand homme. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5, Part 1 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 5, Part 1 the story of the revolution told by its women writers. Quote, La Révolution de France est une des grandes époques de l'ordre social. 
ceux qui la considèrent comme un événement accidentel n'ont porté leur regard ni dans le passé, ni dans l'avenir. Madame de Stahl One of the many services women writers rendered to the revolution was the record they kept and the account they have given of its history. In this respect, as we have seen, Madame de Stahl and Madame Roland stand first. After them we must place Madame de Genlis and Madame Julien, then come Louise Fusy and Charlotte Robespierre. Madame de Stahl's story of the revolution is remarkable for its critical talent and intellectual breadth. It shows, says Professor Burry, a more dispassionate appreciation of the movement than any of her contemporaries were capable of forming. Madame Roland's story, written in prison, with the guillotine suspended over her head and all her political hopes disappointed, is inevitably partial and frequently acrimonious. She wrote with a twofold object, one literary, to follow the example of her master Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and to present a sincere and intimate picture of her own mind and heart from her earliest years, the other political, to give such a description of the Girondist party which she had founded and inspired, as should justify that party's policy. Madame de Genlis was the most prolific woman writer of the Revolution. On n'a jamais été plus décidément écriveuse que Madame de Genlis, wrote Saint Beuve. Had the inkstand not already been invented, she would have invented it. She was indeed the author of at least one hundred and thirty published works. Her object in telling the story of the Revolution was to justify her own conduct and to clear herself from the charge of having been involved in an Orleanist plot to overthrow the monarchy and place her friend and employer, the Duc d'Orléans, on the throne. Madame Julien's diary and letters are some of the most reliable of Revolution documents, for they were written without any idea of publication. Louise Fusy was a gay little butterfly of an actress, who, with the novelist's charm, wrote what she remembered about the strange sights and scenes of the stormy days through which she had lived. Charlotte Robespierre, who was without any literary gift, wrote at the request of an admirer of her brother's, La Ponoreille, who was editing his works. It will be seen that the reliance we place on the judgments and historical accuracy of these writers must be qualified by a consideration of the strong political bias under which all of them, except perhaps Louise Fusy, wrote. Indeed, as we try to piece together a more or less chronological outline of the main events of the Revolution, from the various stories told by these women writers, we shall find that none of them, not even Madame de Stahl, can be trusted to give a completely accurate account. Who can? However, by comparing one record with another and by allowing for the temperament, the point of view and the political bias of each author, by taking into consideration the object of the work and the period when it was composed, we may derive from these feminine pages some knowledge of the main currents of the revolution and of its principal actors. Though all of them were more or less on the side of the revolution, they belonged to various sections of the revolutionary party, and some of them changed their opinions as the revolution went on. This was not the case with Madame de Stahl and Madame Roland. Their opinions never wavered. The former remained always a constitutional monarchist, the latter always a republican, though perhaps somewhat of an opportunist. The first of the revolution parliaments, the Constituent Assembly, came nearest to realizing Madame de Stahl's political ideal. The second, the Legislative Assembly, the ideal of Madame Roland. With the policy of the convention they were alike in disagreement. As to Madame de Genlis, she was above all things Jean Lissarde, and it is doubtful whether she had any well-grounded political principles. But she professed to love the revolution with sincerity, especially during its first eighteen months. She thought, so she says, that the new constitution, however imperfect, could not fail to be an inestimable benefit, seeing that it destroyed despotism and other horrible abuses. Madame Julien, embracing the revolution with all her mind and heart, evolved with it from constitutional monarchism to moderate republicanism, and then to extreme Jacobinism. But she remained throughout a recording spectator, and one whose critical sense never entirely deserted her. Louise Fusy, while moving in revolution circles, frankly avowed that she had no political principles. He who said that women always adopt the opinions of the men they love made a curious mistake, she wrote. For her own part, she took care not to espouse the opinions either of her royalist father or of her republican husband, both of whom found themselves on the steps of the guillotine from which they were delivered by Robespierre's death. 
Charlotte de Robespierre, though less frank than Louise Fusy, was not less devoid of political principles. It was merely the force of circumstances that drew her into the revolution whirlpool. These six women wrote at different periods of their own lives. Only two of them, Madame Julien and Madame Roland, wrote during the revolution. Charlotte de Robespierre, Louise Fusy, and Madame de Genlis all wrote in old age and long after the events they recorded. Madame de Stahl did not live to be old, but she too wrote her most important work on the revolution, Consideration sur les principaux événements de la Révolution française, years after the revolution frenzy had spent itself. This book is her last work, left incomplete and published in 1818, the year after her death. Widely different were the objects with which these women wrote. Louise Fusy took up her pen merely to amuse herself and her friends and to make money. Charlotte Robespierre, for the same reason, probably, and also to glorify her brother Maximilien and to clear herself from the charge of having betrayed him. Madame de Genlis to give herself the beau rôle and to refute accusations made against her, notably those of being involved in an Orleanist conspiracy against the crown and of having plotted with Dumouriez to overthrow the government of the revolution. Madame Julien to keep her husband informed of what was happening and to build up her son in the doctrine and principles of the revolution. Madame de Stahl to vindicate the memory of her father, Necker, and to demonstrate that a constitutional monarchy is the form of government best suited to the French nation. Madame Roland to justify the political conduct of herself, her husband, and of the Girondist party to which they belonged. Neither of these eyewitnesses was in Paris throughout the whole of the revolution. Charlotte Robespierre only arrived in Paris from Arras in the autumn of 1792. Louise Fusy frequently went on tour in the provinces, and, towards the end, emigrated to England. Madame de Genlis went to England in 1791, returned to Paris for two days in November, 1792, then hovered for weeks on the frontier before starting on migrations through Germany, Switzerland, and Denmark, from which she did not return until 1800. Madame Julien's first letter from Paris during the Revolution period is dated the 6th of September, 1789, her last May, 1793. Madame Roland was in Paris from February till September in 1791. She returned in the December of that year to stay until her death on the 8th of November, 1793. Except for short intervals, Madame de Stahl was in Paris from the beginning of 1789 until her escape during the prison massacres in September, 1792. Charlotte Robespierre, as long as she lived with her brothers, watched the revolution from the innermost keep of the Jacobin fortress. Louise Fusy, from the green room of the Comédie Française, Madame de Genlis, from the Palais Royal, Madame Julien, from the galleries of the Assembly and the Jacobin Club, Madame Roland, from the heart of Girondisme, from the Ministry of the Interior, and, finally, from the prisons of the Abbaye, Sainte-Pélagie, and the Conciergerie. Madame de Stahl, from the study of her father, the Controller General of Finance, and from her salon, which she is said to have converted into an antechamber of the Constituent Assembly. It is to Madame de Stahl that we go for the best account of the opening months of the Revolution. No one has described more vividly the meeting of the States General on May 5, 1789, the first meeting after an interval of 175 years. The day before, from a window at Versailles, she watched the twelve hundred deputies of France going in procession to church to hear Mass. It was an impossible spectacle, she writes, and a novel one for French people. All the inhabitants of Versailles and many from Paris had assembled to see it. This new element in the state, the nature and power of which was as yet unknown, filled with wonder those who had not previously reflected on the rights of nations. When the black-coated, black-cloaked deputies, the lawyers, merchants, and men of letters of the Third Estate came by, the democratic heart of Necker's daughter thrilled to see their confident glances, their imposing numbers, and to notice among them nobles who, inspired with eighteenth-century doctrines of equality, had forsaken their own class to mingle with the people. One of these revolutionary aristocrats stood out from all the rest. It was impossible to help looking at him, at his immense head of hair, like Samson, his strength seemed to depend on it. At his countenance, which its very ugliness rendered expressive, while his entire personality suggested power, ill-regulated but such as might be wielded by a tribune of the people. 
this striking figure was none other than the comte de mirabeau the dominant figure of the first mile phase of the revolution on the following day even greater things were to happen the states general assembled in a building hastily constructed in the avenue de versailles madame de stal was one of the many spectators admitted to the opening ceremony on a raised platform had been placed the throne the queen's chair and seats for the royal family in front of this kind of stage sat the chancellor barentin the three orders were so to speak in the pit the clergy and nobility on the right and left the deputies of the third estate in the centre they had declared beforehand that they would not follow the ancient custom observed at the last meeting of the estates one hundred and seventy-five years before of kneeling when the king arrived if the deputies of the third estate observed madame de stal had knelt in seventeen eighty nine every one including the purest aristocrats would have considered the action ridiculous that is to say contrary to the ideas of the time when mirabeau appeared a murmur was heard throughout the assembly m necker as soon as he entered was overwhelmed with applause his popularity was then at its height and the king might have made good use of him while continuing faithful to the system the main basis of which he had adopted when the king took his seat on the throne for the first time i began to be afraid writes necker's daughter for i noticed that the queen was greatly moved she arrived late and her complexion showed signs of emotion the king delivered his speech with his usual simplicity but the countenances of the deputies expressed more energy than the monarchs and such a contrast was disquieting at a time when nothing being as yet established strength was necessary on both sides the three speeches of that day the king's the chancellor's and necker's all dealt with the financial crisis which alone had driven the government to summon the states-general for the first time after so long a period necker's speech writes his daughter pleased no one neither the conservative nor the progressive party the former considered necker to have proved that the summoning of the states-general was unnecessary by showing that owing to his wise administration the financial crisis was past the progressives on the other hand having resolved to reform the constitution were alarmed to find necker ignoring this part of their task and confining himself to finance they accused him of treating this great national parliament as if it had been a mere provincial assembly necker was indeed one of those moderate men who are doomed to failure in times of revolution whilst for most people the revolution would seem to have broken out on may the fifth the day of the assembling of the states-general or on july the fourteenth the day of the bastille's fall for that egotistical governess madame de genlis july the ninth seems the all-important historical day because it happened to be the eve of her own birthday the festival was being celebrated by a pantomime in the very midst of which the news of risings in paris was announced the orleans governess and her pupils were then at st leu some miles out of the capital one of the actors in the pantomime giroux a painter was playing the part of polyphemus eager to see what was happening in the capital no sooner had he finished his part than he rushed into a cabriolet and drove in full haste to paris without even staying to change his clothes his costume and his eye painted in the middle of his forehead caused so much amazement that he was arrested at the city gate and taken to the guard-house where he was detained for over two hours being minutely interrogated as to the reasons for such an astounding disguise he was only allowed to go free by invoking the then popular name of his patron the duke of orleans for madame de stal and for many others all the events leading up to the storming and destruction of the bastille centred round her father having failed to persuade the king to renounce his project of concentrating great masses of troops round paris necker resigned on june the twenty third so great was his popularity writes his daughter that the news of his resignation brought all paris out into the streets and it was doubtless this public manifestation that caused both the king and queen personally to implore necker to save the state by withdrawing his resignation this necker did but as the king persisted in his design and as necker also persisted in his opposition the minister found that his advice was being ignored though he continued to wait on the king daily louis was now entirely in the hands of his reactionary counsellors for necker the whig of the french revolution the position was impossible he told his daughter that every day he expected to be arrested on the morrow the blow fell on the eleventh of july when the comptroller general received a letter from the king commanding him to leave france immediately 
He showed the king's letter to no one but his wife. It arrived at three o'clock in the afternoon when Madame Necker was holding her salon. Immediately after her guests had departed, without staying to make any preparation for the journey, she set out for the frontier with her husband. The king had wanted to get Necker away before the people who adored him knew of his disgrace and had time to make a demonstration on his behalf. The precaution was useless, for the news of Necker's dismissal and banishment when it was bruited abroad produced the first great manifestation of the revolution. On July the 14th, 100,000 citizens, as a protest against this treatment of their favorite minister, captured and destroyed the royal fortress of the Bastille. Meanwhile, Madame de Genlis at Saint-Leu was in close touch with Paris. Every day a courier brought out news from the capital. On the 14th, the tidings were such that Madame de Genlis felt she could no longer remain in the country. She and the Duke's children came into Paris, where they found the attack on the Bastille well on the way. From the garden terrace of her friend Beaumarchais, Madame de Genlis, surrounded by her pupils, watched men, women, and children working with unprecedented ardor at the demolition of the fortress. Those avenging hands, annihilating so swiftly the work of many centuries, seemed to her to be the hands of Providence. And she shared the joy of the destroyers at the fall of a fortress, on which, so she said, she had never been able to look without a shudder remembering the arbitrary imprisonments within its walls. To celebrate this memorable occasion, Madame de Genlis had an elaborate ornament made, which she used to wear at her breast. It consisted of a polished stone from the Bastille set in a branch of laurel composed of emeralds, and inscribed in the middle with the word Liberté outlined in diamonds. Above also in diamonds was the planet that shone most brightly on the famous day, and beneath, in the same precious stone, the moon as she appeared on that night. Surmounting the whole was a tricolor cockade in jewels. The first result of the destruction of the Bastille was Necker's recall. He was on his way from Brussels to Coppet, his country seat in Switzerland, when at Baal, on July the 20th, he received a command from the king and an invitation from the National Assembly to return to France and to resume his office. Once again he obeyed. His return journey was a triumphal progress, wrote Madame de Stahl, who by this time had joined her parents and was accompanying them back to France. The transports of a whole nation welcomed him. Country women fell on their knees as he passed. Townsmen unharnessed his horses and dragged his carriage themselves. When he reached the capital, all Paris was in the streets at the windows or on the roofs, crying, Vive Monsieur Necker! The next day the hero, for whom the Bastille had fallen, went down to the Hôtel de Ville. As amidst thunders of applause he addressed the assembled multitude, his daughter, so she tells us, lost consciousness in the ecstasy of her joy. In no period of French history have there been so many public festivals and processions as during the Revolution. One of the earliest was the first festival of the Federation, as it was called, held on the Champ de Mars on the 14th of July, 1790, to celebrate the anniversary of the fall of the Bastille. Many prints of the time portray the picturesque preparations for the fête. And in a manner no less picturesque, the graphic Louise Fusy describes them in her Recollections. The help of all Parisians, men, women, and children, were requisitioned to construct the huge mounds of earth which were to enclose, as in an emerald setting, the vast field of Mars. Everyone went to work. Bands of volunteers were organized. The theaters were to the fore. Every cavalier chose his lady, to whom he presented a light spade adorned with ribbons and bunches of flowers. Then, with the band leading us, says Louise, we set out joyously. The costume was designed which would not show the dust, an overall of grey muslin with dainty slippers and stockings of the same color, a tricolor scarf and a big straw hat. Cousin Jacques was my cavalier. He even composed a poem to celebrate the occasion. We dug, we wheeled the earth about, we ourselves were wheeled, and we had such fun that we hindered the work instead of helping it. Soon our assistance was dispensed with. And we were very sorry, for it had been very amusing. Madame de Stahl regarded the same festival from a much more serious point of view. Looking back on it after the lapse of more than twenty years, it appeared to her as the last expression of a truly national enthusiasm, when royalty and liberty were united, when France was about to possess the constitution most fitted for her, a limited monarchy like that of England. 
During the preparations, Madame de Stahl rejoiced to see women of the highest rank mingling with the crowd of voluntary workers, and the eighty-three newly constituted departments sending their delegates and national guards to swear to the new constitution. True, it was not yet complete, but its principles were universally approved of. The constitution and its principles do not concern Louise Fusy. She, as an actress, is interested in the way in which these provincial delegates amuse themselves. She tells how Mirabeau took the delegates from Marseille to the Palais Royal Theatre. There, a play called Bayard was being acted, and acted too realistically for these fiery southerners, for when a band of assassins set upon the knight without reproach, who was being carried on his litter, the Marseillais, horrified to see the incapacitated hero so completely outnumbered, rushed upon the stage and were about to make short work with the assassins, when Bayard assured them that he ran no real danger. By the appointed day, July the 14th, though the help of Louise Fusy and her colleagues had been dispensed with, the preparations for the festival were complete. In front of the military school, wrote Madame de Stahl, were steps leading to a tent for the king, the queen, and the whole court. They occupied the amphitheater. Opposite them was an altar on which Talleyrand, bishop of Autun, was to celebrate mass, while all around from eighty-three lances planted in the earth, waved the banners of the eighty-three newly constituted departments. When Monsieur de Lafayette approached the altar and swore allegiance to the nation, the law, and the king, the oath and the man who swore it filled the people with confidence. But there was another in whom the people at that time were beginning to place even greater confidence than in Lafayette. That other was Mirabeau. Although Madame de Stahl regards him as her father's rival, and the leader of the opposition which had led to Necker's final resignation, even she is compelled to admit that had he been more conscientious and less self-seeking, he might have created a strong party independent of the court on the one hand, and the mob on the other. There were indeed many who in those early days looked to Mirabeau to save the state. His death, after a few days' illness on April the 2nd, 1791, inflicted a heavy blow on the cause of the revolution and was mourned throughout the whole kingdom. Louise Fusy, travelling to Lille, was continually stopped on the road and asked whether it was true that Mirabeau was dead. No sooner was his illness known than the street in which he lived was full of an anxious crowd waiting for the bulletins. The news was passed eagerly from one to another, and finally, on the announcement of his death, a long cry was heard accompanied with sobs and groans. The day of his funeral was one of universal mourning. All shops were closed, and anyone who appeared without some sign of grief was howled at by the crowd. In those days of suspicion and excitement, the suddenness of his malady inevitably gave rise to a rumor, never substantiated, that he had been poisoned by some actresses with whom he was supping when he was taken ill. With Mirabeau died the last hope of French monarchy. To the king and the nobles it seemed that nothing remained but flight. In June, Louis and his family got away as far as Varennes, where they were overtaken and brought back to Paris. Meanwhile there was an exodus of aristocrats, and an army of these émigrés under the king's brother, le comte d'Artois, was assembling at Coblence and soliciting the support of European sovereigns to keep Louis on his throne by foreign bayonets. Ever since the first meeting of the States-General, Madame de Genlis, so she says, had been wishing to leave Paris. She dreaded the disorders which she felt sure would break out. In the previous year she had had an adventure which made her more anxious than ever to quit her native land. She has described it in detail in her memoirs, and we may be sure it loses nothing in her telling. One day, about four o'clock, she writes, Mademoiselle, Monsieur le Comte de Beaujolais, my niece Henriette de Cercy, Pamela and I drove out in a calèche to see a country house some four leagues out of Paris. We passed by the village of Colombe. Unhappily, it was a fair day. Crowds of people from the neighborhood had gathered in the village. As we drove through, they thronged round our carriage and took it into their heads that I was the queen with Madame and Monsieur le Dauphin who were fleeing from Paris. They made us get out of the carriage of which they took possession as well as of the coachman and our servants. In this confusion, the commander of the National Guard, a young man of good family named Baudry, came to our assistance and harangued the people, but he could not pacify them. He succeeded, however, in persuading them to allow him to take us to his house, which was close at hand, by giving them his word of honor that he would keep us there as prisoners until the matter was completely cleared up. 
he led us through an immense crowd, and as we passed on this short journey, we heard many voices crying, À la lanterne! Finally we entered his dwelling. But a quarter of an hour afterwards, four thousand people besieged the doors, forced them open, and rushed into the house in a terrible tumult. Monsieur Baudry courageously and kindly made every possible effort to calm them. We were in the garden, and as I heard that they were about to arrive, I told my pupils to play at rounders with me. Then, sure enough, a terrifying crowd of men and women rushed into the garden. They were surprised to see us at play. We stopped our game at once, and I advanced to meet them with the most perfect calm. I said I was the wife of one of their deputies, that I was going to write a note to Paris, and I asked them to send a messenger with it, in order that the matter might be cleared up. They listened, but without being convinced, for they cried that it was all lies, and that I was writing to ask for reinforcements, and they concluded by saying that if anyone were so foolhardy as to go to Paris, they would hang him from the lamp-post when he returned. M. Baudry then spoke to them, and extremely well, but in vain. During the dispute I was taking snuff, and I had my snuff-box open. Just as I was proposing that we should be given a guard of ten or twelve men and left in peace until the morning, a wretched peasant, dead drunk, filthy and disgusting, came and took a pinch of snuff out of my box. I threw the rest of the snuff away and went on with my speech. This action astonished them and had a good effect. Many said that I should not be so calm if I were really the queen. At this point a man from the crowd, seizing an opportunity when everyone was talking at once, came to me and whispered in my ear, I was once Sillery's gamekeeper. Don't be anxious. I am going to Paris. These words were as balm in Gilead to me. Finally all the peasants consented to go away. But they left us a guard of a dozen men armed with bayonets at the end of their guns who followed us everywhere. Most of the people were drunk. They stayed in the streets near the house where we were so that it was impossible for us to escape. At eight in the evening, the mayor of the village arrived to cross-examine us. In order to make himself as imposing as possible, he had put on his tricolor scarf. He asked me gravely to deliver up to him all the papers in my pockets. I gave him four or five letters. While he was carefully examining the seals, I urged him to open them. He replied brusquely that he could not read, but he refused to give them back to me. Under these conditions we passed the whole night. Our peasant besiegers in the streets were sleeping themselves into sobriety. When they awoke they were more reasonable. At five in the morning, Sillery's ex-gamekeeper returned from Paris. He had been to the town hall and brought back an order for our release. This good gamekeeper had been quite sure that the people when sober would forget that they had ever refused to let us return to Paris. He was right. No one remembered. They were unanimous in recognizing that I was not the queen, and their wrath gave place to repentance. They clamored to escort us back to Paris in triumph. What a story that would have made for the newspapers! End of Chapter 5, Part 1 Chapter 5, Part 2 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of The Story of the Revolution Told by Its Women Writers It was not until a year after this incident on the 11th of October, 1791, that Madame de Genlis succeeded in getting away from France. Alleging as a pretext that the health of Mademoiselle d'Orléans required a change of air, she left for England, taking with her the Princess and Pamela, and escorted by the deputy Pétion, who was afterwards to become so prominent. Eight months after her departure, the French government declared war on Austria, whose emperor was thought to be in league with the émigré army. "'Today the king has proclaimed war,' wrote Madame Julien to her husband on the 20th of April, 1792. His speech was so simple and constitutional, the president's reply laconic and just. The number of women whom the commissioners had allowed to penetrate into the sanctuary so upset the good deputies that the session was adjourned before two o'clock just after the king had left. The war was unfortunate for France from the beginning. You have already heard of Dillon's defeat and of his unhappy fate. He was massacred by his own troops, wrote Madame Julien to her husband on May the 3rd, 1792. A second affair before Mons, commanded by Monsieur de Biron, was also a failure. 
"'Our aristocrats display a horrible joy "'which I hope will be but short-lived,' she continues. "'We can scarcely breathe. "'We are so anxious for news. "'Mirabeau was right. "'War is absorbing, and that is unfortunate "'when there is so much else needing our attention.' A fortnight later, Madame Julien writes that she is persuaded that the stagnation of the armies results from a plot. The conspirators were, to use her own phrase, all the constituted authorities, and their aim the subversion of the new order, equally disliked by the ambitious powerful and by the wicked wealthy. This supposed royalist conspiracy becomes a veritable obsession for Madame Julien and for many others. She hears in the street below the cry, Infernal plot of Les Feuillants discovered! innocence of the jacobin established to obtain material proofs of this plot is impossible she writes only the idiotic and the vulgar demand them moral certitude alone is possible because these wicked conspirators are far too crafty to leave any trace of their malevolent designs meanwhile paris is growing more and more agitated especially in the palais royal and the tuileries gardens we returned from the tuileries gardens about six o'clock in the evening writes Madame Julien on May the 23rd, 1792. All Paris was there. We saw two incidents which greatly moved the crowd. First, it was an officer who struck a colporteur because he was selling a pamphlet justifying the Jacobin. The people would have set upon him had not a member of the National Guard, while reproving the officer, promised the people that he should be brought to justice. Nevertheless, he did not escape being knocked about, shaken, and howled at, and finally accompanied to the guardhouse by some two or three thousand souls. All this happened on the Feuillant Terrace, the terrace of the Feuillant Monastery adjoining the riding school where the assembly sat, at the very gates of the palace. I was sitting on the parapet of the terrace. It was like being on a rock on the shore of a raging ocean. No sooner was calm established than another storm broke out. Again waves of people rushed from all directions. It was the poet Ronchy who wanted to harangue a group of people at whose aristocratic ardor they were about to cool by throwing him into the water. Happily, a justice of the peace put up his little white wand, and the docile crowd, overawed by the sudden appearance of this symbol of the law, contented itself with demanding that Ronchy be sent out of the gardens, and two thousand conducted him to the gate near the Pont Royal, so that from my seat on the parapet I saw this little scene quite close. Still no news from the frontier, she writes on May the 6th, 1792, and the month of May is over. The stagnation, the inactivity of our armies contrasted with French impetuosity, makes those who have long-sighted spectacles tremble. Meanwhile, at home, patriotism burns brightly. Yesterday, she continues, a man from Bordeaux laid fifty-seven thousand francs in coin on the altar of the fatherland. The market roughs, les phares de la Halle, brought eight hundred francs to the altar in the Senate House. They said that the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Constitution ought to be carried at the head of the army like the Ark. On the 16th of June, she tells her son that the king has partly changed his ministry. Roland, Minister of the Interior, Servant of War, and Clavier of Finance have been dismissed. She recommends her son to read attentively in Le Moniteur, Roland's letter to the king, generally thought to have been inspired by Madame Roland. It brought him into disgrace with the court, it will win him the admiration and the esteem of the whole of France. The blindness of kings is the scourge of humanity. Truth cannot come near them, and the fools think that by rejecting they annihilate it, whilst in reality they only make it more visible. Roland's memory will be immortal. On June the 19th, the eve of the first mob attack on the Tuileries, she writes to her husband, "'Tomorrow the people will rise.' they will march to the National Assembly to demand sweeping measures. Her servant Marion walks round the Tuileries Gardens and finds more people congregated there than there are grains of sand. All speak the same language. All demand that the king shall either support the Constitution or openly declare himself its enemy. The morning of the eventful 20th, Madame Julien spends in the assembly listening to the speeches of Vergniaud, the Girondist orator, and others discussing whether or no the people's demands shall be granted and the sections of Paris admitted to the assembly hall. Finally, at half-past one, they are allowed to come in. Forty thousand citizens enter through the door opposite the Place Vendôme. The true sovereign was really majestic, she writes. 
For two hours by my watch it defiled through the hall in perfect order, in magnificent tranquillity. There were citizens armed with pikes, national guards, hussars, grenadiers, troops of the line, ladies, women of the people, all mingling in a spirit of equality and fraternal unity. They bore the sacred tables of the rights of man and a thousand emblems of the Constitution and of liberty. Military music played the Saira. The regularity of this procession was broken from time to time by various incidents. When the President of the Assembly was being saluted, flags got entangled and there were cries hailing the accident as a symbol of reunion. One fellow, looking like a clodhopper, held up the whole procession, while he said a few words about the war which were full of force and common sense. Monsieur Santerre came last. In the name of the suburbs, Les Faubourgs, he presented the assembly with a superb banner. As the last group was passing through the hall, the president stopped it to announce that the brave Lachner had taken Courtrai and captured more than a thousand prisoners of war, and that the Germans in the city had cried, Long live the French nation! The procession passed out of the hall onto the Fayon Terrace towards the Tuileries Palace, which they completely surrounded. They entered it by the gates on the Place du Carousel. Madame Julien now ceases to be an eyewitness. In describing the scenes enacted within the palace, she cites as authorities her hairdresser, who said the next morning that the invaders had displayed the greatest moderation and the most profound wisdom, and her faithful servant Marion, who apparently entered the Tuileries with the crowd. There she saw astounding things. The people in the king's house, presenting him with two cockades, one tricolor and the other white. The king choosing the tricolor and putting on the red cap, the red Phrygian cap of liberty. Superb things were said to the king, and doubtless, apparently she was not quite sure about this, he was presented with a petition, asking him to withdraw his veto from the decrees establishing an armed camp of patriots round Paris and the transportation of the non-juring clergy. Madame Julien, now an ardent Jacobin, was growing more and more impatient of the legislative assembly, whose meeting seemed to her a sublime farce, and whose actions she thought calculated to irritate the masses. The June attack on the Tuileries had been no more than an attempt to frighten the king into granting his people's demands. But as July drew into August and the fateful tenth approached, Madame Julien began to perceive terrible storm-clouds lowering. On the eighth, she wrote, Nothing but a miracle can save us. On the ninth, the tocsin has sounded the alarm. The streets are full of people. Trembling women look from the windows and question the passers-by. Then, as in all revolutions, there were many who failed to see what was coming. On that very evening to Louise Pusy the city seemed tranquil. The people appeared to be mainly occupied with dancing at the Parisian Vauxhall, while the women were busy making those frocks in the Coblan's fashion, which had now succeeded Le Costume Constitution and Le Chapeau Révolution. Louise, on that eventful evening, was making a Coblan scarf when her husband and a friend came in wearing uniform. But this had no significance for what she called her mind. It was not until the following day when she saw the squares and streets strewn with corpses that Madame Louise began to take the revolution seriously. At the close of that day, Madame Julien wrote a description of it to her husband. Listen and shudder, she began. The night was uneventful. The Tuileries had been filled with national guards. The assembly also had its triple guard. At six in the morning, the king had reviewed his Swiss guards on the swing bridge. At eight, he went to the National Assembly. Suddenly, the Swiss appeared at all the palace windows and fired on the National Guards. The gates of the chateau opened, and bristling with cannon let fly a volley on the people. The Swiss redoubled their firing. The National Guard, with barely two rounds of ammunition, was riddled. The people fled, then rallied in rage and despair. The Marseille volunteers were so many heroes performing prodigies of valor. The chateau was stormed. Heaven's justice opened up a way for the invaders, and the Swiss expiated in death the base treason of which they had been the instruments. The whole royal family, mere toys in the hands of a bloodthirsty faction, had taken advantage of a favorable moment to seek refuge with the assembly. They were conducted to the reporter's gallery where they still are. No newspaper has appeared. I have not heard a word of the assembly, and incredible as it may sound, the assembly may have been calmer today than at any time in its existence. Today, the 10th of August, 
was to have been the day of the counter-revolution. Three weeks later, Madame Julien was describing the first of those terrible days when the furious populace invaded the jails and butchered between twelve and sixteen hundred prisoners. "'Would you believe it?' she writes. "'I spent from six till eight in the Tuileries Gardens. Crowds everywhere, agitated yet orderly. Paris has no night now. When daylight fades there are illuminations, two magnificent pyramids of light on the Great Lake and illuminated booths in the sidewalks.' The Feuillon Terrace was as bright as day, covered with groups of men, women, and children, all ready to follow the most generous impulses, or to give effect to the most terrible resolutions. Then her letter suddenly assumes a more tragic tone. Six masons returning from work tell of the horrors that are being perpetrated. They have seen piles of corpses at the gates of the prisons. The emissaries of the people, fearing lest in the event of the Prussians marching into Paris the imprisoned anti-revolutionaries should rise and join them, have been visiting each jail in turn, and after some kind of inquiry have massacred the prisoners in cold blood. This terrible carnage had seemed to them the only way of assuring the safety of the wives and families of the heroes fighting at the front. "'My pity,' writes Madame Julien, "'makes me weep over the fate shared alike by the guilty and the innocent.' My God, have mercy on a people provoked to such horrible bloodshed. Impute it not. Then, too deeply moved to write more, she throws down her pen in the middle of a sentence. About the time of the prison massacre, Charlotte Robespierre came to Paris to join her brothers Maximilien and Auguste, who were both members of the National Convention. The three Robespierre were invited to dine at Madame Julien's. I am to make the acquaintance of this patriotic family, she writes the head of which has so many friends and so many enemies. Madame Julien was quick to see into the hearts of this famous trio. In her portraits there is a fine aloofness of judgment which we miss in the portraits of Madame Roland. Maximilien's hostess had previously criticized him somewhat severely. His literary style, as displayed in the newspaper Le Défenseur de la Constitution, she had thought careless and uninspiring. In July 1792 he had seemed to her to be losing credit. She was distressed to hear him in the Jacobin Club denouncing the great Girondin, Vergniaud, and Brissot. She regrets his ironical tone in his controversy with her friend Pétion, who after June the 20th had been suspended from his office as mayor of Paris. Pétion is worthy of respect, she writes. Robespierre should not despise him. Were Robespierre my husband, I would throw myself at his feet and implore him in the name of the public good to forget his private vengeance. On nearer acquaintance, however, she thought better of Robespierre. The family as a whole pleased her. They convinced her that Maximilien had nothing whatever to do either with the August attack on the Tuileries or with the prison massacres. She cannot believe that nature would have endowed an evil soul with so handsome a countenance. But he seems to her about as well fitted to be a party leader as to take the moon in his teeth. An abstract thinker, dry and academic, he is as gentle as a lamb and as serious as young. I see, she writes to her husband, that he has not your tender sensibility. However, I like to believe that he desires the good of mankind, though it is rather from a sense of justice than from any good will. The younger Robespierre, Madame Julien, liked less. He was more animated than his brother, but less distinguished, and of a petulance likely to lead to mischief-making. In well-chosen neutral tints, Madame Julien paints the colorless Charlotte Robespierre. She is... Naive and natural like your aunts, she writes to her son. She came two hours before the others. We had a woman's talk, and I made her tell me about their home lives, simple and frank like our own. Both Madame Julien's diary and Charlotte's own memoirs suggest that the virtuous Robespierre family had a jaundiced outlook on life, that they were a bilious trio, loving but not understanding even one another. Certainly, from the time of the arrival of Charlotte and Auguste in Paris, their family relations were far from harmonious. Charlotte was jealous of her brother's friends, especially of the Duplais, the family of a master cabinet-maker of la rue Saint-Honoré, with whom he had lodged ever since the night of the Champ de Mars massacre, when he, like the Roberts, had deemed it imprudent to return to his own home. These hospitable people, so Charlotte tells us, received her and her brother when they arrived from Arras, but from the beginning, Charlotte was displeased at finding herself and Auguste lodged in rooms remote from their brothers. 
she tells how finally she persuaded Maximilien to leave the Duplaise and to establish himself with his brother and sister in a flat of their own in la rue saint florentin but there he fell ill and madame duplay accusing charlotte of neglecting her brother fetched him away then of course it was war to the knife between the two women as the following incident told by charlotte shows i often sent my brother jam or preserved fruits or some other dainty of which he was very fond writes charlotte whenever she saw my servant arriving with such a gift madame duplay would fly into a temper one day she said to my servant who had brought some pots of jam take them away i won't have her poisoning robespierre the servant did not fail to report those words to her mistress the terrible blasphemy exclaims charlotte instead of making a scene which would have annoyed my brother she continues i devoured my grief and my indignation in silence soon afterwards she quarrelled with her younger brother auguste here again her brother's friends were the cause of the dispute she never saw auguste afterwards and maximilien she met but rarely but to go back to the autumn of 1792. In November, Madame de Genlis, accompanied by Pamela, returned from England and paid a visit of one night only to Paris. The appearance of the capital and the ferocious and insolent air of the people in the streets justified her worst fears. Only the desire to give Mademoiselle d'Orléans up to the Duke, her father, and to resign her post as governess had induced Madame de Genlis to risk a return she had begun to realize that the misfortune of being connected with the house of orleans was exposing her to all kinds of calumny and persecution but she found it impossible to get rid of mademoiselle by bringing the princess back to paris against her father's wishes Egalité had sent courier after courier to madame de genlis forbidding her to return she had placed her in the greatest danger for the convention had included mademoiselle in the list of proscribed enemies even the selfishness of madame de genlis could not withstand egalite's urgent entreaty that she would continue in office if only for a fortnight longer until another governess could be found and that meanwhile she would hurry out of france taking mademoiselle with her accordingly on the following morning she bade farewell to her husband de Sillery, whom she was never to see again and to egalite whom she wishes her readers to believe that she then saw for the last time monsieur le duc d'orleans she writes gloomier than ever gave me his arm and led me to the carriage i was greatly moved mademoiselle was in tears her father pale and trembling he stood motionless at the carriage door his eyes fixed on me his sad lugubrious glance seemed to implore pity farewell madame he said his broken voice touched me deeply unable to utter a single word i gave him my hand he took it pressed it then turning to the postilions, he gave them the signal, and we started. Their destination was Tournay, which was then just across the frontier. There Madame de Genlis stayed much longer than the stipulated fortnight, for no new governess arrived to take her place. I did not waste my time at Tournay, she writes. We led a well-ordered life there. A person in town lent me books. I read aloud every day for an hour and a half. I played the harp with Mademoiselle she painted flowers so did i then we did all kinds of fancy work i taught her to make charming little straw baskets the paris church was but a few steps from the house we went to mass there every day and our time passed swiftly and even agreeably as was my custom i sat up alone every evening for two or three hours writing my diary and jotting down my reflections it was at Tournay, writes Madame de Genlis, that we heard of the horrible catastrophe which ended the life of the unfortunate Louis the Sixteenth. From the bottom of my heart I deplored this terrible event, and for more than one reason. Then she gives a letter from her husband saying that he had voted for la reclusion, imprisonment, jusqu'à la paix, that in doing so he had obeyed his conscience, knowing very well that by expressing such an opinion he had pronounced his own death sentence. Sillery was not mistaken. He was guillotined nine months after the king he had tried to save. It was at Tournay in March 1793 that the commander-in-chief of the revolution armies, Dumouriez, went over to the enemy. Madame de Genlis was accused of being implicated in this treachery. In her Précis de la conduite de Madame de Genlis depuis la Révolution, she attempts to clear herself of this charge. Of all the lies concocted about me, she writes, this one is the most absurd and the least probable. True, I was charmed with so famous a man, 
but never for a single instant was I alone in tête-à-tête -tête with him. Madame de Genlis admits, however, that during the time that they were both at Tournay, from March 26 to 31st, she entertained the general to dinner three times. When Du Maurier left Tournay for St. Armand on the 31st, Madame and her pupils followed him there, traveling in a berline with the blinds down, wearing large brimmed hats and thick veils which completely hid their faces. Madame also admits that on hearing that the conspirator's object was the restoration of a constitutional monarchy, she remarked that it ought never to have been abolished. But, she added, after having shed so much blood to establish a republic, it was better to adhere to it. We cannot follow Madame de Genlis through all her subsequent wanderings, neither can we enter into the details of her temporary rupture with the Orléans family and of her parting with Mademoiselle. But one incident of those travels must be related. It occurred in July 1794 when she was staying in a boarding-house at Altena. There, in a curious manner, she heard of Robespierre's death. It was one hour after midnight, she writes. I was very surprised to hear continuous knocking at my door, and my astonishment increased when I recognized the voice of my neighbor, Monsieur de Quercy, who was generally so quiet. He was crying, Open your door, open quickly, I must kiss you. When I refused to gratify so singular a desire, he repeated several times, You yourself will wish to kiss me. Open your door. Finally I obeyed. Monsieur de Quercy threw himself on my neck and said, The tyrant is no more. Robespierre is dead. Then in truth I did embrace my visitor and with all my heart. The next day, adds Madame de Genlis, they heard that the effect of the news on one of Robespierre's supporters in the neighborhood had been to make him fall down stark dead. For an account of the events preceding Robespierre's death, of the famous Ninth of Thermidor, when the incorruptible was arrested by the convention and took refuge at the Hôtel de Ville, one turns naturally to the memoirs of Robespierre's sister, but only to meet with disappointment. For Charlotte's account of one of the most critical days in her own life and in the whole course of the revolution is brief, and totally without any personal touch. Having discussed in summary fashion the moving scene in the convention, having described briefly his flight to l'Hôtel de Ville, she says, The Thermidorian attacked the Hôtel de Ville with troops that the convention had placed at their disposal. The terrible decree of outlawry had scattered all those who had rallied round my brother to defend him. He was seized but I cannot continue the story. History must fill in the blank left by my sorrow. One sympathizes with Charlotte when she shrinks from relating the events of a day which must have filled her with anguish. Nevertheless, one would like to know where she was and how she behaved on the ninth of Thermidor. Did she attempt to fly to her brother's side, or did she simply cower indoors? Did she stay all day in the place where she was then living in the Hôtel de Cherbourg, near the saint Eustache Church, and only a few minutes' walk away from the Hôtel de Ville where her brother's fate was being decided? As to her doings on the next day, the tenth of Thermidor, Charlotte leaves us in no doubt. I rushed into the street, she says, my head in a whirl, despair in my heart. She sought for her brothers when she was sure of not finding them, when they were in prison. But had she sought them on the previous day? I run here and there, she continues. I entreat to be allowed to see them. I drag myself to the soldiers. They repulse me, laugh at my tears, insult me, strike me. A few pitiful people drag me away. My mind wandered. I did not know what happened or what became of me. When I came to myself, I was in prison. Charlotte had been arrested on the 13th of Thermidor, the 30th of July. Her replies during her examination by the Revolutional Tribunal show her anxious to save her own life at the expense of her brother's reputation. After asserting, and probably with truth, that she had frequently remonstrated with Maximilien as to his actions and the kind of company he kept, she adds that had she for a moment guessed the nature of the infamous plot, complot infâme, in which she was involved, she would have denounced him to the authorities rather than have seen her country imperiled. We must not be hard on Charlotte. She was no heroine, only a dull, peevish woman, totally incapable of comprehending the vast issues at stake, and now she was trembling with fear and possessed by one idea alone, that of saving her own life. Her imprisonment lasted fifteen days. At the close of her memoirs, she tells a confused story of a lady who came to her in prison and made her sign some paper, the contents of which she did not completely understand. 
she fears lest the cowardly Thermidorians may have used it against her brother's friends. With this reflection, her memoirs close. The paper to which she referred has not yet been identified. Perhaps it never existed. On the authority of Auguste Robespierre, we know Charlotte's memory to have been unreliable. Charlotte, having adopted her mother's name of Carreau, lived on in obscurity until 1830. Two years before her death, she inserted in her will a clause intended to rehabilitate her brother Maximilien's memory. Voulant avant de payer à la nature, she wrote, le tribut que tous les mortels lui doivent, faire connaître mes sentiments envers la mémoire de mon frère aîné, je déclare que je l'ai toujours connu comme un homme plein de vertu. By a strange coincidence, Madame de Genlis and Charlotte Robespierre died in the same year. The former had long before then returned to France. When in 1799 the name of Madame de Genlis was erased from the list of émigrés and she was permitted to return to her native land, she found it greatly changed. The streets had all been renamed and the names of philosophers substituted for those of saints. Many of the cabs in the streets she recognized as the confiscated carriages of her friends who had perished in the revolution, and in the shop windows she saw their books, pictures, and furniture for sale. But perhaps what struck her the most was the change that had come over the manners and habits of the women. Young women, she thought, much less reserved than they had been. They would recline on a sofa without throwing a rug over their feet, so that the slightest movement might reveal a foot or even part of a leg. The girls of the period would call young men by their Christian names, would address their girlfriends by the second person singular. Such things, said Madame de Genlis, were never thought of before the revolution. Men, so it seemed to the returned émigrés, treated women with less respect than in the good old times when, she would have us believe, they always addressed the fair sex with reverence and in a lower tone of voice than they would use when speaking to men. Existence in so coarse and vulgar a world must have been terrible indeed for the exquisite Madame de Genlis. Yet she contrived to live on to a ripe old age, through the Napoleonic period, and the reigns of the two Bourbons of the elder line, and not to die until her pupil, Louis-Philippe, was well established on the throne. End of chapter 5《ラブリーグの恋の歌詞》この中で最も有名な歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞です。ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、ラブリーグの歌詞は、Second, those who found it impossible to avoid dealing with the great convulsion in some, if not in all, their writings. For our purpose here, the last class is of course by far the most important and must be dealt with at length. But beforehand, let us dismiss rather summarily the first class, of which we need indeed only mention one representative, Julie Cordeille. She claims attention not only because of her intimate association with many of the women who figure in these pages, but because she was a brilliant social personage endowed with many gifts, at once musician and novelist, playwright and actress, and because she was a prominent figure in revolutionary society, although she seems never to have taken part in politics. We have met her already playing on the piano at Madame Talma's when Marat made his violent intrusion. Several histories of the revolution describe her as the mistress of Vergniaud, the most eloquent of the Girondist orators. But Vergniaud's biographer Vatel completely destroys this legend. He proves from Julie's own words and other evidence that she had never even spoken to Vergniaud. Mademoiselle Cardet made her debut as an actress at the early age of fifteen in 1782 at the opera as Iphigenie in Gluck's Iphigenia in Olis. Though always referred to as Mademoiselle Cardet, she was in reality thrice married. Thus she made good use of that right to divorce which the de Goncourts declared was the only advantage woman obtained from the revolution. The so-called Mademoiselle Cardet divorced two husbands. The second she had met under rather unusual circumstances. When she was playing at La Comédie Française, An elderly coach-builder of Brussels came to Paris to break off a match between his son and one of Julie's fellow actresses. While soliciting Julie's aid in the matter, the coach-builder fell in love with his collaboratress, 
and instead of preventing one wedding, found himself celebrating two. After divorcing the coach-builder, Julie took to herself a third husband, with whom she seems to have contrived to spend the remainder of her days. They extended until 1834, for Julie was one of the few people who succeeded in living through the revolution. As an actress she made no mark, except in a play of her own composition, interspersed with songs set to music of her own, and entitled Catherine ou la belle fermière, played at the Théâtre de la République in 1797 with the authoress in the principal part. It took the town by storm. The piece was indeed just that blend of sentimentality à la Jean-Jacques and artificiality à la Watteau, which would delight playgoers of the day. The scene is laid in the country, where fine ladies and gentlemen mingling with peasants and peasantesses indulge in picnics and other rustic pursuits. Catherine herself, the beautiful fermière, is, as we might expect, a great lady in disguise. The wickedness of townsfolk in general, and of her husband, who at length fell a victim to his sins, have driven her to take refuge in the heart of the provinces. There, Catherine plays at the simple life as Marie Antoinette had done in her Amou at Versailles. In the end her identity is discovered, and her love of simplicity rewarded by marriage with a husband who, though he shares her taste, is of her own station. It is a light, graceful little play. That the authoress herself acted the principal part no doubt contributed to its success, for Julie Condé was very charming, so much so that some of her sister authoresses grew jealous of her attractions. Not long after the performance of La Belle Fermière at the Théâtre de la République, another play by a woman was acted there. It was L'Entrée de Dumouriez à Bruxelles by Olympe de Gouges, a wild and incoherent medley with three women soldiers as heroines. Hissed on the first night, it was withdrawn after the second performance. The audience refused even to hear it out. After repeated interruptions, the occupants of the pit jumped onto the stage and began to dance the Carmagnole. Others demanded the name of the author. Olympe, the vainest woman that ever lived, had concealed it from fear of having her head turned by the congratulations that she never doubted the play well deserved. Mademoiselle Condé now came forward on the stage, and was about to reveal the secret when she was anticipated by the authoress who, from her box, quivering with rage, cried aloud, "'It is I, citizens. But if my play seems to you bad, it is because it was horribly acted.' Howls and roars of laughter greeted this announcement and followed the discomfited playwright as she fled from the theatre. But Olympe was not one to suffer in silence.' A few days later she attacked actors and actresses in print and accused them of having made a veritable pantomime of her work in order to please that monster of perfidious jealousy, Mademoiselle Condé. Louise Fusy, also an actress, seems to have been almost as bitter against Julie, though she had less cause than Olympe. In the Souvenir, to which we have already referred, Louise acknowledged that Julie had a fine figure, a glorious complexion, that she played divinely on the harp and the piano, that she was well-educated and witty and successful, but she adds, Among the fairies invited to her christening one had been forgotten, une petite fille carabosse, who had taken her revenge by endowing the infant with a quality that would nullify all her advantages, the quality of affectation which would render her always ridiculous. Of all those who wrote about Julie, Louise Fusy was the only person who made this discovery. Madame de Genlis, who devotes several eulogistic pages to her, does not mention it. Though in France today Mademoiselle Condé has long ceased to be remembered, the curious may find several of her works preserved in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Among them are two historical novels, Agnès de France ou le Douzième siècle, and Mathilde, Reine de France. Another novel, Geneviève ou le Hameau, Histoire de huit journées. A moral tale, Lydie ou les mariages manqués, a subject on which the authoress must have been an expert. An essay on human felicity entitled Dictionnaire du Bonheur in two volumes, and Le Commissionnaire, a prose comedy in two acts. In turning over the pages of these volumes, I have been unable to discover that they possess any literary merit. They are merely interesting on account of their charming and popular authoress. Now we must turn to those women pamphleteers and journalists who by their pens helped to make the revolution. Avec des plumes, wrote Père Duchesne in one of his so-called patriotic letters, on a fait danser une gavotte à Dame Bastille. Avec des plumes, on a ébranlé les trônes des tyrans, remué le globe et piqué tous les peuples pour marcher à la liberté. 
more than one epic-making state document nominally a man's work was in reality a woman's madame roland is known to have revised her husband's political tracts manifestos and dispatches when he was minister of the interior she is said to have written that momentous letter to the king which closed the first girondin ministry in june seventeen ninety two from madame de genlis's prolific brain some say proceeded the speech made by the duke of orleans to the jacobin club afterwards embodied in a letter to the national assembly renouncing all rights to the throne the appearance of an immense mass of pamphlets and newspapers representing every shade of opinion faction and party was a striking feature of revolutionary society pamphlets were written by women as well as men the most exuberant of these revolutionary women pamphleteers was a writer we have already mentioned in this chapter olympe de gouges mademoiselle Condé's unsuccessful rival olympe is the queerest and most quixotic of the revolutionary women as we read her life story conflicting emotions stir within us we are moved alternately to admiration and contempt to tears and to laughter for running athwart her whimsies and caprices her arrogance and her vanity are fine strains of heroic courage and maternal pity moreover true frenchwoman as she is despite her vagaries we shall find her now and again urging against the opinions of her party a course which as subsequent events have proved would have been one of true wisdom next to her pity the quality that one most admires in olympe is the independence of her judgment as her exuberance would lead one to expect she was a meridionale born at montauban in seventeen forty eight her real name was marie gouze olympe was her mother's name which her daughter adopted because it sounded majestic though the so-called olympe tried to make out that her descent was noble her father was probably a butcher and there seems no doubt that olympe married a cook one pierre aubry by whom she had at least one child a son he alone can be identified though there are references to another whether her husband died or whether she left him seems uncertain at any rate in the early eighties she was in paris and possessed of a considerable fortune once beautiful numerous passionate experiences had left their mark upon her beauty olympe determined to be conspicuous at all costs and finding she could no longer queen it in the courts of love although so uneducated as barely to be able to write she began to lift her eyes to the heights of parnassus for her obstacles only existed in order to be overcome so to make up for her literary defects she engaged she says ten secretaries they were not too many for her exalted imagination and fluent speech wore out four in a few hours she started with thirty plays in her head only ten of them were ever written and not all of these were printed two at least l'esclavage des nègres and le renaufrage were accepted and the first played at la comédie française when this theatre refused the third play molière chez ninon olympe who liked to fancy herself the ninon of the eighteenth century became furious and with that itching to write démangeaison d'écrire which she says embittered her life she protested in a booklet les comédiens démasqués against treatment which she asserted to be grossly unjust by this time she was well launched on her career of political pamphleteer two at least of her pamphlets appeared in the first year of the revolution they and those that follow them have titles long and long sounding enough to introduce some lengthy treatise one is surprised therefore to find them heading no more than a few pages thus for instance the title of one of the earliest of these writings action héroïque d'une française ou la france sauvée par les femmes would lead one to expect at least the biography of a second joan of arc instead we find no more than four brief pages urging women to sacrifice their jewels in their country's cause and she does not even tell us of one who did so the brevity of these manifestos for they were little more is accounted for by the fact that they were intended to be posted on the hoardings she was also assiduous in sending round her writings to the newspapers accompanied by a letter demanding notice in paying for this publicity as well as for the printing and distribution of her works olympe spent the last remnants of her fortune disappointing as they are for the most part it is in these writings that we catch here and there a gleam of what we now recognize to have been political insight thus in the matter of the dispute between the three estates as to voting by head or by order in seventeen eighty nine 
Olympe suggests that each deputy should write down clearly on a piece of paper the instructions he had received on this subject from his constituents, that the paper should be placed in a ballot box and counted, and that the method which was advocated by the majority of the papers should be adopted. Like most early revolutionists, Olympe's sympathies were at first monarchical. She looked to the king to carry out a program of social reform advocated in her pamphlets, and inspired by her keen sympathy with the terrible sufferings of the people. By her proposal to solve the problem of unemployment through the establishment of national workshops, Olympe anticipated the revolutionaries of 1848. Her object, she says, was to electrify humanity, and to this end she sermonized everybody, high and low, but chiefly high, the king, the queen, the prince de Condé, the duc d'Orléans, the National Assembly, and Robespierre. Olympe, like most leading women of the Revolution, detested Robespierre. She held him responsible for the second attack on the Tuileries, and in order to wash off the bloodstains which had covered him ever since, she invited him to plunge with her into the Seine. We would tie balls of lead to our feet and thus cast ourselves together into the flood, she added. When the princes had emigrated, Olympe had implored the king to appoint her to follow them and persuade them to return. With the woman's procession on October the 6th, 1789, she had no sympathy whatever. It horrified her to see royalty thus led captive. The monarchical edifice, completed by Louis the Fourteenth, then seemed to her almost sacred. Fourteen years' work, she wrote, have improved its excellent constitution. It is madness to think of changing it. And yet they do think of doing so. What a time! It was not long, however, before Olympe herself became firmly persuaded that nothing could save the state but the destruction of this sacred constitution. The king's flight to Varennes suddenly made her a republican. After the humiliating return of the sovereign and his family to Paris, Olympe protested, and quite reasonably against the retention of an institution which had forfeited the nation's respect. Nevertheless, when at length monarchy was abolished and the republic proclaimed, when Louis had ceased to be king, when he stood before the bar of the assembly to answer for his life, Olympe's passionate pity went out to him. Then she performed the most quixotic and the most courageous action of her extraordinary career. She offered herself as Louis's defender, and in so doing doomed herself to the scaffold. Already by her outspoken criticism of many acts of the revolutionary party, she had made herself unpopular in clubs and societies, especially in the Jacobin Club. Now she was regarded as a traitor to the revolution. The letter to the convention in which she made her proposal is so characteristic through its inconsequence and contradictions, its naivete and queer metaphors, its inflated vanity, its superb courage and, spite of all, its strain of common sense, that we quote it almost in full. Citizen President The universe fixes its eyes on the trial of the first and last of French kings. I hasten to pass on to the National Convention original letters written to me by les sieurs Brissac and Laporte. I add to them five hundred copies of my compte rendu. Citizen President, a great matter occupies me today, that of my country's honor. I offer myself after the courageous Mazerbe to be Louis's defender. Let not my sex be an objection. That heroism and liberty may be possessed by women the revolution has shown by more than one example. But I am a frank and loyal republican without blame and without reproach. No one doubts it, not even those who pretend to call in question my civic virtues. I may, therefore, undertake this case. I believe Louis guilty as king, but once shorn of this forbidden title, he ceases to be guilty in the eyes of the republic. His ancestors had failed to overflowing the cup of the sufferings of France. Unhappily the cup broke in his hands and all its fragments rebounded upon his head. I may add that, had it not been for his court's perversity, he might perhaps have been a virtuous king. It is enough to recall that he hated the great, that he succeeded in obliging them to pay their debts, that he alone of all our tyrants kept no courtesans, that his morals were primitive. He was weak, he was deceived, he deceived us, he deceived himself. In brief, this is the charge against him. Citizen President, I shall not here produce the reasons that I have to bring forward for his defense. 
I desire only to be permitted by the convention and by Louis Capet to second an old man of more than fourscore years in a painful function, which to me seems to demand all the strength and all the courage of a greener age. I should certainly never have entered the list with such a defender had not the cruelty of the sire target, as cruel as it was selfish, inflamed my heroism and excited my pity. I am ready to die now. One of my Republican plays is about to be acted. If, at a moment, it may be of personal triumph, I am deprived of life, and if laws continue after my death, my name will be blessed, and my assassins, when their eyes are opened, will weep tears over my grave. Louis Capet may suspect my zeal. Doubtless, his infamous courtiers have not failed to paint me as a cannibal thirsting for blood. But how grand thus to undeceive an unhappy and defenseless man! With the permission of the National Convention, I will state an opinion which seems to me worthy its close attention. Is Louis the last more dangerous to the Republic than his brothers, than his son? His brothers are still in league with foreign powers and are working for themselves alone. Louis Capet's son is innocent, and he will survive his father. May not pretenders fill centuries with faction and with strife? In history, the English occupy a place very different from the Romans. In the eyes of posterity, the English are dishonored by the execution of Charles I. The Romans are immortalized by the exile of Tarquin. But true republicans always had nobler maxims than slaves. Beheading a king does not kill him. He lives long after his death. He is only really dead when he survives his fall. Here I conclude, in order that the National Convention may make those reflections which arise from what I have said. We all know that many subsequent historians have adopted Olympe's last argument against the execution of a king. The Convention, after having heard this document read, passed on without note or comment to the next business. But the letter had aroused considerable opposition. A crowd of infuriated idlers gathered round the door, and as Olympe came out boldly into their midst, one of them seized her and handled her so roughly that her cap fell off, disclosing a bald head. "'Who will give twenty-four sous for the head of Madame de Gouges?' he cried, whereupon Alain, with perfect serenity, rejoined, "'Friend, I bid thirty. The crowd laughed, and Alain's assailant relaxed his hold. Determined to give her letter as much publicity as possible, Alain had had it posted on the walls with the added statement that no true Republican would vote for the death of the unhappy offender, l'infortuné coupable whose greatest crime was to have been born at a time when philosophy was silently laying the foundation of the Republic. Confronted by so incontrovertible an argument, the anti-feminist newspaper, Les Révolutions de Paris, could only exclaim with a sneer, What business is it of hers? Let her knit trousers for our brave sans-culottes. With Olympe's feminism, with her arrest and execution, we shall deal in our last chapter. Le journalisme said the de Goncourts, using a metaphor which perhaps was less hackneyed in their day than in ours, sprang fully armed from the brains of the revolution, et sorti tout armé du cerveau de la révolution. From the very beginning French newspapers took women into account. Women contributed to them, as we have seen in the case of Madame Roland. Several papers intended specially for women were published, edited, and in some cases printed by women. The most widely circulated of these was La véritable amie de la reine, ou Journal des dames par une société de citoyennes. Then there was Le bulletin of Madame de Beaumont and L'observateur féminin, which was soon succeeded by L'étoile du matin ou Les petits mots, edited by Madame de Verte Allure, an ex-nun. There was a paper which recalls one with a similar title today, Les Annales. But Les Annales of the Revolution was devoted to education and had as a subtitle Journal de Demoiselle. It was edited by a Madame Mouret, who was said to be a descendant of La Fontaine. The market had its paper, La Gazette des Halles, owned by women and printed on La Place Maubert. Another woman's paper, this one edited by a man, was Le Courrier de Limen. Like the masculine newspaper Bouche de Fer, it invited its readers to air their grievances in its columns. Women especially were urged to give expression to any complaints they might have against the National Assembly or even against their own husbands. The paper also served as a matrimonial agency. 
It announced, for instance, that an American who had the honor to sit in the National Assembly, or its American equivalent, would like to share his fortune with a young citoyenne of Paris, even if she brought him as her dowry nothing but a good education, a charming character, and a pleasing countenance. Although he was a member of the legislative body, this American did not require his wife to hold pronounced opinions as to political parties. He would prefer her to be neither on the right nor the left, but in le juste milieu. Unfortunately, such announcements were too few, and as the newspaper depended on them, it collapsed after the appearance of forty-five numbers. Women editors did not confine themselves to women's papers. At Arras, the citoyenne Marchaud edited Le Journal du Pas de Calais. At Paris, Madame Robert helped her husband in the editorship of the chief organ of the Republican Party, Le Mercure National. Louise de Keralio, afterwards Madame Robert, was the most eminent and capable of the revolutionary woman journalists. Born in Paris in 1758, Louise was the daughter of a Breton knight, Le Chevalier Guinemont de Keralio, professor at l'école militaire, member of the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres, and editor of Le Journal des Savants. Her mother, too, was a writer, and in this literary atmosphere Louise at an early age began to earn her living by her pen. She translated English books. She wrote novels and historical works. Les Crimes des Reines de France depuis le commencement de la monarchie à Marie-Antoinette, and a history of Queen Elizabeth of England which it took her some years to complete. These books won her the honor of admission to a literary academy, that of Arras, which was presided by none other than Maximilien Robespierre. In her reception speech on the study of history, Mademoiselle de Keralio displayed those oratorical gifts which later were to win her renown in the Jacobin and Cordelier clubs. Robespierre, in his reply, made the newly elected academician his admirer for life by justifying the admission of women into literary societies. To that speech of his, Robespierre was indebted for the support he received later from the Mercure National, which, as we have said, Louise edited in collaboration with her husband, François Robert. Robert, whom Louise married in 1791, was a lawyer of Liège. The Mercure was the organ of the Republican Party which came into existence in this year, and which is said to have been founded in Madame Robert's salon in Paris. This young Republican was also a frequent visitor in another Republican salon, that of Lucille Desmoulins in la rue de l'Odéon. It was in the year of the Robert's marriage that the petition to the Constituent Assembly for the King's deposition was drawn up and presented for signature to the crowds gathered on the Champ de Mars for the Feast of the Federation on July the 17th. Though this petition was in Robert's handwriting, the staccato, direct, emphatic style, says Michelet, was much more like that of the lively Bretonist Madame Robert than of her rather heavy Flemish husband. While most of the other Republican leaders absented themselves from the Champ de Mars on that critical day, the Roberts were there, standing together on the steps of the altar of La Patrie, collecting signatures to the petition, when Bailly and Lafayette, in obedience to the orders of the monarchist National Assembly, began to fire on the crowd. The altar steps were strewn with corpses. The Roberts narrowly escaped with their lives. That evening, all the members of the little Republican Party, whether they had been present on the Champ de Mars or not, felt themselves in danger. Robespierre did not return to his lodging that night, but accepted for the first time the hospitality of one Duplay, a master cabinet maker in the Rue Saint Honoré, with whom he continued to lodge except for one brief interval for the remainder of his days. The Roberts too feared to go home. But they were less fortunate than Robespierre. They were not offered, they had to crave shelter, and it was granted them unwillingly as it transpired later by the Rolands, who were then, as we have seen, lodging in the Hôtel Britannique, Rue Guénégaud. The Rolands, not having been present on the Champ de Mars, were not in danger. Madame Roland describes the incident in her memoirs written in prison two years after the event. The caustic tone of her narrative and her dislike of the Roberts may be explained by the fact that Robert had worried Roland when he became Minister of the Interior to give him a place in the government. Madame Roland makes much of the trouble and the danger of entertaining these unwelcome guests. She complains that she had to have beds put up in her sitting-room for the two men, while she took Madame Robert into her own room. The next morning, the Roberts were in no hurry to depart, and when they did go it was only to return in showy clothes to lunch, and afterwards to disport themselves on the balcony making loud remarks on the passers-by. 
From that day until Roland became minister, his wife accuses her guests of having given no sign of gratitude or of life. Then, by clamoring for some high official post for Robert, that of ambassador at Constantinople was mentioned, they rendered themselves a nuisance to the whole government. It was unfortunate for the Rolands that while they turned a deaf ear to Robert's request, it was granted by the Rolands' worst enemy, by Danton, who made Robert his secretary. He was already a member of the National Convention. The Roberts were probably not in the least heroic. They may very likely have been just the type of adventurers with whom the sublime Madame Roland would have had least sympathy. We are not surprised to find, therefore, that while their hosts of 1791 perished, the Roberts succeeded in surviving the Revolution. In 1815, Robert was banished from France. He went to Brussels, presumably taking his wife with him, and there, when we last hear of him, he was carrying on the business of a wine merchant. Throughout the Revolution, we find women printing as well as editing and contributing to newspapers. One woman at least, Madame Colombe, was the owner of a well-known printing press. A movement was started to train women as printers. The citizen del Tufo established a school for women printers. In 1794, after it had been in existence for some time, he and his pupils presented a petition to the National Convention, asking the Assembly to give it work and to grant it an annual subsidy. To enforce his demands, Del Tufo pleaded that if women became compositors, men would be set free to practice the arts of war and agriculture, where they were badly needed. All he required of his pupils was to know how to read and write. The Assembly authorized the school to call itself Imprimerie des femmes sous les auspices de la Convention nationale, and sent a citizen called Grégoire to inspect the school. His report was highly satisfactory, and the inspector was told to confer with le Comité de salut public. The result of the conference does not appear. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 7. Women at Arms Quote, Quoique je soyons une femme, ô oh, je sentions dans notre cœur, que je pouvions comme un homme avoir tant de valeur, quand sous le brave Lafayette on est sur des lauriers, hommes, femmes, enfants, tous veulent être guerriers. La Gazette des Halles a leading French woman of today, when she was asked whether she were a feminist, i.e., whether she desired the recognition of equal rights and equal duties between men and women, she replied, As to rights, yes. As to duties, take care, lest they should imply military service, lest instead of giving life, women should take it. The women of the Revolution, far from being troubled by any such scruples, demanded the right to take life in the service of the cause to which they were devoted. When Madame Roland's friend Lantenau welcomed Terroigne to the Jacobin Club and praised passive resistance in women, not many of his feminine hearers can have agreed with him, and certainly not she whom they had met to honor, for Terroigne only a few minutes before had been advocating war as the best way to establish the revolution. Madame Roland, though she would have disapproved of women fighting, was a militarist who did not scruple to advocate even civil war. Olympe de Gouges went further and claimed women's right to wield the sword. She regretted that when women had been taught the art of kindling war, that of waging war had been denied them. Olympe, as early as 1791, announced her intention of organizing a woman's legion. The next year she attended the fête of the Federation at the head of a body of women all fully armed, and she looked for all the world like a trumpet major, said a contemporary newspaper. But neither she nor her women legionnaires, as far as we know, ever made use of their weapons. Though, once when an editor presumed to ridicule one of her pamphlets, Olympe summoned him to fight her in a duel with pistols. "'I will give you the advantage of firing first, she said, "'for I am persuaded that your trembling will make you miss me.' But this duel, like many another piece of revolutionary braggadocio, never came to pass. In one of her pamphlets, Olympe proposed that women should form themselves into a bodyguard to protect the queen. Later women did form a bodyguard to protect Robespierre, and this at a time when he was being threatened by members of their own sex, one of whom, the royalist Cécile Renaud, was accused of having tried to assassinate him. One of the first acts of the Women's Republican Revolutionary Club, on the 12th of May, 1793, 
was to send a deputation to the Jacobins to demand the arming of all patriotic women between the ages of eighteen and fifty who should be formed into a regiment to fight against the royalists in La Vendée. Pauline Léon, who, as we have seen, was the club's first president, and Tirouin de Méricourt, both attempted to form regiments of women. Tirouin had returned from her Austrian dungeon all on fire with military ardor. Barely had she received her ovation from the Jacobins than she turned her attention to the training of her sex in military prowess. Her Faubourg St. Antoine club was to have been a club of armed women. On the 25th of March, at the Club des Minimes in the St. Antoine quarter, Tirouin made one of her eloquent speeches. It was a call to arms. Open a list of Amazons, she cried. Come and drill three times a week on the Champs-Élysées. The women responded in considerable numbers. They assembled on the Place Louis XIII, where Terouin presented them with a banner. The anti-revolutionary papers did not fail to make fun of all this. One of them, Le Petit Gautier, said that in the burning heat of her military fervor, Terouin's false mustache, becoming unstuck, had fallen off and been lost. Before the end of the month, a petition signed by more than three hundred women was presented to the Legislative Assembly. Legislators, it began. Women patriots present themselves before you to claim the right of every individual to provide for the defense of his life and liberty. Everything seems to augur a violent and imminent shock. Our fathers, husbands, and brothers may perhaps fall victims to our enemy's fury. Are we to be denied the satisfaction of avenging them or of dying by their sides? After a long harangue in which the women assured their hearers that their object was not to neglect domestic duties, but merely to place themselves in a position to defend their home should the need arise, the petitioners went on to make specific demands. 1. Permission to provide themselves with pikes, pistols, swords, and even guns. 2. To meet for drill on the Champ de la Fédération, or some other suitable place on Sundays and holidays, and to nominate former French guards as their officers. Besides this petition of the three hundred, the assembly, the commune, and the clubs were constantly receiving offers of military service from individual women. These offers, like that made by Claire Lacombe when she first arrived in Paris in July 1792, were generally received with applause. But on one occasion they met with a different kind of reception. The legislators, to translate their rejoinder very roughly, practically replied, But why all this fuss? Why do you not enter the army if you want to? There are no laws to prevent you doing so. And indeed, those women who were really in earnest in their desire to fight quickly went about their business, and without any petitioning of the assembly, as we shall see later, they disguised themselves as men and entered the army, where two of them at least did valiant service. There they fought like men with masculine weapons. They scorned those fantastic feminine pikes which, with their wooden handles carved to represent a laurel branch bearing a cap of liberty, may still be seen in the Carnavalet Museum. The women who in Paris and the provinces formed themselves into regiments seem to have been mainly concerned with designing banners and elaborate uniforms, white coats with red ornaments, blue hats with white feathers and broad tricolor belts. Yet, after all this ostentation, not one of these feminine regiments ever came under fire. One woman, Manette Dupont, told the convention that she had nine hundred citizenesses disguised as men ready to set out to fight the tyrants of the nation on the frontier, and on their behalf she petitioned the convention to organize a corps of ten thousand women and girls in the Department of Paris, also to command shopkeepers to substitute women for men assistants. Manette's regiment was to bear the name Fernig, after two sisters who were then actually serving at the front. You have allowed les demoiselles Fernig to serve in Dumouriez's army, consequently you cannot refuse us, Manette pleaded. The convention had indeed not only recognized as soldiers, but had rewarded the valor of these enterprising demoiselles Fernig. It had presented them with two war horses richly caparisoned. It had decreed that the Fernigs deserved well of their country, and it had rebuilt at the government's expense their birthplace at Mortagne near Valenciennes which had been burnt to the ground by Austrian soldiers. But then the Fernig girls had gone quietly to work without any blast of trumpets and without asking permission of anyone, not even of their own father. These remarkable maidens were the daughters of Louis-Joseph de Fernig, an Alsatian nobleman born on the 3rd of October, 1735. He served with distinction in the Seven Years' War from 1755 to 62, 
and then renounced the army for literature. The friend of Voltaire, he spent a year with a philosopher at Ferney. He married a woman of Hainaut of good family and had by her five children, a son, Jean-Louis Joseph, who became a soldier, two daughters, Amy and Louise, who married young, and two younger daughters, Félicité and Théophile, with whom we are now concerned. Félicité was born in 1776, and Théophile in 1779. Their mother died soon after Théophile's birth. On the outbreak of the Revolution, M. de Fernigue returned to his old occupation and became commander of the National Guard of the Valenciennes district. In that frontier region, the inhabitants and their property were daily exposed to the ravages of war. Félicité and her sister, hardy lasses, renowned throughout the countryside as excellent horsewomen and first-rate shots, felt their martial ardor inflamed as they heard their father returning from his military expeditions, tell of the ravages committed by the Austrians. It seems to have been the news of the French defeat at Longwy in September 1792 that finally decided the youthful Mademoiselle Fernigue to don the military clothes which their brother, serving in another part of France, had left behind him, and, with the connivance of some of their friends, officers in the army, to join their father's company without his knowledge. Their disguise was apparently so complete that de Fernigue did not even recognize his own daughters when in one engagement they intervened to save his life. How long he would have remained in ignorance, it is impossible to say. But one day, General Bernonville, reviewing de Fernigue's company, espied two soldiers who seemed particularly anxious to escape his notice. This intrigued him. He called them out and questioned them. Now, at length, their disguise failed them, and their shrill voices betrayed their sex. What the commander felt when the discovery was made is unknown but he cannot have been displeased with his daughter's heroism, for he allowed them to remain in the army. Bernonville reported his discovery to his commander-in-chief, Dumouriez, who made them his aide-de-camp and bestowed such commissions on their father and brother as kept all the Fernigues together. Elles savent bien tuer leur homme, Bernonville reported to the convention. Dumouriez described them to Madame de Genlis as audacious and fearsome soldiers. They became the object of the respect and admiration of the whole army, and until April 1793 fought in all de Maurier's battles, Valmy, Jemappe, Anderlecht, and Nierwinden. The general would point them out to his soldiers as a happy augury of victory. According to Madame de Genlis, he loved to tell of the courage they displayed on more than one occasion. How Félicité was with the Duc de Chartres, afterwards Louis-Philippe, during his most perilous enterprises. How Théophile, in an engagement near Brussels, when an enemy officer summoned her to surrender, with one pistol shot stretched him at her feet. How at Jamap, when with a handful of horsemen she was attacking a Hungarian battalion, with her own hand she took prisoner and disarmed the most formidable of the grenadiers. He was so tall that even on foot, says Madame de Genlis, he towered over his captor on her horse. Incredible! though both sisters were below the average height. But Dumouriez's favorite story was of Théophile's capture of a huge Austrian, whom she led to the commander-in-chief, saying in her girlish treble, General, here is a prisoner I have brought you. The piping voice staggered the Austrian, who was furious to find that he had surrendered to a girl. When Dumouriez went over to the enemy, the devotion of the Fernig family to the general prompted them to follow him. Neither the convention nor the directory ever forgave them for this. They were considered as émigrés for the rest of their lives. The convention visited the offenses of two women in particular on women in general. On May 30th, 1793, it passed a decree banishing from camps and cantonments all women useless to the army, i.e., all who were not authorized to be there as washerwomen and vivandières. Women actually fighting were to be forbidden military service and given a passport and five sous a league to return to their homes. Though the Fernigues occasionally visited Paris and their native village of Mortagne, they were not allowed to reside in either place. The utmost the directory government would do for them was to offer them domicile in the colonies, and that they refused. Félicité married a Belgian general and settled at Brussels. Théophile did not marry. She was the most original, as well as the best-looking of the two. Madame de Genlis met her during her wanderings while she was staying at Sieck in Holland with a Monsieur de Valence, to whom Théophile was at that time secretary. 
she was then twenty-one, and, says Madame jean Lys, had the prettiest and most modest face and tiny delicate white hands. She wrote a very fine hand and knew how to spell, evidently a rare accomplishment in those days. Madame de jean Lys was charmed with her sweetness and equanimity, and one day she saw for herself evidence of that unflinching courage of which she had so often heard from her friend Dumouriez. One morning, when the men with their valets had gone out hunting, the cook rushed into the salon terrified, saying that a robber was in the kitchen doing untold damage. Straightway the sweet and gentle Théophile assumed a warlike air and seized a walking-stick, which happened to be in a corner of the room. Thus armed, the heroine of Jean Map rushed into the kitchen where the thief threw himself upon her. But Théophile and the walking-stick soon reduced the burglar to beg for mercy which he received and then, being released, he fled from the house. Mademoiselle Fernigue returned to us, says Madame de jean -Lys, as calm and natural as if she had just performed the most ordinary action. For the rest of the day I could not help looking at those pretty little hands, which could be so brave and strong in moments of danger. Théophile's letters from Amsterdam and elsewhere to a cousin, an officer in Bonaparte's army, show her to have been lively, sensible, and something of a feminist. Men, she writes, have not a shade of that delicacy of feeling of which women are capable. Then, quoting, so she says, her father's friend, Voltaire, she tells her cousin that women are never false, save when men are tyrants. This ex-Amazon was naturally an ardent admirer of the greatest of generals. To her cousin, then at Venice, she writes from Amsterdam, somewhat timidly, wondering whether she dare ask him to do something for her that she desires with all her heart. Then, taking courage, she says, I will risk it. You have seen the hero, Bonaparte. Well, this is what I want you to do, to send me in your next letter a portrait of him which is a true likeness. Here we have nothing but caricatures which are ridiculous. Although these letters reveal nothing more than a purely platonic and cousinly friendship, one wonders whether, on Théophile's part at least, there may not have been a warmer sentiment. When a wealthy husband is found for Félicité, one is also offered to the younger sister. But writes Théophile to her cousin, I feel that the heart alone should be master, that the heart alone should be consulted in so fundamental a matter, and my heart has nothing to say in favor of this suitor. At the same time she is her cousin's confidant. He tells her of his love affairs. When in the intervals between his campaigns he comes to Holland, they meet generally, but not always. In one letter Théophile writes, Vous m'avez tout bouleversé. Why and how does not appear. In January 1803, the correspondence ceases, at any rate that part of it, that has been preserved and published. In 1818, Théophile died at Brussels, where she was buried. Other women, besides the Fernigues, without any bravado, quietly took up their swords and fought. At Jemap, there were at least two other Amazons, Catherine Pochla and Dulière, both artillery women. At Lille, a widow, Mary Guillotte, was a gunneress. And when she came to Paris, the Jacobin Club invited her to sit on the President's right hand. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of the Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 8. Charlotte Corday Quote Hearts must not sink at seeing law lie dead. No, Corday, no. Else justice had not crowned in heaven thy head profaned below. Three women France hath borne, each greater far than all her men, and greater many were than any are at sword or pen. Corneille, the first among Gaul's rhymer race whose soul was free, descends from his high station, proud to trace his line in the W. S. Lander. Unlike many of the women in the last chapter, Charlotte Corday, the most self-possessed, the most determined, and the most dignified of all revolutionary armed women, kept her own counsel all too well. For that reason she needlessly sacrificed her life for her country to which, had she lived, she might have rendered valuable service. Had they only known her intention, said Charlotte's fellow politicians, they could have directed her knife to a much more profitable quarter than the heart of Marat, whom disease had already condemned to an imminent death. The angel of assassination, as Lamartine calls Charlotte Corday, 
appeals to many as one of the most striking examples of the complete heroine it seems appropriate therefore that she should number among her direct ancestors that most heroic of tragic dramatists pierre corneille charlotte was born during that seventh decade of the eighteenth century which saw the birth of nearly all the revolution heroes and heroines at ronceret in a picturesque norman farmhouse on the twenty seventh of july seventeen sixty eight marie charlotte jacqueline de corday gave birth to her fifth child her third daughter a second marie charlotte to be known among her own people and in history as charlotte her family belonged to la petite noblesse her parents were what we should call country gentry living on their own land her father jacques francois de corday knight and seigneur d'armont brought up his children in habits of the strictest economy to this youthful training are due no doubt the orderliness and attention to detail which all the records of charlotte's life reveal and which are seldom found in one of her idealist temperament she was a pretty child with glorious golden hair a dazzling complexion and good features dreamy and silent she loved to wander alone through the woods and fields which surrounded her home she was still a child when her father's resources grew so restricted that he was glad to farm out his children with more prosperous relatives a priest's uncle a worthy and cultured person highly respected in the neighborhood received charlotte and taught her to read in a precious heirloom a valuable edition of her illustrious ancestors plays thus early did charlotte drink of that well of patriotic heroism which was to remain the source of all her inspiration at the age of twelve charlotte lost her mother who died in giving birth to her sixth child and for a while the cardes lived at caen while the seigneur d'armont was conducting with his wife's relatives one of those numerous lawsuits in which la petite noblesse seems to have delighted the lawsuit was probably successful seeing that charlotte when she grew up was possessed of some small fortune which enabled her to live independently away from home je vis de mes revenus she told her judges while her father was at caen he put charlotte and her sister to school in the famous st trinity convent of the town it was a highly aristocratic institution receiving as a rule no more than five noble maidens of reduced circumstances whom the king himself nominated and it was only by means of high and powerful influence that charlotte and her sisters were admitted there charlotte spent some years and rose to occupy a position of authority in the management of the convent there she doubtless would have continued possibly becoming superior or at any rate canoness had she and her companions not been driven out when in seventeen ninety the national assembly decreed the suppression of all convents charlotte then joined her father and sisters in the country with her determined will and pronounced opinions she could not have found it easy to settle down in family life while her father and brothers were royalists and catholics charlotte was sceptical and republican i was a republican before the revolution she said to her judges always of a studious and thoughtful disposition like madame roland she had spent her girlhood in company with the heroes of greece and rome and in drinking deep of eighteenth-century philosophy plutarch's lives was her breviary and with passionate interest she was already following all the events of the revolution we are not surprised therefore to find that after a few months in the family circle she left it and returned to caen there she lived with an aged relative madame de bretteville in a set of rooms in a dilapidated old house known as le grand manoir occupying the back of a courtyard in the centre of the city that by this time charlotte had grown into a beautiful girl there is no doubt the exact colour of her hair whether her eyes were blue or grey whether she was tall or below the average height has been hotly contended perhaps the description in her passport may be taken as the surest evidence though it is by no means infallible as the recent war has proved according to this document charlotte's hair was chestnut brown her eyes grey and her height five feet one as to her manner there is no diversity of opinion all agreed that she was graceful and dignified still pensive talking little in society and on the rare occasions when she took part in conversation startling her companions by her opinions thus at a family dinner party in honour of charlotte's brother and a friend whom it was hoped she would marry both on the eve of starting to join the emigre army the king's health was proposed charlotte refused to drink it what exclaimed one of the guests you refuse to drink the health of our king who is so good and virtuous i believe him to be virtuous she replied but a weak king cannot be good for he is incapable of preventing his people's misfortunes 
but charlotte's republicanism like that of olympe de gouges did not prevent her deploring the king's execution she was by this time as we have said intensely interested in the important events going forward a diligent newspaper reader and a careful student of the hundreds of pamphlets for and against the revolution that the press was constantly pouring forth her sympathies were with the party of la gironde especially after the girondist members of the convention who had been proscribed on the thirty first of may seventeen ninety three had made charlotte's city of caen the centre of the insurrection they were trying to raise against the jacobin government buzot pition louvet barbarou and other girondins were appealing to the people of normandy to march on paris and there to overthrow the dictatorship of the convention charlotte attended all their meetings her silent enthusiasm enhanced her beauty wrote one who saw her there she wept to hear the girondins tell of the anarchy prevailing throughout her beloved france charlotte's was a practical nature no sooner had she realized the existence of an evil than her mind flew to devise remedies it seemed then that one man marat the so-called people's friend was in reality the people's enemy and cause of all their suffering marat was one of the most prolific journalists and pamphleteers of the day with his turbulent brain goaded to fury by the perpetual irritation of an agonizing skin disease in page after page each more vehement than the last he clamored for blood and for more blood all these writings charlotte read until marat became an obsession a veritable antichrist if only his pen could cease writing his brain cease devising horrors then her poor country might at length find peace this was charlotte's one idea she never paused to ask whether some other tyrant might not take marat's place she knew no conflict of emotions such as her ancestor the great corneille loved to portray no sooner had she realized that marat was a ferocious beast about to devour france with the fire of civil war than she determined to destroy him then swiftly inevitably she sped towards her tragic goal the idea first occurred to her she told her judges on the thirty first of may seventeen ninety three only seven short weeks elapsed before the deed was done during that brief space charlotte was busy making arrangements for her journey to paris there was a passport to be procured on the pretext of presenting a petition to the convention on behalf of a friend an emigre who was in great poverty in switzerland then there were introductions to people in paris who might be useful these she obtained from the girondist leaders barbarou especially she often saw she talked with him about public affairs and he gave her a letter to the deputy du perret after charlotte's death barbarou said that on her last visit something in her voice filled him with a vague foreboding he could not understand afterwards he wished he had known her design for he said if we the girondins had been capable of a crime by such a hand it was not marat we should have pointed out for vengeance but charlotte never by word or look or any sign hinted at the project she had in mind the poet andre chenier never wrote truer lines than these dedicated to charlotte sous les dehors d'une allégresse aimable dans ces détours profonds ton âme impénétrable avait tenu caché les destins du pervers it is not surprising that during those weeks madame de bretteville found charlotte more than usually preoccupied once she discovered her in tears i weep said charlotte over my country's misfortunes over those of my family and over yours for while marat lives no one can be sure of life for even a day there is a legend that one morning when madame de bretteville went into charlotte's room to awaken her she found on her bed an ancient bible open at the book of judith and at a page on which was the verse judith went forth from the city adorned with a marvellous beauty which the lord had bestowed on her to deliver israel before finally leaving caen for paris charlotte went into the country to bid her father and sisters farewell she told them she was about to emigrate to england where she had friends then returning to caen she told madame de bretteville that she was going on a sketching expedition into the country so on the ninth of july she set out carrying a small bundle of clothes a copy of plutarch's lives and a large sheet of drawing paper the last she gave to a little boy the son of one of the tenants of the house whom she met at the foot of the staircase here robert she said take this it is for you be a good boy and kiss me you will never see me again as the child kissed her 
he felt a tear upon his cheek. In the Paris diligence, Charlotte's beauty so bewitched a fellow traveller that he inquired her name and the address of her family in order that he might ask her hand in marriage. She, seized with the grim irony of the situation, promised to tell him later. It was noon on Thursday, the 11th of July, when the Caen diligence rumbled into Paris. Charlotte engaged a room at the Hôtel de la Providence, 17 Rue des Vieux-Augustins. Worn out with her journey, she went to bed at five o'clock and slept soundly until the next day, Friday, when she rose betimes and went to Duperret's house, hoping to see him and to present her letter of introduction from Barbarou. But Duperret, she was told, was at the convention and would not be home until evening. Charlotte returned to her hotel and passed the rest of the day in reading and meditation until six o'clock when she returned to Duperret's. He was at dinner, but he left the table to come and talk to Charlotte in the salon. He promised to take her the next day to Sigara, the minister of the interior, to whom she wished to speak about her friend in Switzerland. Charlotte advised Duperret to flee from Paris to Caen before the next night. Her manner, as well as her words, were mysterious, said the deputy afterwards. That very Friday evening, the possessions of Duperret, who was known to be in sympathy with the proscribed Girondin, were placed under the government seal. Nevertheless, early the next morning, Duperret kept his promise to Charlotte and took her to Garaz. They failed to see him, however, and Duperret advised Charlotte to abandon her intervention on her friend's behalf, seeing that she had no written authority to act for her. The deputy took Charlotte to her hotel and left her there. Soon afterwards, she went out to the Palais Royal. There she purchased not a dagger, as some have said, but an ordinary table-knife, for which she paid three francs. Concealing it beneath her kerchief, she sat down for a while on a stone bench in one of the colonnades. Charlotte's design had been to slay Marat in the convention. Afterwards, she fully expected to be set upon and killed by the mob. Thus she would die unknown, unrecognized, leaving no record to shame her family. Since arriving in Paris, however, she had heard that Marat was now too ill to go to the convention or even to leave his house. She must make some other plan, therefore, and thus, much against her will, she was compelled to resort to deception. So she brought herself to address a note to the man she hated, offering to give him news of the Caen insurrection. As to when and how this note was delivered, historians differ. Some say Charlotte posted it, and that it did not reach Marat until the evening, shortly before Charlotte's final and fatal visit to his house. Others, that she delivered it herself. There seems to be no doubt that she went at least twice, once in the morning and again in the evening to Marat's house, number 20, Rue des Cordeliers, now Rue de l'École de Médecine. It is equally certain that the first time she failed to gain admission. The interval, or intervals, between these calls she spent at her hotel writing an appeal to posterity, and a second letter to Marat intended to be a final appeal, and imploring him to see her on the ground that she was unfortunate, a sufferer in the cause of liberty. She also changed her frock. In the morning she had worn brown, in the evening her dress was pure white, or, according to some witnesses, of a spotted material. At any rate, she dressed with great care and, about seven o'clock, set out again to drive to the Rue des Cordeliers. Having arrived there, Charlotte stopped her coach on the opposite side of the street. Again, the concierge refused her admission. Marat, so diseased that after four years of suffering he said he would give all the dignities and honors in the world for a few days of health, lived in perpetual dread of assassination. Though there was constant coming and going in the house of the editor and proprietor of L'Ami du Peuple, none but assured friends or denouncers strongly recommended were actually admitted to the editor's presence. Charlotte, this time, refused to accept the dismissal of the concierge. Marat's mistress, Simone Evrard, came to the door, and, guessing Charlotte to be the writer of the letter Marat had just received, she went to ask him whether he would receive the visitor. He consented and Simone showed Charlotte through an antechamber into Marat's study, which was also his bathroom. There Simone withdrew, taking care to leave the door partly open so that she might hear the slightest sound. The room in which Charlotte now found herself was small and dimly lighted. Its most striking article of furniture was the slipper-bath, in which the wretched Marat spent his days and nights. Only his head, shoulders, the upper part of his chest and his right arm were visible. 
as on the last time we saw him in Madame Tallien's salon, a dirty scarf was tied round his matted hair, accentuating the receding forehead, protruding eyes, prominent cheekbones and vast sneering mouth. Only in this posture, with the greater part of his body bathed in water, could Marat endure his miserable existence. Across the bath was placed a plank which served as a writing-table. It was covered with papers, open letters and half-written articles. Beside the bath, on a large block of oak, stood a leaden inkstand. When Charlotte entered, Marat was holding his pen suspended over a half-written page, a letter he was writing to the convention demanding the prescription of the last Bourbons who remained in France. He asked Charlotte about the state of Normandy, inquired the names of the Girondist deputies who had fled to Caen, and when she gave them exclaimed, "'Well, before they are a week older, they shall have the guillotine.' At these words, Charlotte drew the knife she had bought that morning from her kerchief, and, with unerring aim, plunged it up to the handle into Marat's heart, then withdrew it. Death was almost instantaneous. Marat had only time to cry to Simone for help. Simone rushed in. She found the printer's messenger and the cook wrestling with Charlotte, who had been thrown to the ground. Simone vainly endeavored to stay the tide of blood streaming from Marat's heart with her hand. A surgeon dentist who lived in the house bandaged the wound, took Marat from the bath and put him on his bed, but his pulse had already ceased to beat. The grief of Simone and of her sister Catherine, who in a few minutes was in the room, alone among the terrible incidents that followed the assassination, threatened to deprive Charlotte of her self-possession. Hitherto she had thought of Marat as a savage monster hardly human. "'I killed one to save a thousand, she said. Now Simone's and Catherine's tears revealed her victim as a fellow creature, a man passionately loved by women. But she had barely time to reflect before the little room was full. The tidings of the murder of Marat quickly ran through the district. Neighbors flocked in, and soon they were followed by police officers and members of the Comité de Sûreté Générale. The latter there in the antechamber, while in the next room Marat's corpse was being laid out and preparations for its embalmment were being made, began Charlotte's cross-examination. Her interrogators made every effort to elicit from the accused something to show that she had acted as an agent of the persecuted Girondin. But even in that grim and horrible situation, Charlotte kept her wits about her. One of her interrogators had the effrontery to put his hand behind her fichu, expecting, he said, to find some paper to incriminate the Girondin. Charlotte's hands were bound. She could not defend herself with them, but with her body she repulsed the aggressor so forcibly that he fell back and at the same time the fastenings of her bodice gave way. The other members of the committee, horrified by their colleague's brutality, caused her hands to be set free so that she might readjust her frock. They also allowed her to put gloves on her hands beneath the chains. This terrible interrogation lasted until two o'clock on Sunday morning. Only then was it decided to convey the accused to the Abbaye prison. Crowds still surrounded the house, crying for vengeance on the assassin of the people's friend. As the door opened and Charlotte appeared, the mob rushed forward with so fierce a cry of terror that for the first and only time Charlotte's courage entirely forsook her and she fainted. When she recovered consciousness, she was astonished to find herself alive. In the Abbaye prison to which she was now conducted, the cell she occupied was that in which Madame Roland had been imprisoned only a few weeks earlier. Three days later, Charlotte was transferred to the conciergerie. There she wrote two letters. They are in the heroic style of her great ancestor, and as she no doubt intended, they have become famous. One was to Barbarou, the other to her father. In both she was obviously bent on representing herself as entirely serene. Knowing that her letters would be read by others than those to whom they were addressed, she magnified the importance of the Girondist rising. She little knew that the insurrection was already suppressed, that her own deed had been the one result of Girondist propaganda in Normandy, and that the Girondist rebels had been completely routed by the Jacobin army at Vernon. She told Barbarou that the courage of the Girondist volunteers whom she saw set out for Paris on July 8th had finally determined her to slay Marat. That which most unnerved her at the time of the assassination, she said, was the cries of the women. But, she added, he who saves his country must not pause to count the cost. To her father, Charlotte insisted that at one time she had hoped to die unknown. Yet she bore upon her person her passport, which was sufficient proof of her identity. Indeed, 
once the deed was committed she could not but be proud of it so certain was she that it marked the deliverance of her country by the substitution of peace for anarchy consequently she dates her letter the second day of the preparation of the peace and of her own imminent death she writes that her family may rejoice as they think of her at peace in the elysian fields with brutus and other heroes of antiquity she asks her father's pardon for having disposed of her life without his permission if i sought to persuade you that i was going to england it was because i hoped to remain unknown i trust that you will not be molested but you have those at caen who will protect you i have chosen as my advocate gustave doucet de ponticoulant but only for form's sake as such a deed admits of no defence adieu my dear papa i pray of you to forget me or rather to rejoice at my fate the cause is noble i kiss my sister whom i love with all my heart do not forget Corneille's line, Le crime fait la honte et non pas les chapeaux. Already regarding herself as a heroine and desiring that her memory should be perpetuated, Charlotte allowed her portrait to be painted in prison and asked the painter to send a copy of it to her family. The artist told of the close attention she paid to her toilette, that while in prison she had spent thirty-six francs on the cap she was to wear at her execution. She was methodical in all her ways. A thimble with a needle and thread were in her pocket at the time of her arrest. Before leaving Caen she had taken care to make provision for her old nurse. She had ordered presents to be sent from shops to some of her girlfriends, and had distributed among them all her books except the Plutarch, which she took with her. At her trial, before the Revolutionary Tribunal, the attempt was repeated to draw from her some confession that might prove her to have been the agent of the Girondins. Who inspired you with such bitter hatred? she was asked. I did not need any inspiration. My own hatred was strong enough. But this deed must have been suggested to you. Deeds are not well executed when they do not come from one's own heart. Again, as at the time of the assassination, the grief of Marat's mistress and sister unearthed her. She could not hear out Simon's evidence, but cut it short, exclaiming, Yes, it was I who killed him. Neither could she bear to look at the fatal knife when it was produced for her identification, and turning her head away, she said in a halting voice, Yes, I recognize it. Except for these two displays of emotion, she remained marvelously self-possessed throughout the trial. Perceiving that an officer of the National Guard was sketching her, she smilingly turned towards him in order that he might produce a better likeness. The painter Hower, who had begun her portrait earlier, was continuing it in court. After her inevitable condemnation, returning to her cell for the last hours of life that remained to her, she sent for Howard to complete his portrait and asked him to send a copy to her family. Before he had finished, the executioner's knock was heard. At the sight of the scissors and the red blouse, she turned pale and exclaimed, Already? Then glancing at the unfinished portrait, she said to the artist, Sir, I do not know how to thank you for the trouble you have taken. Taking the scissors from the executioner, she cut off a lock of her hair and gave it to the artist, saying, Sir, I thank you for what you have done for me. All I have to offer you as a proof of my gratitude is this lock of hair. When a priest entered her cell, she told him to thank those who had sent him, but she did not need his ministrations. The only sacrifices I can offer to the Eternal, she said, are the blood I have spilt and my own that I am about to shed. At seven o'clock in the evening of the 19th of July, Charlotte passed for the last time beneath the low arched doorway of the conciergerie prison and entered the tumbrel awaiting her. The crowds were so great that the journey from the prison to the Place de la Révolution took two hours. Barely had the lugubrious procession started when a thunderstorm burst over Paris. But the sky soon cleared and as the tumbrel passed over le pont neuf and down la rue saint honore the evening sun came out in all its summer splendour and transfigured in its ruddy glow the martyr's noble figure as in perfect serenity she was borne through the howling mob at the sight of the guillotine she turned pale for a moment when her head fell one of the executioner's assistants more than brutal took it up and being a devoted disciple of marat struck it there in the face of the crowd Someone said that the dead face blushed. A murmur of horror escaped from the assembled throng, which would not be satisfied until this gross offender had been imprisoned. That one so beautiful and so charming as Charlotte should have had suitors was inevitable, 
we have already mentioned the fellow traveller who, having fallen in love at first sight, wished to ask her hand in marriage. Whether she returned the affection of either of her other admirers, or whether hatred of Marat had driven every other passion from her heart, it is impossible to say. There is a story that, before leaving Caen, she had corresponded with the youth of the city, one Franklin, and had given him her portrait. Franklin joined the Girondist volunteers. He was present at the review on the 8th of July. As he and his comrades marched beneath Charlotte's balcony on that memorable Sunday, Pétion, who was near, saw her turn pale and weep. "'Do you not want them to go?' he asked, and received no reply. After Charlotte's death, Franklin withdrew to the depths of the country, where he died not long afterwards, leaving instructions that Charlotte's letters and her portrait should be buried with him in his coffin. Years later, so runs the tale, the coffin was opened and found to contain the letters and the picture. A better authenticated story is that of the young German from Mainz, Adam Lux. Lux was one of those to whom the revolution seemed to promise the millennium. He and his fellow townsmen craved for their city the honor of being included in the French Republic, and Lux was commissioned to go to Paris and lay their request before the convention. But alas, no sooner had he set foot in the French capital that his dream vanished. He found the Republic a prey to civil strife. He saw with horror a beautiful maiden, the noble apostle of freedom, condemned to sacrifice her life for the cause. Twice only did Lux actually see Charlotte, once before the Revolution Tribunal, and then on the scaffold. But that was enough. Henceforth he had no other thought than to rejoin her, as it seemed to him he might, by sharing her fate. The guillotine beneath which she had suffered became to him an altar. He too aspired to die beneath its blade. He implored the Convention to accord him that high honor. At the same time he demanded that a statue in memory of Charlotte, inscribed with the words, Greater than Brutus, should be erected to her memory on the place where she had died. So assiduously did he court death by attacks upon the Convention and the Jacobins that he was arrested and condemned. He followed Charlotte to the guillotine on the 4th of November, 1793. The story of Adam Luke's would seem to prove the truth of Michelet's saying that in Charlotte's blood a religion was founded. But the same might be said with truth of Marat's blood. For Marat's admirers were as devoted as Charlotte's and far more numerous. Among them were multitudes of women, women in Paris and in the provinces, women more especially of the revolutionary clubs. For Marat, among all the leaders of the revolution, had been most ready to make use of women. By a strange irony of fate, it was he who had proposed to arm with daggers the women of the Republican and Revolutionary Club. Les clubistes of Macon called themselves Marat's holy women, Saint Femme, and venerated Marat as a prophet. Crowds of women mingled in the funeral processions and pageants on the 16th, 18th, and 28th of July, which were so many triumphal processions in honor of Charlotte Corday's victim. The Republican and Revolutionary women claimed to have originated the idea of erecting an obelisk to Marat on la Place de la Réunion, now la Place du Carousel. Though men denied them this honor, the records of the Jacobin Club show that on the 15th of August, Pauline Léon, then president of the Saint-Eustache Club, led a deputation to the Jacobins to ask them to contribute to the obelisk. As it happened, only a temporary wooden obelisk was erected. But in the August ceremony of its inauguration, which was worthy of a more permanent memorial, women played a prominent part. Setting out in procession from their St. Eustache charnel house, they took up their places behind the historic bath, and bore on a litter the relics of their prophet, his chair, table, pen, and inkstand. These women had followed Charlotte with curses to the guillotine. For them and for others, like Olympe de Gouges, though she was not a Maratiste, Marat's assassin was an inhuman monster, a byword for infamy. Maratiste newspapers would not even allow her to have been beautiful. They described her as a hard-featured virago, whose face was covered with pimples. Her unwomanly deed dealt a heavy blow at the feminist cause, which, as we shall see, was already declining. It was no less fatal to the political party to which she belonged. She ruins us, but she teaches us how to die, cried Girondet Vergniaud in prison. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9, Part 1 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 9. Women and Religion, Part 1. Quote, La femme est bien plus qu'un pontife. Elle est symbole et religion. Michelet. In religion, as in every other department of life, the revolution was a series of experiments. At the outset, the Constituent Assembly arrogated to itself the power of determining the national religion, and other assemblies followed its example. Hence, for twelve years, from 1789 to 1801, we see the French established religion describing a complete circle. It began with the Orthodox Church of Rome as it had been constituted in 1516 by the Concordat between King Francis I and Pope Leo X. It passed through the National Church as organized by the Constituent Assembly in August 1789, the Worship of Reason, instituted by the Convention in November 1793, and the Worship of the Supreme Being inaugurated by Robespierre in May 1794. It returned to the National Christian Church as restored by the Directory in 1796, and it finally came back to the Church of Rome as established by the Concordat between Napoleon and Pope Pius VII in 1801. When the men of the Revolution required women to follow them in this feverish canter through successive phases of religious experience, from Ultramontanism to Erasianism, from Erasian Christianity to Atheism, from atheism to theism and back to Christianity again, they found some of them lagging behind in the race. Many looked back, like Lot's wife, to the country of ultramontane orthodoxy, to the old faith and the old ritual. They fainted and faltered in this giddy spiritual whirl. Not a few of them clung to the old faith. Some practiced the ancient rites in secret while outwardly conforming to the new. Many refused to recognize the priests who, having taken the oath to the Constitution, were installed by the government in the places of those who had refused it. In one parish, the constitutional priest on his arrival was met by a shower of stones from sixty women who pursued him to his presbytery. Danton's first wife, Gabrielle Charpentier, in spite of her husband's skepticism, openly remained a devout Catholic until her death in February 1793. Danton, who adored her, respected her faith, and when she went to Mass even accompanied her to the church door. The wife of the atheist Hébert was an ex-nun who, though she had availed herself of the Convention's law enabling ex-nuns and priests to marry, continued in other respects to practice her religion. Many women, though willing to be vicaresses of Bray, found it difficult to relinquish the habit of crossing themselves. One newspaper recommended that those who could not cure themselves of this superstitious practice might at least render it innocuous by mumbling as they made the sign, instead of the traditional phrase, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the words, in the name of my country, liberty, and equality. In certain towns, the authorities reproached revolutionary women with attending church more frequently than their club meetings. In the very clubs themselves, women members were known to have demanded the state's return to orthodoxy. But at the same time, other women were changing their religious opinions with startling rapidity. While at Evreux in 1791, women and men too inaugurated the celebration of the 14th of July by a solemn mass, two years later the same women were commemorating the Republican anniversary by making a public bonfire of priest vestments, missiles, croziers, and other bon dieuseries, as they would have put it. The last fuel thrown on the fire was a statue of Saint Louis. The women who most readily approved of these religious changes were those who, like Charlotte Corday, Madame Roland, Madame de Stahl, and Madame Julien, had drunk deep of eighteenth-century philosophy even before the Revolution. Was it to a juring or a non-juring priest that you confessed at Caen? The president of the Revolutionary Tribunal asked Charlotte Corday. Neither to one nor the other, she replied. I had no confessor. Though Madame Roland as a child had intended to be a nun, in early girlhood her faith had been undermined by those very works of Bossuet that had been given her to strengthen it. However favorable they were to the cause they were intended to defend, she writes, they enlightened me as to the attacks made upon that cause and taught me to call my belief in question. That was the first step. Many others were to follow before I arrived at the skepticism that was to be my final stage. After I had passed through Jansenism, Cartesianism, Stoicism, and Deism. What a long road to terminate in the patriotism which has brought me to these bonds. Elsewhere she writes of the religious ecstasy of her adolescence and of the philosophy of later years. 
This philosophy seemed as if it would forever preserve her from that tempest of passion which now in middle age threatened to overwhelm her, though she struggled against it with all the vigor of an athlete. Madame de Stahl was brought up by parents of Protestant origin on the Protestant principle of free inquiry, le libre examen, as opposed to the Catholic principle of authority. This critical spirit was among the many features of English mentality that she most admired. It was one of those sources of perfect ability, she wrote, which had existed in England for more than a century. But, as in the case of most Protestants, there were limits to the scope of Madame de Stahl's free inquiry. One principle she never questioned was the moral government of the universe. All her life long she was an ardent deist, and shortly before her death in 1818 she followed the tendency of the time and reverted to something like orthodox Christianity. That religious ideas contribute to the happiness of mankind had always been an article of her faith, and for that reason, as she expressed it, she had hesitated to deprive herself of them. Madame de Stahl devotes one chapter of her Considerations on the French Revolution to a discussion of the ecclesiastical policy of the Constituent Assembly. She thoroughly approves of the confiscation of church property, but she as thoroughly disapproves of the creation of a constitutional church. A great fault, which I think the Constituent Assembly might easily have avoided, she wrote, was the fatal invention of a constitutional clergy, to exact from priests an oath forbidden by their conscience and when they refused to persecute them by depriving them of their pension and later by deportation was to degrade those who took the oath because of the loaves and fishes that went with it. To act thus, she continues, was to substitute political for religious intolerance. Moreover, this measure resulted in alienating from Rome the clergy who enrolled themselves behind the banner of the revolution. Such priests were no good at all. Catholics would have nothing to do with them. Philosophers did not need any priests. The juring clergy were merely a kind of militia discredited in advance, who could do nothing but harm to the government they were supposed to support. Madame Julien, a devout disciple of Jean-Jacques, had subscribed to his Savoyard vicar's creed long before the Revolution. Her letters to her son in England abound with maxims culled from her master's works. One thing is certain, she writes that we are born good and rational. The scandal of the human race is that a vicious minority attracts more attention than a virtuous majority. I don't want to be a silly old mother, boring you with ethical commonplaces. I am addressing a friend, whom nature has formed within me, of the most precious elements of my being, sensibility and love of virtue. With that I have nothing to prescribe and everything to hope. Madame Julien had accepted Rousseau's philosophy and become a worshipper of the Supreme Being before Robespierre established that cult as the national religion. References to l'être suprême abound in Madame Julien's pages. Every day she prays to the Supreme Being to keep her son, in happiness and virtue, for the two are inseparable, she says. In April 1792, she writes that the wrath of the Supreme Being must have been aroused by the insolence of the aristocrats. A few weeks later she gives an interesting account of a sermon she heard preached at St. Eustache by a priest who had taken the oath to the government. I went with Mademoiselle C., she writes, to the sermon at St. Eustache. Never, no never, was the pulpit of truth more worthily occupied. The preacher's discourse, sparkling with eloquence, was on the best way to prevent civil war and to conquer our foreign enemies holding the Gospels in one hand and the Constitution in the other, with all the fire of genius he preached liberty, equality, and fraternity. The pictures he painted of the perversity of tyrants and courts, of the degradation and misery of the people, were so strikingly true that never since the beginning of the Revolution have I read anything so fine and so convincing. Sadly pathetic was the irony of the contrast he drew with consummate art between all this and a citizen king who, devoutly faithful to his oath, would walk firmly in the career of virtue, rising with the nation to the highest pinnacle of glory. There is nothing so grand in the greatest oratorical triumphs of Fléchier and Bourdaloo. Just when, in his sublimest invocation, he was calling down the thunder of divine justice on the heads of the guilty, a real clap of thunder resounded throughout the vaults of the church. Roman superstition would have interpreted this incident as signifying that Jupiter was favorable. As for us, we marveled in silence at this chance coincidence that had occurred at so appropriate a moment. 
and in our hearts we supplicated the divinity to manifest his justice and his power in a manner equally pronounced and terrible. The congregation was so delighted with the words of this worthy minister of the Supreme Being that their applause continued long and resounded on every hand. One day in the summer of 1792, on entering the church of saint germain l'Auxerrois, Madame Julien finds in the nave a superb stone tablet on which was engraved the Declaration of the Rights of Man. The sight of it, she says, redoubled her devotion, and she offered up an ardent prayer. The revolutions, protean changes of dogma, and ecclesiastical organization were accompanied by other changes in customs, festivals, the names of days and months, of streets and families, which closely affected the daily life of the people. The convention by various decrees favored the marriage of priests and of ex-nuns. Prince of the time represent ecclesiastics of both sexes hastening in multitudes to avail themselves of this new liberty. More than two thousand priests are said to have married. The first bishop to take to himself a wife was Thomas Lindet, bishop of the Eure department. He married in November 1792. On the following 23rd of September, Pontard, bishop of Dordogne, presented his wife to the convention. Taking her on to the platform, he described her as poor in fortune but rich in virtues, of the class of sans culotte in which reside frankness and amiable simplicity. Cambon, president of the assembly, greeted husband and wife with la collade fraternelle. Everywhere the revolutionary spirit thrust itself into ecclesiastical affairs, including baptisms, weddings, and burials. A drummer of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine had his baby daughter christened at his Paris church, the Church of Saint Marguerite, by the famous constitutional bishop Fauchet, whom we have already met as l'abbé Fauchet of the social circle and the Bouche de Fer newspaper. Pitio national pique were the topical names bestowed on this unhappy infant. Never would Mademoiselle P. N. P. be able to conceal her age, as some women are said to do, for a Pition national pique could only have been born in the year 1792, when Pition was mayor of Paris, and in the summer of that year when the mayor, at the height of a popularity he was soon to lose, was introducing the proletariat, armed with pikes, into the hitherto middle-class National Guard. The metallic element in the baby's name received visible expression after the christening when women of the Faubourg, armed with swords, formed them into an arch of metal over the head of the newly baptized infant, while loud cries of, Long live the nation, resounded throughout the church. But by that time certain leaders of the revolution were ceasing to have their children baptized at all. Camille Desmoulins set the example. For this reason, and also because it affords many striking illustrations of the emotional and religious side of the revolution, the romantic story of Camille and Lucille des Moulins belongs to this chapter. In December 1790 at Saint-Sulpice, and according to the rites of the Catholic Church, Camille had married the pretty, bewitching Lucille du Plessis. But when in the next year their son Horace was born, his father took him to the mairie to be registered instead of to the church to be christened. Poor little Horace de Moulin, of whom Madame Guillotine was soon to make an orphan, was the first Parisian child to have his name inscribed on the newly established civic register, which was to replace the parish registers. The father of Horace could not let slip this opportunity of preaching the gospel according to the revolution. Hence, after his son's name, Camille wrote in the register the following proposal. Seeing that liberty of worship has been decreed by the Constitution, and that by a decree of the Legislative Assembly the civic status of citizens may be declared otherwise than by religious ceremonies, there ought to be raised in every municipality an altar on which the father, assisted by two witnesses, shall offer his children to la patrie. Then Camille goes on to justify his own action in dispensing with a religious ceremony. It is in order that when he grows up his son may not reproach his father with having associated him by oath with religious opinions which could not possibly have been his, and with having on his entrance into the world forced him to distinguish between the nine hundred and odd religions which divide mankind, at a time when he, the infant, was not even capable of distinguishing his own mother. At length the mother is mentioned. One had wondered when she was coming in. But Camille's ignoring of her hitherto may be excused by the fact that these dedicatory or registration ceremonies took place so soon after birth that the mother was never able to be present. Lucille de Moulin was far too charming a person to be ignored either by her husband or his friends. L'éternelle rieuse, someone had called her. 
but in those sad days tears were never far behind laughter, and so it was with Lucille. She was like an April day, all showers and sunshine. Among the charming and heroic ladies of that time, Michelet admires most Madame des Moulins and Madame de Condorcet. Men of future ages, he prophesies, will regret not having known them. Even the de Goncourts, who failed to see any attractiveness in revolutionary women, made an exception for Lucille. Pauvre Grisette, they called her, égarée et perdue en cette époque sanglante, figure petite mais amiable, qui sourit, pleure et meurt. The term Grisette is misleading. Lucille belonged to an honest family of la petite bourgeoisie and brought her husband a certain fortune. The Desmoulins love story is an idol. Camille, the journalist, the hero of the Palais Royal, fell in love with Lucille and her no less beautiful mother when he saw them walking one day in the Luxembourg Gardens. He obtained an introduction to them, was invited to their flat in the Rue de Tournon, and to their country house at bourg la reine During these visits Camille soon discovered that it was Lucille who had conquered his heart. But he was then only a poor journalist, and Monsieur Duplessis would not hear of him as a husband for his daughter. The lovers waited for some years. Camille had influential friends. Robespierre had been his schoolfellow. His ability as a journalist attracted the Marquis de Sillery and the Duc d'Orléans himself. They interceded for him with Duplessis. Before such powerful pleading, even the obduracy of Lucille's father gave way, and on the 29th of December, 1790, she was married to Camille. The Duc d'Orléans furnished their flat in la rue de l'Odéon and the witnesses of the marriage were five of the most prominent politicians of the day, Pétion, Brissot, Mercier, Sillery, and Robespierre. Lucille's tea-parties in the rue de l'Odéon soon became the centre of all that was lively, gay, and witty on the left bank. The clever Mademoiselle de Keralio helped the pretty young hostess at the tea-table. The Dantons were frequent guests. Le Duc d'Orléans was sometimes present and for a while all seemed sunshine and laughter. But baby Horace was only a few months old when the horrors of the revolution began to cast a shadow over this charming home. The evening of the ninth of August, 1792, before the second attack on the Tuileries, Lucille spent at the Danton's. Danton was very resolute, wrote Lucille afterwards. I laughed like a madwoman. They were afraid the affair, the attack on the Tuileries of the tenth, would not come off. How can you laugh like that? said Madame Danton. Alas, said I, it only means I shall shed many tears before the evening is over. The night was fine, we went out. There were a great many people in the streets. A group of sans-culottes went by crying, Long live the nation! Then soldiers on horseback. A shiver came over me, and I said to Madame Danton, Let us go in. She laughed at my timidity. Then, as I continued to be nervous, she also became afraid. I said to her mother, You will hear the tocsin sounding before long. At the house people were trooping in. Camille, my dear Camille, came in with a gun. My God! I ran into the alcove and hid my face in my hands and began to cry. Still, ashamed of appearing so weak, I would not openly tell Camille how I hoped he would keep out of it all. But I waited for an opportunity to confide my fears to him without being heard. He tried to reassure me by saying he would keep with Danton. I heard afterwards that he had run great risks. I hid in the unlighted salon in order to be away from the preparations. Our patriots set out. When towards midnight the tocsin sounded from the tower of the Cordelier Church, Lucille knelt at the window, hid her face in her handkerchief, and listened. From time to time people came in bringing good news or bad. At one o'clock Camille returned. He fell asleep on my shoulder, writes his wife. Madame Danton seemed to expect to hear of her husband's death. She listened, grew pale, and then fainted. Oh, my poor Camille, cries Lucille at the close of her narrative. What will become of us? My God, if there be a God, save the men who are worthy of thee. We long to be free, but how terrible is the cost! Many a time throughout the months of terror that remained to her did Lucille cry to the God whose existence she doubted. If thou does exist, she prays, receive the offering of a heart that loves thee. Enlighten my soul. 
I hate the world. Is that wrong? Why dost thou allow it to be so wicked? Oh, my God, when can I, gazing upon thy glory, prostrate myself at thy feet, and bathe them with my tears? I adore thee without understanding thee. I pray to thee without knowing thee. Thou art in my heart. I feel it, yet I divine thee not. Thou art the secret of nature. This happiness that we seek, where can we find it? No, happiness is not to be found in this world. In vain do we pursue it. Happiness is but an empty dream. In these tempestuous days the emotions of trust and despair, of gaiety and anguish, succeeded one another rapidly in Lucille's simple, childlike breast. When, towards the end of 1793, Camille had dared to oppose his former schoolfellow Robespierre in his thirst for blood, and to propose the institution of a committee of clemency, his wife courageously supported him. At lunch one day, a friend tried to dissuade Camille from pursuing his perilous course. Lucille rose, went round to her husband, kissed him, and said, Let him alone. Let him fulfill his mission. He will save France and any one who disagrees with me shall not have any of my chocolate. Camille was arrested at the same time as his friend Danton and imprisoned in the Luxembourg. Then Lucille joined the throng of women, children, and old men who waited daily hour after hour on the broad walk leading to the prison, hoping for a sight of some beloved face through the grated windows. The language of flowers much studied at that time was used by these faithful watchers. One would hold up a posy of pansies or some other flower, the special significance of which would have been communicated to the prisoner by a bribed warder. In this way the captives learned news of the outside world. Thus was a woman prisoner told that her husband was dead by a friend outside in the park holding up a bunch of scabias, symbol of widowhood. Camille's cell looked on the garden where, as he wrote to Lucille, I spent eight years of my life following you. There is one peep over the Luxembourg that brings back to my memory a host of recollections of our love. I am in solitary confinement, but never in thought and imagination have I been nearer to you, to your mother, and to our little Horace. I only write you this first little note to ask for the most necessary things, but I shall spend all my time in prison writing to you. Camille fulfilled his promise and the letters that followed are all as full as the first of passionate love for his wife and child. But Camille's imprisonment was short. Arrested on the night of the 30th to 31st of March, 1794, he was executed on the 5th of April, having first been removed to la Conciergerie. Five days later his wife followed him to the scaffold. She had been arrested on the ill-founded charge of plotting to deliver her husband and other captives from prison. Camille, the impulsive, effervescent journalist, whose nervous temperament betrayed itself by a stammering in his speech which he could never overcome, this excitable Camille completely lost control of himself on the way to the guillotine. He struggled to loosen his bonds. He hurled down curses on the convention and its dictator, Robespierre, until Danton, who was with him in the tumbrel, adjured him to be calm and to ignore the vile rabble, said ville canaille. Lucille had seemed as excitable as her husband as long as they were together, but once he was dead her effervescence subsided. At her trial she appeared indifferent to all that was going on around her. La femme Camille, said an eyewitness, overwhelmed, doubtless, by the atrocity of her judges, did not raise her eyes, did not betray either hope or fear, but meekly awaited her sentence. I venture to question the cause which this eyewitness assigned for Lucille's calmness. He may not have possessed that knowledge of her previous life and character with which abundant documents have equipped the judgment of posterity. We now see her to have been not only l'éternelle rieuse, but l'éternelle amoureuse. She was one of the few Frenchwomen in whose heart the passion of love beat more powerfully than that of maternal affection. Their little Horace, both these lovers, Camille and Lucille, were content to leave to his grandmother. Camille refers to him frequently in the letters he wrote to his wife from prison. But after the paroxysms of that last fatal ride, his final word was of Lucille. My wife, my beloved, I shall never see you again. But Camille's ordeal had been infinitely harder than Lucille's. He had been called upon to leave her behind. When Lucille died, Camille having gone, 
life had for her been shorn of all attractiveness and meaning. Camille, in his last letter to her from prison, had tried to inspire her with a consolation which can hardly have been his in face of his last words on the scaffold. Yet, in his desire to comfort Lucille, he had written to her, I believe in God, and in a future life. Those words, treasured in Lucille's heart, rendered her indifferent to all earthly affairs, caused her to look to Mère Guillotine, as the deliverer inspired the last little note she wrote to her mother. Good night, dear Mamma. I shed a tear. It is for you. I shall fall asleep in the calm of innocence. On her way to the scaffold she was perfectly serene. Comme elle est belle! exclaimed the crowds who followed her on her last journey. There was one member of the convention to whom Lucille and her mother had looked to save Camille. That was Robespierre. As we have seen, he and Camille had been schoolfellows. Before her marriage to Camille, Robespierre is said to have been in love with Lucille. Their engagement had been talked of. After Camille's arrest, Lucille had written entreating Robespierre to save her husband. Whether the letter ever reached the sea-green monster, those who have tried to whitewash him suggested out. It is certainly doubtful whether Robespierre received the following letter written by Madame du Plessis asking him to save her daughter. Citizen Robespierre, is it not enough to have assassinated your best friend? Do you now thirst after his wife's blood? Your monster of a Fouquier-Tinville has just signed the order for her to be taken to the scaffold. In two hours she will have ceased to exist. Robespierre, if you are not a tiger in human form, if Camille's blood has not intoxicated you so as to deprive you of your reason, if you remember the evening spent in our home— the caresses you lavished upon little Horace when you held him on your knee, if you remember that you were to have been my son-in-law, spare an innocent victim. But if yours is the lion's fury, then come and take us also. Adèle and Horace, come and tear us to pieces with hands still stained with Camille's blood. Come, come, let one grave bury us all. Whether Robespierre ever received that letter or not was all one for there was nothing in the purely human sentiments it expressed to appeal to the heart, if he had one, or to the intelligence of this superman. His was the cold, unflinching cruelty of the idealist. No personal considerations that interfered with the pursuance of his convictions were ever allowed to weigh with him for a single moment. However, he had believed he could save France. But in the spring of 1794 doubt began to assail him. His dictatorship had for some months been threatened. This opposition came from two directions, from the moderate party led by Danton and Desmoulins, and from the ultra-terrorists led by Hébert and Chaumette. The two latter had been guillotined on the 24th of March. Hébert's widow, the ex-nun, suffered the death penalty at the same time as Lucille. Not even Madame Hébert's Catholicism saved her, though one might have thought it would have placated Robespierre. He could certainly not have included her in the accusation he was bringing against her husband and his followers of going too far in the dechristianization of France. End of chapter 9, part 1《Chapter 9, part 2 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Women and Religion, part 2. To trace the progress of this anti-Christian movement, this rise of the new religion of civisme, which women professed as well as men, we must go back to the summer of 1791 when, as we have seen, Camille de Moulin had taken his newborn son to the mairie. Camille's proposal, written in the register on that day, had been adopted by the Constituent Assembly. The Assembly had decreed that throughout France, in every commune, an altar to la patrie should be erected in the room in which marriages were celebrated and births and deaths registered. Thus, says Michelet, the three most solemn moments of human destiny were consecrated at the altar of the commune, and the religion of the family was blended with that of la patrie. The world has almost forgotten that Joseph Fouché, chief of police, millionaire and duke of Otranto under Napoleon, had once been distinguished for his civic piety after the new model. Yet he had carried on a veritable dragonade in the department of Nièvre, whither the convention had sent him to superintend the administration of the law against suspected persons. By Fouché's orders, churches were stripped of their ornaments, priests imprisoned, 
all the insignia of Christianity obliterated, and the gate of every cemetery inscribed with the words, La mort est un sommeil éternel. When on the 10th of August, 1793, Madame Fouché gave birth to a son at Nevers, the father himself at the municipal altar dedicated the child to La Patrie, and gave him the name of Nièvre. The altar had been set up on a vast plain outside the town. On it burned the sacred fire of Vesta, and nearby was the Temple of Love for the celebration of marriages. Some marriages were made without any public ceremony whatever. One was the marriage, for the couple themselves and their families considered it as such, of Jean-Paul Marat and Simone Ebrard. On a beautiful day Marat took Simone by the hand, and together they knelt in the sunlight, while Marat called the heavens to witness that he would never take to himself another wife. After Marat's death, the following engagement was found among his papers. The admirable qualities of Mademoiselle Simone Evrard, it ran, having captivated my heart whose homage she has accepted, I leave to her as the pledge of my fidelity during the journey I am about to take to London, my plighted troth to give her my hand immediately on my return. If all my affection should not seem to her a sufficient guarantee of my fidelity, let this engagement be forgotten and let me be covered with infamy. At Paris, the 1st of January, 1792, signed, Jean-Paul Marat, the friend of the people. Here again, and in the next chapter, we find Marat dignified and honorable in his attitude towards women. Simone, young, well-educated, and intelligent, was far from being, as she is depicted by Carlyle and other historians, a low creature, a squalid washerwoman. She had admired the patriotism and fire of Marat's writings before she knew him. Like Charlotte Corday, only with a very different intention, she went to visit the people's friend. She found him worried by financial affairs, about to give up the publication of his famous newspaper, L'Ami du Peuple, and to go to England, there to return to the medical profession on which he had practiced in England some years previously. Simone, inspired with that patriotic zeal which inflamed so many women of the Revolution, at once and unreservedly placed all her modest fortune at Marat's disposal. Marat still went to England, apparently, but only for a brief visit. On his return he accepted Simone's money and used it to establish printing works, the manager of which married Simone's sister, Catherine. Both before and after Marat's death, his family treated Simone as his wife. She and Marat's sister, Albertine, lived in Paris together until Albertine's death, which Simone survived many years. By the summer of 1793, when Marat was assassinated, the apostles of the new civisme were finding it necessary to make some concession to those anthropomorphic obsessions which, from the earliest animism down to the present day, have ever tinged the religious conceptions of mankind. Parisians of the 18th century, like Galileans of old, looked for a sign. And the founders of the new religion did not withhold it. Hébert and Chaumette, so soon to share the fate of other founders of religions, not satisfied with erecting on the ruins of the Bastille a colossal female statue of liberty, resolved to give their adherents a living symbol. Pas une statue morte, said Hébert, mais une image vivante de cette divinité, un chef d'œuvre de la nature, said Chaumette. So Chaumette, that arch-anti-feminist be it noticed, took woman from the domestic hearth, the place to which on other occasions he was always relegating her, and brought her out into the churches now called the Temples of Reason. There he put her on a pedestal, exhibited her as the goddess of reason, and exposed her to such insults that one goddess of reason in a Norman town is said to have worn inscribed on her Phrygian cap the words, Ne me tournez pas en licence. In November and December 1793, throughout Paris and the provinces, feasts of reason inaugurated the new religion. The most impressive of all was that held at Paris, in the Cathedral Church of Notre-Dame on the 10th of November. "'Ah, what a fine festival we celebrated last decade!' cried Hébert in his newspaper, Le Père du Chêne. In the place of the altar, or rather of the boards on which the charlatans, the clergy, had performed, the throne of liberty had been set up. A charming woman, as beautiful as the goddess she represented, was seated on in eminence. In her hand a pike— on her head, the red cap. Around her were all les jolies damnées de l'opéra, singing patriotic hymns more sweetly than angels. Above the white-robed goddess with her mantle of blue and her red headdress, on the top of the mountain, as it was called, 
was a little round classical temple with the words a la philosophie inscribed in large letters right across its façade and on each side of the door were busts probably intended to represent voltaire rousseau franklin and montesquieu beneath the goddess and halfway up the mountain the flame of truth burned brightly on a little classical altar behind and around this eminence draperies hanging from the pillars completely concealed the ecclesiastical character of the building music played by the national guard opened the ceremony meanwhile processions of young girls in white wearing wreaths of flowers on their heads and tricolor sashes and bearing torches came forth from the left and right of the temple they passed each other before the altar bowed and then reascended the mountain and disappeared then the goddess on her throne received the homage of the republicans present who with arms outstretched sang to go sex music marie joseph chenier's famous hymn composed for the occasion descend o liberté fille de la nature le peuple a reconquis son pouvoir immortel sur les pompeux débris de l'antique imposture ses mains relèvent ton hôtel venez vainqueur des rois l'europe vous contemple venez sur les faux dieux étendez vos succès toi sainte liberté viens habiter ce temple sois la déesse des français as the last lines of the hymn died away the goddess rose and ascending the mountain was about to enter the temple when she paused on the threshold to cast one glance over the vast congregation as she disappeared through the temple door enthusiastic applause mingled with oaths of eternal fidelity to reason burst forth from the assembled throng the organizers of the feast of reason had been disappointed in their hope that the members of the convention would have attended in a body as the convention had not come to reason reason must go to the convention accordingly as soon as the ceremony at notre dame was over the goddess escorted by an imposing procession proceeded to the tuileries where the convention was then sitting at the head of the procession marched a company of musicians and a band of young republican soldiers singing patriotic hymns with refrains and choruses in which the onlookers joined next came the maidens in white and then the goddess seated on her throne which was borne by four citizens this group having entered the assembly hall paused in front of the president the maidens formed a circle round the throne while the rest of the procession defiled past repeating the hymns they had sung at the cathedral what could the convention do now but join in the movement and vote that henceforth notre dame should be the temple of reason deputy rome proposed that the goddess should take her place at the president's side chaumette conducted her on to the platform the president and his secretaries greeted her with a fraternal kiss amidst great applause then the members of the convention escorted her back to notre dame where the ceremony that had been performed earlier in the day was repeated in their honor who was this parisian goddess of reason carlyle says it was mademoiselle candeille michelet mademoiselle maillard another actress others would have it to be claire lacombe others madame momoreau others again mademoiselle aubry also an actress later authorities are content to confess that they did not know although they believe it to have been one of the actresses from the opera madame montmoreau the wife of the famous bookseller and printer may have been the goddess at saint sulpice or at saint andre des arts or at saint eustache or perhaps at all three it would seem highly probable that the handsome claire lacombe personated reason in one or other of the parisian churches for she was as we shall see closely associated with the political party of les enragés the ultra terrorists to which the inaugurators of the new religion hebert and chaumette belonged as to the provincial goddesses of reason to identify them with certainty is no easier than to identify the parisian goddesses they were not infrequently we are told members of respectable families and we trust well chaperoned because in some places the worship of reason showed a tendency to degenerate into something not unlike saturnalia this aspect of the new cult added to its negation of theism and the fact that its inaugurators were his political foes provoked robespierre against it much has been written of robespierre's attitude towards women whether he was so cold as some have maintained who can tell he would appear not to have been insusceptible to the charms of lucille desmoulins there is the much questioned story of his betrothal to eleonore duplay daughter of the master cabinet-maker at whose house in the rue st honore he lodged 
The Duchesse de Brantes used to tell that when a beautiful woman went to plead with Robespierre for her husband's release, as soon as she had gone the incorruptible turned to his companion, saying, Do you know that woman is pretty, but very pretty? As to women's attitude towards Robespierre, there is little doubt. They either hated him as a tyrant, like the young royalist girl Cécile Renaud, or they worshipped him as a prophet. The cult of Robespierre was even more widely spread among women than the cult of Marat. On the days when he was to speak, women crowded into the galleries of the convention and applauded loudly. Les Tricoteuses de Robespierre, they were called. As far back as 1792, Condorcet, writing in La Chronique de Paris on the 9th of November, wonders why Robespierre always and everywhere at his house, at the Jacobins, at the Cordelier, at the convention, is followed by so many women. It must be, says Condorcet, that Robespierre has founded a kind of sect. He is a priest who has his devote. Obviously, Robespierre's power lies with the distaff. Toute sa puissance est en quenouille. Thus a patriotic song of 1793 runs. Suivi de sa devote et de sa cour entourée, le dieu des sans-culottes Robespierre est entré. Women wrote to him declaring he was Messiah. Some beheld in the sky the constellation Robespierre. Others wore his image round their necks as a charm. The very aloofness of Robespierre towards women, as well as his eloquence and his power, would suffice to attract many. Moreover, he might be considered good-looking, despite his bilious sea-green appearance, and he always dressed with great care. "'What a man is this Robespierre with all these women!' cried one. "'Why, he is a priest who wishes to become God!' And, as a god, one woman at least, unfortunately for Robespierre, would seem to have regarded him. This was Catherine Théo, a spinster of over eighty, who considered herself to be the mother of God and Robespierre her son, or at least so Robespierre's enemies alleged. Of humble origin, she was born at Avranches and received little education. She knew how to read, but could not write, and when she grew up she entered domestic service. Her religious mania, for it was nothing short of that, began to develop when she became servant in the convent of La Miriamion at Paris. There she communicated every day, and for eighteen years, neither in summer nor in winter did she ever miss five o'clock mass. Meanwhile, she lost no opportunity of mortifying her body by wearing garters and bracelets with sharp iron points, for example. Then she fell to reading the lives of St. Teresa and St. Catherine of Siena. They proved fatal to the fleeting remnants of her reason, and now she became absolutely deranged. Henceforth, she believed herself the mother or perhaps the bride of Christ. While the majority of priests discreetly avoided her, there were a few who were inclined to regard her as a prophetess. One of these was a constitutional priest, the Carthusian monk, Dongel, who was a member of the Constituent Assembly. He and the fanatical Duchesse de Bourbon, Egalité's sister, sat at Catherine's feet and formed the nucleus of a sect of mystics who soon gathered round her. At their meetings, the scribe, Michael Hastain, wrote down Catherine's prophecies, which were generally concerned with the second coming of Christ. But, as they also predicted political happenings, Catherine, one day in December 1779, found herself lodged in the Bastille. There she was kept for five weeks, then sent to a lunatic asylum for three years. In 1782, being pronounced sane, she was liberated and for a while was cured of prophesying but the revolution again upset her. It seemed to her the fulfillment of all her predictions. Her hallucinations returned. She resumed her séances, first at the house of one of her numerous friends, Widow Godefroy, in la rue des Rosières in the district known as Le Marais, and later near the Panthéon in la rue Contrescarpe. Chaumette, when he became procureur of the commune, kept these meetings under observation. His spy, Senard, attended them regularly. He described them as liturgical in character. At one end of the room, he said, was a platform on which was Catherine Théo seated in an armchair. On one side of her sat Dongel, on the other Widow Godefroy. The latter was the interpreter. To the faithful brethren and sisters, as they called one another, who were seated on chairs some little distance from the platform, Madame Godefroy expounded the Gospels and the Apocalypse. Dongel preached the sermon and at intervals another woman intoned the psalms. Catherine's part was to perform certain initiatory rites which, however, were only introduced towards the end of 1793. 
the neophyte knelt before the prophetess while her interpreter clasped his head in her hands and said you are about to receive the seven seals of the light of god then catherine herself bestowed on her disciple seven kisses one on forehead left cheek and both eyes two on the chin and one behind the right ear initiatress and initiated mutually signed one another on the face with the cross and kissed one another twice on the lips one neurotic girl could with difficulty be torn away from these embraces when catherine's followers were ill they came to her for healing and she is said to have cured them of leprosy blindness lameness paralysis and other maladies soldiers starting for the front came to catherine for her blessing as a charm against death lovers thought she could secure them success in love one disciple said he had seen the divinity in a white robe conversing with his prophetess another that heralded by a flash of lightning he had beheld god entering her house it is not surprising that in the height of the terror when suspicion ran riot these seances were held to have a political meaning already on the fifteenth of january seventeen ninety three the commune had ordered a raid on catherine's house at four o'clock in the morning three police inspectors had entered and carried off a bundle of papers but they must have been disappointed to find that this packet contained nothing more compromising than catherine's wild vaticinations and comments on texts of the bible which she had dictated to hastaine the prophecies contained only two political allusions and these could not have offended the most squeamish republican for they referred to the revolution as having been foreordained through the centuries and anathematized all non-juring priests some of catherine's comments on holy writ were not without a faint glimmering of common sense thus dealing with the first chapter of genesis and the text that in the beginning god created man in his own image she exclaims and i catherine theo who speak to you declare that god has not yet finished this work that at present he is only at the sixth day and that you are as yet not in his image at all but in the womb of corrupt nature despite the failure of this raid to discover any political plot at la rue de contrescarpe the suspicious authorities were by no means convinced of its non-existence the mystics were closely watched first by the spies of chaumette and after his death by those of vadier a leading member of the committee de sûreté générale and the sworn foe of robespierre by the summer of seventeen ninety four a feud had declared itself between the two great revolutionary committees vadier's sûreté générale and le salut public supported by robespierre vadier conceived the idea of using the poor demented catherine and her infatuated followers in his attack on robespierre what were the precise relations between maximilien and catherine will probably never be known she may have introduced him by some flattering allusion into her wild prophecies and robespierre puffed up with vanity and accustomed to being addressed by women as a demigod may not have objected one coincidence has not i think so far been pointed out that catherine resumed her prophesyings after the outbreak of the revolution in a house in the marais and that she and robespierre were then neighbors michelet suggests that robespierre removed the theodosie from the police archives however that may be he did not perhaps he could not intervened to prevent the arrest on the fifteenth of june seventeen ninety four of catherine and dongel on a charge of conspiring against the republic the absurd letter from catherine to robespierre hailing him as her son the promised messiah which vadier said was found in the house at la rue contrescarpe when catherine was arrested has been proved a forgery vadier was not incapable of forging the letter and having it concealed in the house by one of his subordinates at that time however this letter was held to be genuine and vadier used it in the convention to hold up robespierre to that ridicule to which all frenchmen are so exquisitely sensitive this happened at a most unfortunate moment for robespierre for it was just at a time when the tide that was to overwhelm him on the ninth of thermidor july twenty seventh was turning against him after a few months poor old catherine died in prison in september seventeen ninety four dongel was released during the directory le temps était au fanatisme says michelet catherine theo was by no means the only woman mystic of her day there were prophetesses everywhere some claimed to have restored the dead to life one near lyon is said to have gathered round her no less than a hundred thousand persons with pilgrim staves in their hands ready to follow her they knew not whither another of these prophetesses with whom robespierre's name also became associated was suzette labrousse 
she was born near vauxin in perigord on the eighth of may seventeen forty seven her childhood was passed in fits of ecstasy she could never look at a crucifix without bursting into tears in extreme youth she believed herself divinely called to become a saint and a prophetess she was a pretty girl but the admiration her good looks excited annoyed her so much that she endeavoured with incomplete success apparently to destroy her complexion by rubbing quick lime over her face at night indeed suzanne like catherine was ingenious in inventing punishments for her poor body she wore a hair shirt tried to poison herself by eating spiders mixed gall with her food and slept on pebbles like joan of arc she heard heavenly voices they bade her reform the church and drag down the mighty from their seats as early as seventeen seventy nine she prophesied that the pope would lose his temporal power the french clergy their property and that peace would reign among nations it is hardly surprising that much to her annoyance the clergy of her native province refused to take her seriously the credulous dongel however heard of her prophecies among which so he used to say was a prediction that he would one day sit in the assembly of the states-general the fanatical monk determined not to lose sight of so promising a fellow mystic he remained in constant correspondence with la brousse until the outbreak of the revolution after the establishment of the national church by the constituent assembly the juring priests whose attention had been called to suzette's prophecies by dongel began to take an interest in her one of them pontard bishop of the dordogne department encouraged her to go to paris she went tramping barefoot all the way from perigord at paris in seventeen ninety one the duchesse de bourbon ever on the lookout for curiosities in the way of religion received suzette into her house and introduced her to a number of juring priests and bishops among whom were the famous fauchet and desbois bishop of amiens to the robust sense of fauchet and desbois she was a lunatic but pontard and others continued to believe in her in the following year the bishop of dordogne founded a newspaper entitled le journal prophétique which contained little besides the predictions of la pitonesse perigourdine as the editor styled her meanwhile suzette's voices were telling her to go to rome there to deal faithfully with the holy father she had already so she said long afterwards entered into communication with robespierre who had confided to her that one day he would be compelled to restore the religion he was then striving to destroy and on that day he would look to suzette to help him though no credence can be attached to such a story there seems little doubt that in seventeen ninety two the constitutional clergy did actually entertain a hope that la brousse might be able to persuade the pope to give his sanction to the lately established national church with the object of inquiring into the matter seven constitutional bishops assembled on the nineteenth of february seventeen ninety two and summoned suzette before them she came accompanied of course by her hostess the duchesse de bourbon and equally of course intent on displaying her prophetical gifts before so august an assembly of the constitutional hierarchy she predicted the resurrection of the dauphin louis the sixteenth eldest son who had died at the beginning of the revolution and of mirabeau on being asked when the resurrections would take place she replied soon when urged to be more explicit she was wisely silent on the inquiry as to whether it would be within three or four months she equivocally nodded her head not even such marvels availed to remove the doubts of fauchet and desbois but the remaining prelates were unanimous in deciding to appoint la brousse to their ambassador to the holy see before starting on her mission she took holy communion at the church of les filles saint thomas again accompanied by la duchesse de bourbon on her way to rome suzette preached in churches clubs and by the roadside addressing her audiences as friends and brethren in the manner of the orators of the jacobin club at bologna after undergoing a cross-examination by the papal legate she was driven from the town at viterbo she was arrested consequently it was as a prisoner that she finally reached rome and the castle of st angelo which was to be her abode for the next six years the directory demanded her release in vain not until the french troops occupied rome in seventeen ninety eight did she regain her freedom then at length the exile returned to france and to paris only to find that le temps n'était plus au fanatisme and that the only course open to a prophetess was to subside into obscurity especially after the year seventeen ninety nine which she had predicted was to see the end of the world suzette lived on until eighteen twenty one 
On her death, she left Pontal her executor and the sole legatee of her little fortune of three thousand francs. Suzette's family disputed the will, but apparently without success. Pontal, who had been diligent in publishing his friend's writings during her lifetime, an edition of her collected works, chiefly prophecies, had appeared at Bordeaux in 1797, does not appear to have published anything after her death. But, as we have said, le temps n'était plus au fanatisme. We have seen in this chapter many types of feminine religious mentality, ranging from the Protestant Madame de Stahl, the philosophic Madame Roland, the doubting Lucille des Moulins, to the credulous Duchesse de Bourbon and the hysterical fanatics Catherine Théo and Suzette Labrousse. But in all their divergencies, these varying types are united by one common bond, by one passionate sentiment which amounted to a religion, love of their native land. This was the sentiment that possessed revolutionary women as well as men, Christians, deists, atheists, all alike. The revolution, like every other great movement, had its self-seekers, its miserable speculators and profiteers, and persons bent only on their own personal advancement. But the names of these egoists are not those which are most remembered. The leading women in this book, even the two poor hallucinated women whose stories we have just told, had a sense of national solidarity. Many of the women, like their masculine fellow workers, made hideous blunders. They allowed themselves to be blinded by suspicion and some of them committed serious crimes against humanity. But they did it all in the cause they believed to be their countries. They deserved to be called patriots, and this was the title of all others that they honored most. They had at last reached one stage in the road that leads to ideals wider and nobler than many of them even imagined. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10, Part 1 of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 10. The Rise and Fall of the Woman's Party, Part 1. Quote, Though few, we hold a promise for the race that was not at our rising. You are free to win brave mates. You lose but marionettes. He who's for us, for him are we. George Meredith. Hitherto we have seen the women of the revolution battling for progress in general, either side by side with men or apart in their own separate fields. We have seen men politicians making use of women in various ways to further the general cause of the revolution. But we should have a false impression of the women of the revolution were we to think of them as so completely occupied with the common wheel as to be indifferent to the wheel of their own sex in particular. Though the word feminism was not coined until after the revolution, women's struggle for emancipation went on through the revolution and had begun long before it. From the Middle Ages onwards there had been feminists in France. Christine de Pizan, Marguerite de Valois, Mademoiselle de Gournay, La Grande Demoiselle, Madame de Lambert. But not until the revolution had there been a distinct feminist movement. Not until men began to combine to demand recognition of the rights of man, did women begin to combine to demand that the rights of men should include those of women. It was in the 18th century, the seed time of modern ideas, writes Mr. Havelock Ellis, that our great-grandfathers became conscious of a discordant break in the traditional conceptions of women's status. The vague cries of justice, freedom, equality, which were being hurled about the world, were here and there energetically applied to women. In France, throughout the century, philosophers, with the exception of that arch-anti-feminist Jean-Jacques Rousseau, had been sowing the seed of revolutionary feminism as well as of much else. In the customs of all lands, wrote Diderot, nature's cruelty to women has been reinforced by the cruelty of the common law. In marriage, man unjustly arrogates to himself a proprietorial right over his wife. Montesquieu and Voltaire were both in favor of giving women political rights. So were d'Alembert, Beaumarchais, and Mercier. Thus, towards the end of the century, feminism was in the air. In England, two years before the outbreak of the French Revolution, Mary Wollstonecraft published the first of her feminist books, Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, to be succeeded five years later by her great work, The Vindication of the Rights of Women, which was immediately translated into French. In Germany, Kant's friend Theodor Gottlich von Himmel was preparing his two feminist treatises, 
über die bergerliche Verbesserung der Weiber and über weibliche Bildung, which appeared respectively in 1792 and 1801. Meanwhile in France, the last of the philosophers, Condorcet, was surpassing in zeal and persistence all these advocates of feminism. We have already seen Condorcet and his wife in their salon at l'Hôtel des Monnaies, including women's political enfranchisement among the ideals which their friends despised as utopian. It was in the year before the revolution that Condorcet, in the second of his Lettre d'un bourgeois de New Haven à un citoyen de Virginie, demanded that women should not merely vote, but be eligible for election to governing bodies. In the following year, he returned to the same theme in an Essai sur la Constitution et les fonctions des assemblées provinciales, and again in the next year in an article Sur l'admission des femmes au droit de cité, contributed to the journal of La Société de 1789. Later in his classic work, Le Tableau des Progrès de l'Esprit Humain, he laid down as a necessary condition of intellectual progress, the complete destruction of prejudices which have created a legal inequality between the two sexes, fatal even to those whom it favors. The most revolutionary of his demands, that women should not only vote but be eligible for election to governing bodies, was made in the earliest of these works. In the matter of suffrage, Condorcet was a very moderate reformer. All he demanded, both for men and women, was a slight extension of a very restricted property qualification. For we must remember that when the revolution opened, women were not entirely debarred from voting. Ever since the institution of the States General by Philippe Le Bel in 1302, certain women had possessed this privilege and had from time to time made use of it. Now, when the States General, after a lapse of 175 years, were once more summoned by a royal decree, a clause in that decree called upon all women, lay or religious, who held seigneurial fiefs to appoint proxies, chosen from the nobility in the case of laywomen, from the clergy in the case of nuns, to represent them in the electoral colleges. Women complied. Consequently, certain members of the National Assembly owed their election partly to women's votes. This, according to Condorcet, was quite right and proper. The injustice lay, he contended, in the article he contributed to the journal of the 1789 Society, in limiting the right of representation to the women who held seigneurial fiefs. Condorcet would have it extended to the feminine holders of territorial fiefs. It is not the advocacy of this very modest measure of reform, but the revolutionary nature of the arguments by which he supported it, that entitles Condorcet to rank with John Stuart Mill as one of the greatest advocates of women's suffrage. With Condorcet's reasoning, striking and novel as it was in his day, we are now so familiar that there is no need to repeat it here. Yet hardly any of his men contemporaries agreed with him. Among prominent politicians only the Abbé Sieyès, the diplomatist Talleyrand, and the scientist Rome advocated women's suffrage. But the women who demanded the political enfranchisement of their sex were more numerous. They were led by four fiery agitators with whom we are already well acquainted. Etta Palm von Elders, Olympe de Gouges, Tiroigne de Méricourt, and Claire Lacombe. Probably none of them except perhaps Etta Palm had ever read a line of Condorcet's writings. They would have had no patience with his moderate and aristocratic notions, for each member of the quartet at one time or other claimed what is known in France today as le suffrage intégral. Etta Palm was the most moderate of the four. For that reason, and also because she was the first to disappear from the revolution scene, we will take her first, although she was not the first to begin feminist propaganda. Etta Palm, or Madame Delders, as we have said in a previous chapter, was an influential member of the club known as the Friends of Truth or the Social Circle founded in 1790. There, and owing largely, no doubt, to the fact that Condorcet was a member, women's rights and wrongs were frequently discussed. But the speakers were not always feminist. On the 31st of October, 1790, one speaker enunciated the familiar doctrine that a woman's fear is bounded by the walls of her home. There, he said, is woman's throne— there she is surrounded by her children, who should be her only glory. Then, with the revolutionist's unfailing appeal to the annals of Rome, Cornelia, he concluded, was neither senator, nor consul, nor general of the Roman armies, she was the mother of the Gracchi. But anti-feminists were, of course, not allowed the last word at the social circle. A few weeks later it was announced that on the 26th of November, a young man, 
Charles Louis Rousseau, a former deputy extraordinaire for Chablis and Tonnerre, would speak on the following points. 1. Do women exercise any influence over government? 2. How best can that influence be used for the good of the state? 3. In a properly constituted state, what should be the social and political position of women? 4. A proposal to create magisterial functions exclusively exercisable by women. Every care was taken to ensure Rousseau a large and influential audience. The club's newspaper, Bouche de Fer, announced that not only members of the social circle, but members of the Constituent Assembly, the Paris Municipality, and of other clubs, the Jacobins, Les Electeurs Patriotes, and Les Electeurs de 1789, would be admitted on producing their cards. In spite of all these carefully planned arrangements, the meeting resulted in a complete fiasco, and would have covered feminism with ridicule had it not been for the intervention of a clever woman in the audience. Rousseau was a dapper little man, well powdered, with a fine tricolor cockade in his hat, and another at the hilt of his sword, but he was utterly ignorant of the art of speaking in public. In vain did his women friends, by their vociferous applause, endeavor to inspire him with the eloquence he lacked. Rousseau maundered on interminably until the women who were not his personal admirers and the whole male portion of the assembly were bored to extinction and tried, but in vain, to cry him down. "'Shall he continue?' inquired the embarrassed president, one Dr. Michel. "'Yes, yes!' shouted the speaker's women friends. But renewed frequent and forcible interruptions from the rest of the audience finally reduced even the persistent Rousseau to unwilling silence. As at long last he ceased speaking, a tall and well-dressed woman emerged from the seats in the amphitheater reserved for her sex, and, mounting the platform, protested against the disgraceful treatment accorded to the champion of women's rights. "'I demand,' she cried, "'in the name of every citizeness present that the speaker be allowed to continue.' But by that time the president had adjourned the meeting, and there remained nothing for the women to do but to gather round the oratress to smother her with embraces, and to overwhelm her with their thanks and congratulations. This brave champion of her sex was none other than Etta Palm Delders. Etta had so fascinated the social circle that the club insisted on her fixing a day when she would address them at greater length. They even wanted to make her president. Only the former request was granted. Etta was persuaded to name the day. It was to be the 30th of December. In the interval, the silenced but by no means discomfited Rousseau insisted on completing his oration at the Paris Vauxhall on the 13th of December, and, to guard against interruption this time, he refused to admit to the hall any man for whose orderly behavior a woman would not hold herself responsible. This plan was apparently successful, and Rousseau was allowed to drone on as long as he liked and to weary his listeners without interruption. Etta's triumph on the 30th was as brilliant as Rousseau's failure had been dismal. O oh, ye gods and goddesses! had cried another Teuton, Anarchy Sklutz. Behold the divine Hippatia herself on the platform! But Madame Delders was too mistrustful of her Dutch accent to deliver her own speech. It was read for her by one of the club's secretaries, and for the defects of its composition the writer felt it necessary to apologize. Born and bred in a foreign land, she began, if the construction of my phrases is not according to the rules of the French Academy, I ask you to believe that I have consulted my heart rather than a dictionary. The audience was ready to make every allowance. The speech was received with immense applause. It was printed at the club's expense, and with other subsequent speeches by Madame Delders, was circulated throughout France under the title of Appel aux Françaises sur la régénération des mœurs et nécessité de l'influence des femmes dans un gouvernement libre. The women of Creil responded to this appeal by electing its author a member of the recently formed women's section of the National Guard, and presenting her, some say with a sword of honor, but at any rate with one of the national medals struck to commemorate the Feast of the Federation. With much pomp and ceremony the formal presentation was made in the amphitheater of the Palais Royal by the commander of the Cray National Guard, in the name of the captainess and members of the women's section and of the municipal council of Cray. 
In acknowledging the honor conferred upon her, Madame Delders proposed that a statue to Faucillon's wife should be erected in the amphitheater, in order that the members of the club might have constantly before their eyes a model of wisdom, modesty, and every moral and civic virtue. The president of the club, not to be outdone in heroics, rejoined that never would the male friends of truth consent to wear chains save chains of flowers woven by Etta's hands, or those of her amiable fellow-workers. As to the speech itself, though it was embroidered with many a flower of rhetoric, if any convinced suffragists heard it, their hearts must have been left cold. Much was said about the reform of women's morals. They were adjured to adorn their heads with crowns of civisme, instead of with pompons and other frivolous ornaments. But women's influence on government, which was supposed to be the main theme of the discourse, was left almost unnoticed. Suffragists must have been disappointed when, after speaking of the injustice of women's position in the family and society, the speaker conceded that for the present anything like equality between the sexes was out of the question. This must be postponed until another revolution. For the present women must concentrate on moral progress, on winning educational advantages, on making themselves worthy to be the companions of men. Any anti-feminist might have said as much, and did, as we shall see when we come to the anti-feminism of Madame Roland. However, with the exception of Monsieur and Madame Condorcet, there were probably few, if any, suffragists belonging to the social circle. Consequently, Madame Delders enjoyed her triumph undisturbed, and she lived up to her opportunity. The fame she had already acquired as a platform woman made her as eager as all the other oratresses of the revolution to display her eloquence to the best advantage, i.e., in the presence of the National Assembly. On the 23rd of March, 1791, she proposed, apparently in vain, to the women of the social circle that they should go in a body to thank the National Assembly for having granted women une existence civile. A year later she was more successful and on the 1st of April, 1792, she actually found herself playing the coveted part and appearing at the head of a deputation before the Legislative Assembly. This time she came out as a real suffragist. Not content with asking for equality of educational opportunities, she demanded equal political rights for women and men, majority for women at 21 instead of at 25, and the right to divorce. The reply of the President of the Assembly was the perfection of la galanterie française. He promised that in the future, the Assembly would avoid passing any laws which should cause women citizens to shed tears or displease them in any way. He granted the petitioners the honors of the sitting, and referred their petition to the Committee on Legislation and Education, in whose pigeonholes it was no doubt safely buried. This was probably one of Madame Delder's last appearances in public. By that time the social circle had ceased to exist, and soon the patriotic and philanthropic ladies also were to discontinue their meetings. The fact is that Madame Delders was now growing unpopular. It had been whispered that she was a spy in the service of the hated King of Prussia. His ambassador, it was said, had been seen visiting her flat. The report would seem to have originated with Madame Robert, who made it a pretext for opposing Madame Delders' election to the Jacobin Fraternal Society. Madame Robert's real reason was jealousy. Being the chief speaker at the society, she feared Etta as a rival. The French government of the day can hardly have taken the rumor seriously, seeing that in September 1792, Lebrun, Minister of Foreign Affairs, sent Etta to Holland to inquire whether the Republic of the United Provinces would be willing to receive an ambassador from the new Republic of France. The failure of Madame Delders in this important mission closed her public career. Whether she ever returned to France is uncertain. At any rate, she was treated as an émigré. The property she had left in Paris was confiscated, and the contents of her flat in la rue Favard placed under seal. In the inventory of her furniture figure a bust of Camille Desmoulins, a great many corsets and four porcelain dolls. Whether Madame Delders was a Prussian spy or not, as a feminist we suspect her of being a trimmer ready to advocate woman's suffrage when, as at the time of her petition to the Assembly, the idea was growing popular, but equally ready to adjourn the reform indefinitely when she was addressing an audience with whom the measure was unlikely to find favor. If, during the first three years of the Revolution, the idea of women's parliamentary enfranchisement gained ground, it certainly was not due to the advocacy of Madame Delders. 
There was a woman, however, who, though she changed her mind from time to time as to some articles of her political creed, remained from first to last, and was even before the revolution a stalwart and loyal suffragist. This woman was Olympe de Gouges. Michelet calls her the high priestess of feminism. She was the first of the revolution women to organize an orderly feminist manifestation. Hardly had the National Assembly taken up its quarters at Paris, in the riding school of the Rue Saint-Honoré, when on the 28th of October, 1789, Olympe, at the head of a deputation of women, laid before the deputies a program of feminist reform, such as, with one exception, might well be urged today by Marie of Véron, or any other leader of the Women's Party in France. It included complete sex equality before the law, the admission of women to all occupations for which they were fitted, the suppression of what was called the dowry system. And then came that touch of eccentricity, or shall we say utopianism, that rendered so many of Olympe's proposals impracticable. If the dowry system must remain, said she, then let the state provide husbands for girls who were without dowries. In conclusion, Olympe, with the usual flourish, asked, Why women who come from the scepter to the crook, are born to scatter flowers over men's lives, should receive from them in return nothing but chains, torment, and injustice. In those early days, we may be sure, the assembly listened patiently to a lamp's declamation. She would have spoken well, said one of her hearers, if only she had not so many fireworks in her brain. As time went on, the assembly grew less patient, for Olympe never lost an opportunity of displaying her eloquence before them and at the same time, as we have seen, she was pouring forth innumerable pamphlets and posting many of them on the hoardings of Paris. Feminism figured large in many of these pronouncements. Like Madame Delders, Olympe, who was self-educated as far as she was educated at all, desired for her fellow women advantages that had never been hers. She demanded that girls should receive the same education as boys, that all careers should be open to women, who with a wider outlook would acquit themselves better of their domestic duties. While she would have all the political privileges that men enjoyed extended to women, she further demanded that in certain directions women should acquire peculiar privileges of their own. That of the theatre, for example. She advocated the establishment of a national theatre in which only plays by women should be acted. Here we catch the personal note that was never far to seek in Olympe's propaganda. She had suffered, as we have seen, from the refusal of her plays by la Comédie Française and other Paris theatres. She is said to have taken one of her productions, L'Esclave des Nègres, to London. But there she had no better success than in Paris. That is, by the way, however. But to return to her feminism. A outrance, as it was, did not blind her to the faults of her sex. As denunciatory as a Hebrew prophet, preaching at everyone, as we have said, at the king, the queen, the assembly, the clubs, especially the Jacobins, she did not fail to deal faithfully, even brutally, with her fellow women. In France, especially for many centuries, she wrote, women have done more harm than good. For the French government has almost always depended on l'administration nocturne des femmes. If in public women have no political power, elles commandent despotiquement dans le mystère. Such frankness as this Olympe justified by saying, I serve my sex by persecuting it. But all the faults of women, their ineffectuality, their sloth, their coquetry, this feminist laid at men's door. To the lowest class of her fellow women she showed no pity whatever. In order that honest women and their daughters should not be horrified by so vile a spectacle, as was too often seen in the Paris streets, Olympe would sweep prostitutes off the public thoroughfares and shut them up in separate quarters, belonging to the state and under police supervision. The most celebrated of all her feminist tracts, the one which more than any other entitles her to be regarded as the foundress of modern feminism, is her Declaration of the Rights of Women, contained in a pamphlet addressed to the Queen and published in September 1791. In the opening paragraph, Marie-Antoinette was implored to win the gratitude of one half of her subjects, and at least a third of the other half, by declaring herself the protectress of her sex and by furthering the recognition of their lawful rights. The Declaration contains seventeen clauses. In the first, following the same form as the Declaration of the Rights of Man, it opens by declaring that woman is born free, then it adds, and equal in rights to man. 
social distinctions can only be based on common utility. The principle of sovereignty resides in the nation which consists of men as well as of women. Laws should express the general will. Citizenesses as well as citizens should have a share in framing them, either directly or through their representatives. The law should be equal for all. Citizenesses, like citizens, being equal in its eyes, should be equally eligible for all public dignities, posts, and employments, according to their capacity and without any distinction save that of their virtues and talents. Women as well as men pay taxes. Consequently, women as well as men have the right to call to account the public servants whom they pay. There is nothing in these principles which would not be accepted by the average woman suffragist of today. Few suffragists, however, indeed few social reformers, would agree with the clauses which follow, and which deal with marriage and children. Still smarting under the wrongs, real or imaginary, of her childhood, believing herself to have been an illegitimate child, and consequently deprived of what should have been her lawful inheritance, Olympe propounded a new marriage system, le contrat social de l'homme et de la femme. It is one of her most whimsical and impracticable schemes. The contracting parties were to hold their property in common, with the reservation that it could be divided in favor of children who might be born d'une inclination particulière. Mutually agreeing, concludes this strange proposal, that our property belongs to our children, de quelque lit qu'ils sortent, and that all alike, without distinction, have the right to bear the name of the father and mother who have recognized them. No one, as far as we know, ever took this scheme seriously. While retaining the institution of marriage, Olympe would reduce it to an absurdity. This was precisely the treatment that Olympe was soon to accuse the legislative assembly of having meted out to the monarchy. Of the monarchy, she said justly, it would have been better to abolish it rather than drag it in the mud. It is in Article 10 of the Declaration of the Rights of Women that occurs the famous phrase that even those who know nothing else about her always associate with Olympe. Woman has the right to mount the scaffold. She should also have the right to mount the platform. Among all the rights Olympe demanded for women, those two were the only ones that she herself ever exercised. The pity that Olympe refused to the fallen members of her own sex, we have already seen her lavishing heroically on the deposed king. In a previous chapter we left her on the eve of her arrest, the inevitable consequence of her quixotic offer to defend Louis Capet at his trial. Had anything else been necessary to render her condemnation inevitable, she supplied it by her frequent attacks on Robespierre, whom she described as a perpetual disgrace to the revolution, and by her espousal of the lost cause of la Gironde. It is my nature, she had written, to be on the side of the weak and the oppressed. On the 20th of July, 1793, while instructing a bill-poster as to the posting up of her latest pamphlet, Les Trois Urnes ou le Salut de la Patrie, Olympe was arrested in la rue de Harlay. She was taken to the nearest mairie, there interrogated and detained. Among the formal charges brought against her was the publication of a seditious play, La France Sauvée ou le Tyran détrôné, and three pamphlets of which the most serious was Les Trois Urnes, which proposed that the people should choose by a plebiscite between the republican government, one and indivisible, a federative government and a monarchy. To profess or even to suggest federalism, as it was called, was then regarded as a crime of the deepest dye, as many Girondists knew to their cost. For three months Olympe was taken from prison to prison, from the mairie to l'abbaye, from l'abbaye to la force, then to a private hospital, and thence to the vestibule of death, la conciergerie. All the time she was pouring forth letters and pamphlets, continuing her attacks on Robespierre and the Jacobin Club, which she called a den of thieves, and writing to the son who was to deny and to censure her as a conspirator who had forgotten the virtues becoming to her sex. Olympe made her will in prison, her fortune, all that was left of fifty thousand francs in investment and furniture, valued at thirty thousand, she bequeathed to this ungrateful son. Her heart she left to her country, her honesty to men, if they needed it, her soul to women. On the 2nd of November she was brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal. The advocate who should have defended her was not present. The Tribunal refused to allow her to appoint another. She therefore conducted her own defense, and as we might expect with great eloquence. Writing to her son, she said, 
Twenty times did I chase the blood from the cheeks of my executioners. That was, of course, her habitual exaggeration. But it was true that she won the sympathy of the audience and made a great impression on her judges. As the sentence was about to be pronounced, she cried, My enemies will not have the triumph of seeing my blood flow. I am pregnant and shall present the Republic with a citizen or citizeness. The sentence was stayed until the next day, when after examining the accused, a surgeon pronounced her statement to be incorrect. Psychologists tell us that in all human beings there are masculine and feminine elements. Olympe had many masculine qualities, but during the final hours of her life her femininity had come out strong, for her last request had been for a mirror, and, gazing on her face for the last time, she had cried, Ah, thank heaven, my face is not playing me any tricks, I am not too pale. Not long before her death, Olympe had written of herself, my first impulse is like a tempest, but as soon as the explosion is over, my mind is perfectly calm. All Olympe's explosions were now over. On the 4th of November, 1793, she went out into the eternal calm. As she was going up the steps to the guillotine, the executioner, as was his wont, put out his hand to help her. I forbid you to touch me, cried Olympe, except to cut off my head. Then, having reached the platform, she said, I wanted to be somebody. Alas, for that fatal desire for renown. Feminism, like every other creed, is colored by the temperament of the man or woman that professes it. We have seen certain phases of Olympe's feminism proceeding from her vanity and ambition. We shall also discern the personal note in the feminism of Tirwang, which we are now to consider. Tirwang was essentially a man's woman and it was only when her attractiveness to men began to wane that her feminism developed. But even then she continued to seek men's society. For Tirwang, like that other great feminist Georges Sand, frankly confessed that she disliked women, French women at any rate. Je n'aime pas les femmes françaises, she said with her Flemish accent. It was through men that in the beginning she strove to realize her feminist aims. Early in 1790 she founded a men's club, Les Amis de la Loi, comprising a dozen or more members who, for a few weeks, it had only twenty meetings in all, gathered on Tuesdays and Thursdays at her house, l'Hôtel de Grenoble, Rue Boulois, and there women's rights were frequently discussed. During the early months of 1790, when Tirwang was not at this or some other club, she was attending the debates of the Assembly. There, when on the 4th of February the King announced his adhesion to the Constitution, men and women, and Tirwang among the latter swore allegiance to the new regime. Shortly afterwards, somewhere between the 20th and the 25th of the month, Tirwang, having once been allowed to make her voice heard in the councils of the state, proposed to go a step further, and at the close of her famous speech at the Cordelier, asked for a consultative vote in that assembly. But then, despite the applause that had greeted her speech, she suffered one of those rebuffs which are partly accountable for the bitterness and extravagance of her later career. The reply of the assembly of the Cordelier district to Tirwang's request is significant. According to Camille Desmoulins, who related the incident in his newspaper, Les Révolutions de France et de Brabant, the assembly, after thanking the citizeness for her proposed vote, on the motion of the president, the following resolution. Seeing that a canon of the Council of Macon has formally recognized that women, like men, possess a soul and an intelligence, une âme et la raison, women cannot be denied the right to make such good use of them as the previous speaker has done. Mademoiselle Tirwang and other members of her sex will always be free to propose anything that seems to them for the good of their country. But as to the question of status, as to whether the Demoiselle Tirwang shall be admitted to the meeting of the district with a consultative vote, the Assembly is incompetent to take any decision, and the discussion is closed. In other words, women may freely use for the good of the State the powers of which a council of the Church grudgingly admitted them to be possessed. There was no reason, for example, why les citoyens should not arm les citoyennes, as they inaccurately termed the women of France, with daggers against the enemies of the revolution, why they should not form them into a bodyguard to protect Robespierre. But when it came to admitting the so-called citoyenne even into the outer court of citizenship, to giving one of them even so much as a consultative voice in the district council, no, 
that could not be tolerated, for it constituted an infringement of man's political monopoly, and so fundamental an innovation was not for one moment to be thought of. If this was the masculine attitude towards so very moderate a feminist demand in the early and comparatively feminist days of the revolution, there was little chance later when, as we shall see, the government's policy became decidedly anti-feminist that much more aspiring demands would be granted. In the two years that followed, Thierwang received many an ovation. But I doubt whether she ever completely recovered from the disappointment of that first refusal. Her greatest triumph was that we have already described at the Jacobin Club. This was after her return from Austria in January 1792. Thierwang then became a person of considerable importance. Her salon in la rue de Tournon was frequented by all that was most distinguished in revolutionary society. On patriotic playing cards, Terwang's picture figured as the Queen of Spades, with the Duke of Orléans as King and Santerre as Knave. In the Palais Royal Gardens and in the Café d'Auto on the Feuillant Terrace, her word was law, and at a gesture from her, shopkeepers were constrained to remove from their windows pictures she considered to be reactionary. She took part in the first invasion of the Tuileries on the 20th of June. By this time, however, signs were not wanting that her popularity was on the wane. On the 4th of March, in an interminable speech at the Jacobin Club, in which she proposed to raise public spirit to its proper height, à sa juste hauteur, Tirwang succeeded in lowering the spirits of her hearers. On the 13th of April occurred that stormy debate in the club when, as we have seen, she was accused of raising a riot in the Faubourg of Saint-Antoine. Whether or no Terwang was to blame in that matter, there is no doubt she was becoming more and more violent and losing her balance. Probably this arose partly from the growth of the malady which was finally to deprive her of her reason. Meanwhile, as her attractiveness faded, she began to neglect her personal appearance. She was getting to look emaciated, worn, and haggard. A royalist who knew her at this time described her as the living image of the revolution. Brilliant in its beginning, fanatical in the middle, and revolting and sanguinary after the 10th of August. On that day, armed with pistols and a dagger, wearing her usual riding habit, this time of blue, and a black hat with black feathers, says one eyewitness, with tricolor, says another, she was up betimes and early at the Feuillant Monastery, where the first prisoners were being brought in. As to what then happened, there has been much discussion. Early historians accused her of having with her own hands slain one of the prisoners, Sulot, the editor of the reactionary newspaper Les Actes des Apôtres, which had made the most scurrilous attacks upon her. Later authorities acquit her of such a crime. Exasperated at the sight of this well-known reactionary, Thierwang may have clamored for his death. She may even have laid hands on him herself. But Sulot quickly found himself struggling with several assailants. He had been disarmed, but he seized the sword of one of his captors and fought for his life. But what was one against so many? He was overpowered, dragged out into the courtyard, and there put to death with that animal savagery which, as we know too well, revolutions seem to engender. That Tirwang should have been in any way implicated in this incident is terrible enough, and one is glad to find the even more horrible charge groundless. Equally groundless was the assertion that Thierwang took part in the prison massacres of September. No contemporary authority mentions her among the perpetrators of those assassinations. Indeed, she seems to have protested against them. They were the work of the Jacobin party to which she was now so strongly opposed that she was called Brissotine and anti-Robespierriste. End of Chapter 10 Part 1《ラブレター》第2部分第3章第2章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3章第3Collot d'Herbois raised the laugh against Terwang when in her presence at the Jacobin Club, with mock regret, he said he had heard Terwang declaring that she must withdraw her friendship from him and from Robespierre. 
Tia Wang, infuriated, leapt from her seat onto the platform and clamored to be allowed to speak. Such an uproar followed that the president put on his hat, thus signifying the adjournment of the meeting. Tia Wang was at this time living close to the Jacobins at 273 Rue Saint-Honoré, where she held a salon and whence she continued to carry on her feminist propaganda. Like Olympe, she had her manifestos posted on the hoardings. One of these exists today in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Printed on grey paper, it is an appeal to the forty-eight sections of Paris, each to nominate from among the worthiest and the most highly respected women of the section, six whose duty it should be to remind the citizens of the dangers threatening the country, of the necessity of maintaining order and liberty of opinion. These reminders were indeed becoming more and more necessary every day, and none had more need of them than Terroigne. But she herself was soon to fall a victim of that anarchy against which she was protesting. In the quarrel between the Jacobins and the Girondins, which reached its climax in the May of this year, 1793, the former had not hesitated to employ against their political enemies, les tricoteuses, les poissards, and the lowest women of the streets. The most disreputable of these women roughs, said to be in the pay of the Jacobins, used to surge in angry mobs on the Fayant Terrace and round the doors of the Assembly. There they refused to allow any to enter who were not of their own particular brand of political opinion. It had long been the custom of these fearsome menads publicly to flog in the most humiliating manner any of their number whose views or conduct displeased them. The prints of the period represent many such scenes which even our gallery might hesitate to depict. Tir Wang had protested against these indecent floggings and had threatened to make the whippers lick the dust. They took their revenge. On the 15th of May, when at nine o'clock in the morning Tir Wang was crossing the Fayant Terrace on her way to the assembly, the women set upon her and fustigated her with such vigor that she might have died had not the guard rescued her from their hands. According to one account, Marat was her deliverer. For Marat, as we have seen, was something of a feminist. This was Tir Wang's last appearance in public. She did not immediately lose her reason as some have maintained, for there is evidence that she was managing her business affairs with perfect lucidity in the following summer. A year later she was incapable of doing so, and a family council was convened to nominate a guardian who should act for her. By that time Tir Wang had been arrested by the revolutionary committee of her section, on what charge does not appear but probably for some imprudent words uttered by her in a fit of madness. A prey to one of the most ghastly forms of lunacy, she was transferred from prison to an asylum and thence from madhouse to madhouse during the twenty-three years of misery that remained to her, for she never recovered her reason. Finally, on the 1st of May, 1817, her tragic existence closed in the Salpêtrière Hospital. Tir Wang's humiliation in May and Olympe's arrest in July 1793 left Claire Lacombe the leader of the Women's Party. We have already seen her as the moving spirit of the Women's Republican Revolutionary Club. Her feminism was of a different kind from that of Olympe and Tir Wang. While they strove for nothing more than women's admission on the same terms as men to citizenship in the bourgeois republic, Lacombe aimed at something much wider. While their motto was le suffrage intégral, hers might have been l'humanité intégrale. For Lacombe and her brilliant young lover, Thésée Leclerc, belonged to the most extreme of revolutionary factions, Les Enragés, with its headquarters in the club of that name. Though the word socialist had not yet been invented, Les Enragés were the socialists of the Great Revolution, the ancestors of the communards of 1871. Lacombe, or one of her women disciples, summed up their program in a petition to the convention which said, We desire that there should not be a single unfortunate person in the whole republic. But before arriving at that blissful condition, les enragés were prepared to justify their title by rendering multitudes unfortunate. As sworn foes of the Jacobins, les enragés were prepared to oppose them on any ground, even on that of modérantisme. But generally les enragés, as extreme terrorists of the terror, protested against what they called the indulgence of the Convention Leclerc, who had spent some time at Lyon before coming to Paris, had there proposed that six thousand aristocrats should be cast into the sun. Lacombe never followed her lover to such lengths. The accusation that she took part in the prison massacres of September 1792 is without foundation. 
Indeed, one of the charges brought against her at her arrest two years later was that in the Republican Revolutionary Club she had protested against these massacres. Nevertheless, she and her club threw themselves on to the side of Les Enregis in their attack on the Jacobins and the Convention. Their plan was to demand the immediate execution of the Constitution which the Convention had drawn up, but which it refused to put into action until, so it said, the war was ended. On the 26th of August, 1793, Lacombe appeared before the Convention at the head of a deputation from the Republican Revolutionary Club. She demanded the execution of the laws of the Constitution. We have not, she remonstrated, been the first to accept this Constitution in order that anarchy and the rule of intriguers may be indefinitely prolonged. We call upon you, by dismissing all nobles, to show that their defenders are not among you. It is not enough to tell the people that their happiness is near, you must make them experience it, and four years' unhappiness have rendered them chary of believing your fine promises. With what indignation must the people behold men gorged with their money and fattened on their blood preaching to them patience and sobriety? Would you have us believe that the country's enemies have no devoted defenders among you? Then dismiss all nobles without exception. If there be any of good faith, they will prove it by sacrificing themselves willingly for the country's welfare. Be not afraid of disorganizing the army. If a general's politics are bad, then the more talented he is, the more necessary is it to get rid of him. Do not be so unjust toward patriots as to believe that there is no one among them worthy to command our armies. If, when despotism reigned, crime was rewarded, under liberty's rule virtue should be given the preference. You have decreed that all suspected persons shall be arrested. Is not such a law grotesque? when those who execute it are themselves suspected? Ah, legislators, is this how you trick the people? Is this the equality on which their happiness was to be founded? Is this their reward for the incalculable evils they have suffered so long and so patiently? No, it shall not be said that these people reduced to despair must take justice into their own hands. You will execute justice by dismissing guilty administrators by creating extraordinary tribunals in such numbers that our patriots, when they start for the front, may be able to say, We are not anxious about the fate of our women and children, for beneath the arm of the law we have seen all the plotters of the interior perish. Decree these great measures and a mass levy of all the male population and you will have saved la patrie. The convention listened to Lacombe's speech in cold silence and, as soon as it was finished without note or comment, proceeded to the next business. The deputation had indeed experienced great difficulty in gaining admission. Another, which arrived after it, had been given the precedence. And against this injustice, the young Leclerc, whose influence is plainly discernible in the petition itself, did not fail to protest. Not all the measures proposed by les enragés were as vindictive as these proposals of Lacombe. They advocated, for example, the institution of national workshops, somewhat on the lines of those which were to prove a failure in the revolution of 1848. Olympe, by the way, with her habitual inconsistency, had supported this social reform, though she was anything but a socialist. Girondin and Jacobin alike mistrusted les enragés. But the Jacobin in their conflict with their political enemies were glad to make use of these extremists. It is probable that with several other Republican revolutionary women, Lacombe was present at the Jacobin meetings of March, April, and May, when the ruin of the Girondist party was decided on. When the Jacobins were finally victorious, and the Girondist leaders either executed or driven to wander homeless throughout France, then the victors turned against their former allies. And in this second faction fight, as we shall see, Lacombe and the woman's party she represented finally came to grief. How far the hooligan women who in the spring of 1793 were constituted, or constituted themselves, the doorkeepers of the convention, were recruited by or even drawn from Lacombe's revolutionary Republican woman has been much discussed. Girondist writers maintain that these frenzied menads were members of the club, and that it consisted of prostitutes and les plus hideuses coquines of Paris. But the Girondais were not impartial critics of the club for it had been the most formidable of their political enemies. The Girondist accusation is not borne out by certain clauses in the club's constitution. The Republican revolutionary citizenesses, 
begins one of these, are convinced that without morals and principles liberty cannot exist. The society has resolved, runs another, that it will only admit citizenesses of good morals. This it considers to be the most essential of all qualifications, and it has resolved that any failure to comply with this condition shall constitute one of the principal causes of exclusion. If the club consisted of prostitutes, it was strange that on the 21st of September, 1793, it should have sent a deputation to petition the convention to transfer women of bad life, femme de mauvaise vie, to houses instituted by the nation where they might be occupied in useful work, and by means of patriotic reading induced to forsake their evil ways. For, urged the petitioners, these unhappy victims of libertinage often have good hearts, and it is poverty alone that has frequently reduced them to this deplorable condition. As for the Jacobins, now that their Girondist enemies were disposed of, and they no longer needed the support either of the women roughs or of the women's club, they began to find both of them a nuisance, and in order to get rid of them were glad of the excuse of confounding the two with which their enemies had provided them. In this association of the women's party with Les Enragés, the Jacobins found a further excuse for the anti-feminist campaign they now began to carry on in the Convention, the Commune, the Jacobin Club, the Jacobin Fraternal Society, and even in the Republican Revolutionary Club itself. This internecine campaign opened when, on the 31st of May, 1793, the Convention excluded women from its galleries. On that very day the Women's Party had received another rebuff. A deputation of women from the Republican Revolutionary Club to the Council General of the Commune had vainly petitioned that women should be allowed to join in the deliberations of the Revolutionary Committee of their own section. When three days later the same deputation approached the convention, they were denied admittance. On the 31st of July, the Women's Club was significantly left out of the project to erect an obelisk in honor of Marat, and this in spite of the fact to which Lacombe publicly drew attention that with the women the idea had originated. Meanwhile, Lacombe was having trouble with her own club, for some of its members refused to be identified with the ultraviolent party. One of these who had spoken at the Cordelier Club was accused by one of the Cordelier of being too indulgent. In August, Lacombe found it necessary to reproach certain of her followers with their devotion to Robespierre. "'You are infatuated with Robespierre,' she cried. "'I regard him as an ordinary individual.' In the Jacobin Club, she was accused of having shown disrespect to Robespierre by calling him Monsieur Robespierre. In September, having in her turn become president of the Republican Revolutionary Club, Lacombe began a regular canvassing of the members of Le Comité de Sûreté Générale with the object of obtaining their permission for the members of the club to visit the prisons, to interrogate the prisoners, and to set at liberty those whom they found innocent. Here, les enragés were substituting modérantisme for terrorisme. Two members of the committee, Chabot and Bassir reported this extraordinary proceeding to the Jacobin Club. While roundly inveighing against Lacombe's action, they tried to explain it by saying that she had confessed to one of them her love for one of the prisoners, a royalist, Monsieur de Ré, son of a former mayor of Toulouse. The wrath of the Jacobin, already waxing hot against Lacombe, rose to fever heat at this further accusation. The charge was probably groundless, for the object of this prison visitation was doubtless to set free some of the supporters of Les Enragés. Nevertheless, the club was only too ready to believe Bassir and Chabot's story. One member attributed to women the anarchical condition of the city. Protests from the women's gallery. But he continued and demanded Lacombe's arrest. Another citizen, Tachereau, with great probability accused Lacombe of pushing herself in everywhere. Citoyenne Lacombe se fourre partout. At a meeting at which the speaker was present, he had heard her clamoring for the Constitution and nothing but the Constitution. What hypocritical and feuillante, moderate, language, when she is trying to sap the foundation of the Constitution and to overthrow all constituted authorities. Another citizen. The woman you denounce is very dangerous because she is very eloquent. At this moment, Lacombe herself enters one of the galleries and seems to ask to speak. The noise and confusion are terrific. The president puts on his hat. When finally order is restored, the president, after rebuking Lacombe, puts two motions to the vote. First, 
that the Republican Revolutionary Club be asked to expel its suspected leaders. Second, that Le Comité de Sûreté Générale be asked to arrest such suspected persons. Both resolutions were passed unanimously. Then an amendment was proposed that Lacombe be taken at once before Le Comité de Sûreté Générale. Thereupon a citizen objected that this could not be done, that the Comité could only be asked to summon Lacombe before it. I do not doubt, added the speaker, that she is an instrument of the counter-revolution. Lacombe was not arrested, and on La Gazette Française announcing her arrest, she wrote to the editor saying, I will prove to you that my arms are as free as my body, for they will give themselves the treat of giving you a good whipping, if in your issue of tomorrow you do not eat your words, and I keep my word. Femme Lacombe, Présidente. Though for the time being the President went free, the debate at the Jacobins had destroyed any prestige that remained to the Republican Revolutionary Club. On the 6th of October, a memorable anniversary, a deputation from a club known as La Société du 10 août petitioned the Convention to dissolve the Women's Club. Strange to say, and most unfortunately for the club's reputation, the Convention refused. But before the month was out, the conduct of the women themselves put a second refusal out of the question. On the 28th of October, 1793, came the final struggle which decided the fate of the Women's Party. Were its causes less well known, one might have suspected the government of inciting an anti-feminist pogrom in order once and for all to banish women from French politics. As far as I know, however, no reliable authority has suggested that a hidden hand was behind the ostensible events that led to the disturbance. In the beginning, the fault undoubtedly lay with the market women, les poissardes. And here, in this last act of the revolution feminist drama, as in the first, the bread and cheese question constitutes the determining factor. For though the scarcity of food, the high prices, and the consequent scarcity of customers, les poissards were turning against the Republic, and having torn off their tricolor cockades were reverting to royalism. In September, the Convention had made the wearing of the tricolor compulsory, and the Republican revolutionary women took it upon themselves to exact obedience to the decree. We have already told how they dealt with the recalcitrants, how donning the red cap and masculine trousers, les clubistes paraded the streets, forcing the royalist women to resume their cockades, and even to put on the red cap. As was inevitable, les poissards refused in their own special way. There were the usual floggings, and Lacombe herself is said to have shared Tirouin's humiliation. Meanwhile, a horde of poissards had invaded the saint eustache charnel house, where the Republican revolutionary women were in session. There occurred scenes of such disorder as to provoke the intervention of a male armed force, la force armée. Not a large one, however, only six citizens with swords drawn and accompanied by a justice of the peace. The justice contented himself with demanding from the platform silence in the name of the law. And then, after assuring the invaders of the club that they would not again be asked to put on the red cap, but that they were at liberty to wear any headdress that pleased them, he withdrew, followed by his swordsmen all very glad, no doubt, to get out of the medley. But the club women were disappointed with this mild intervention, and three times asked for it to be repeated. The armed men did not return. But unhappily for the club, as it turned out, the justice of the peace, only too courageous, did put in a second appearance. Reascending the platform, he suggested as the best way to restore order that the vice-president, who was in the chair, should take off her red cap. She did so, and put it on the head of the justice of the peace. Loud applause from the galleries. Then the justice apparently took his revenge. He declared the meeting closed. Les citoyennes révolutionnaires ne sont plus en séance, he cried. Anyone may come in. And they did. Immediately the rabble surged into the charnel house, and it seemed as if the gruesome place was about to deserve its name only too well. Had it not been for the intervention of a company of artillerymen, there would doubtless have been slaughter of women by women. As it was, many of the club members were seriously wounded. Surgeons were called in. The soldiers succeeded in providing a way of escape for the attacked, who at first repeatedly refused to avail themselves of it. All they desired was to have a record procès verbal, made of what had occurred. In the end, they yielded to persuasion, and the charnel house was cleared. 
thus ended what proved to be the last meeting of the club of republican revolutionary women on the following day the twenty ninth of october a deputation of women from one of the fraternal societies la société populaire de la section du bon conseil appeared before the convention and complained of the disorderly conduct of les citoyennes républicaines révolutionnaires thereupon the convention on the motion of fabre d'eglantine requested le comité de sûreté générale to report on the question of women's clubs the committee lost no time in sending its report amar read it to the convention the very next day the measure it proposed the suppression of all women's clubs and societies was of course a foregone conclusion but the arguments it adduced struck much deeper than the question than before the convention of the continuance of women's clubs in france they reached down to the fundamental principles of relations between the sexes they were a prelude to the laws which from that day to this have determined those relations throughout the country it was from this broad standpoint that amar approached the problem are women capable of exercising political rights he inquired and of taking an active part in the affairs of government when assembled in political associations are they capable of deliberating the committee said amar had examined the two questions and had replied in the negative to both woman's nature is such he argued as to unfit her to take part in politics in the height of the terror addressing one of the most hysterical parliaments the world has ever seen amar declared that a quality essential in all who would take part in the government is imperturbable equanimity then he went on to inquire whether a woman's appearance in public is compatible with her good fame women he contended can best serve their country by influencing their husbands and teaching their children to love liberty that amar was preaching to the converted was obvious after a brief discussion the resolution that clubs and societies of women of whatever kind are prohibited was put and carried with only one dissentient voice that of charlier he was an obscure jacobin of whom little is known he based his objection on the argument that as women were human beings they ought not to be denied the right to meet together peaceably not a very fortunate line of argument considering the occurrences of the previous day Bessia rejoined that charlier did not seem to understand the question then before the house then forsaking amar's broad line of reasoning Bessir maintained that the question was not one of principle so much as of expediency whether or no these women's societies were dangerous they had been proved to be dangerous therefore away with principles it was this argument of inexpediency that was used by m clemenceau when a woman suffragist deputation waited upon him in nineteen nineteen i grant he replied that every argument for giving votes to men may be used for giving votes to women but we dare not give women votes in france for fear he added of increasing the power of the church the women of the revolution did not submit to their defeat without a protest denied access to the convention on the twenty eighth of november a large company of them appeared at the council of the commune thence too they were expelled after having been treated to an anti-feminist diatribe by an exagar chaumette chaumette declared that the place in which the people's magistrates deliberate should be closed to all who insult the nation no cried another member who realized that the women were intended the law allows them to enter read the law retorted chaumette the law decrees that morals shall be respected here i find them violated since when were women allowed to abjure their sex then in words which might have been michelet's this ex-priest fell to the usual anti-feminist tactics for the so-called exaltation of women as the divinity of the domestic sanctuary how could women be so foolish as to be discontented with a kingdom in which legislators and magistrates are at their feet your despotism he cried is the only despotism we cannot destroy since it is founded on love and consequently on human nature in the name of human nature stay as you are remember that haughty wife of a stupid and perfidious husband that roland who thought herself able to govern the republic and endangered its fall remember that virago that woman man the impudent olympe de gouges who tried to meddle in politics and who committed crimes all these immoral creatures have been annihilated by the arm of the law and do you wish to imitate them under the monarchy women were everything because men were nothing only in the reign of charles the seventh were jones of arc necessary 
Chomet's resolution that women should henceforth be excluded from the commune's deliberations was carried. Claire Lacombe had not figured among the women whom Chomet had denounced by name because he had only mentioned those who were dead. But Lacombe, though alive in the flesh, was dead politically. Her political reputation could not survive the events of the 28th of October. So she now returned to her original profession. Early in 1794, she was about to leave Paris for Dunkirk to keep a theatrical engagement when she was arrested on the charge of being connected with the socialist enemies of the government. The socialist leader Jacques Roux had already been in prison several months. Leclerc was arrested about the same time as Lacombe. He had by this time married Pauline Léon, who had been Lacombe's predecessor as president of the Republican Revolutionary Club. Lacombe's imprisonment first in one jail, then another, lasted seventeen months. For a while she was at the Luxembourg. There, carefully dressed and charming as ever, she turned an honest penny by selling candles to her fellow prisoners. Meanwhile, her women followers, of whom she always had a devoted band, were leaving no stone unturned in their endeavors to procure her liberty. At length, in the autumn of 1795, they succeeded. The order for her release, signed by the Comité de Sûreté Générale and dated Le Premier Fructidor, is the latest document and the latest information concerning this remarkable woman that has as yet been discovered. The Women's Party went down with the wreck of the Republican Revolutionary Club. The women's movement had resulted in complete failure. In face of the enormous prejudices against women's direct influence in politics, strengthened by the unfortunate influence of Marie Antoinette, in face of the lack of education and experience of the leading women, it had been doomed to failure from the outset. And latterly, had anything further been necessary to render its defeat inevitable, the final cause had been supplied by the alliance between feminists and the socialists who were the sworn foes of the party in power. The feminism of the revolution, as we have seen, was the first combined attempt to win political enfranchisement made by French women, indeed in modern history by the women of any country. This great pioneer movement could hardly have been inaugurated at a more unfavorable time. To pilot any movement past the shoals, the quicksands and the whirlpools of the tempestuous sea of the revolution would have required genius of a particular order, and this the women leaders did not possess. Most of the difficulties against which they had to contend have already been noticed. One that has not been mentioned is the anti-feminism of prominent revolutionary women, notably of Madame Roland, Madame Robert, and Madame Tallien. Someone has said that there are two types of femininity, the Poseish kind and the Tigerish kind. Feminists are of the latter type, anti-feminists of the former. Madame Roland, in her affectation of shrinking into the political background, is essentially Poseish. In this respect, her whole career was a paradox. For here was a woman founding and dominating a party, for a time guiding the whole movement of the revolution and all the while insisting on the narrowest sex limitations. She was convinced, writes her friend Busk, that woman must owe her celebrity entirely to the esteem she inspires by the exercise of her domestic virtues. Madame Roland, deeply immersed in politics, could yet at the same time write to Bancal, I do not believe it to be in accordance with morals for women to come to the fore. They ought to exert a good influence, to foster and inflame every sentiment useful to la patrie, but they ought not to take any direct part in politics. They cannot come out into the open, agir ouvertement, until all Frenchmen deserve to be called free. Until then, our frivolity and our bad morals will render all that they do ridiculous. Madame Robert and Madame Tallien held the same opinions. Women's domestic duties, wrote Madame Robert, forbid her to exercise administrative functions. The companions of men ought not to be their rivals, said Madame Tallien. The only progressive measure either of them ever advocated were Madame Robert's proposal that health inspectors should be appointed in order to introduce some improvement into the miserable conditions prevailing in the hospitals, and Madame Roland's and Madame Tallien's demand for more educational advantages for women, but only that they might be fitter companions for men. All three of them were in this respect the Mrs. Humphrey Wards of their day. With the exception of short-lived newspapers like Bouche de Fer, the whole press of the day was anti-feminist, and one of the most influential revolutionary journals, Les Révolutions de Paris, under the direction of Prudhomme, 
for years carried on a vigorous anti-feminist campaign, mercilessly attacking all the feminist leaders and the women's clubs. Like other anti-feminists, the contributors to this newspaper were inconsistent, for while they maintained that woman has no concern whatever with anything outside the walls of her home, they called on women to assemble round the altar of La Patrie, there to swear that they would never marry an aristocrat, that they would bear lighted torches into the Tuileries Palace, and that they would redouble their ardor when the country was invaded. Did women then gain nothing at all from the revolution? Olympe would not allow that they had benefited in any way whatever. But she was wrong. The revolution had conferred on women two new social rights, the right to divorce and the right to equality of inheritance. Revolutionary women, as we have seen, did not hesitate to exercise this right to divorce. Husbands, too, in considerable numbers availed themselves of it, and we have already mentioned the club for divorced women, Les Dames en état de divorce. Like certain clubs of the present day, it was a blend of the club proper and the pension. Among its advertised attractions were a piano, a harp, and a harpsichord. It owed its existence to la citoyenne neveu, and its quarters were the mansion then known as l'Hôtel de Soubise, in which the national archives are now kept. One of the famous divorces of the Revolution was that of the actor Talma and his wife Julie. Julie was wealthy as well as brilliant. Her house in la rue de Chantraine was stored full of priceless treasures, many of which served Talma as theatrical properties. Madame Talma had been a great inspiration to her husband in his profession. But she was seven years older than he. She had been his mistress before their marriage, and after a while he tired of her. Candid friends told Julie of his unfaithfulness. She sued for a divorce, sold her charming hotel to General Bonaparte just home from Egypt, and went to live with her friend Madame de Condorcet in la rue de Matignon. She wrote an account of the divorce proceedings to Louise Fusy. We, Monsieur and Madame Talma, drove to the municipal offices in the same carriage. On the way we talked of all manner of subjects, like people taking a drive in the country. My husband gave me his hand as I alighted. We sat side by side, and we signed our names as if it had been the most ordinary contract. When it was done he escorted me to my carriage. I trust, said I, that you will not entirely deprive me of your society. You will come and see me sometimes, won't you? Certainly, he replied, rather embarrassed but evidently pleased. In spite of all my efforts to control myself, I was pale and my voice trembled with emotion. I went home and gave myself up to my grief. Pity me, for I am very unhappy. Talma kept his promise. He often visited his former wife, and, says her friend Louise, his presence was always a consolation. In many other cases divorce did not involve the cessation of friendly relations between those who had once been married. More than one woman who had divorced her husband risked her life to save his. As time went on, divorces grew more and more common. They were granted for insanity, desertion for two years at least, emigration abroad in some cases, notorious immoral life, and incompatibility of temper. After the Restoration, Louis XVIII's government abolished divorce, and it was not reinstituted until Naquet's law in 1884. The second benefit the revolution conferred on woman, the inheritance law, is enforced today. The statute which forbids a father totally to disinherit his children provides that he shall distribute his possessions equally among his male and female offspring. The far-reaching results of this measure in giving a certain economic independence to the women of France can with difficulty be exaggerated. Indirectly, it has affected the question of women's suffrage for it is this measure of economic independence that blinds many French women to the importance of political enfranchisement. Politically, women at the close of the Revolution were worse off than at the beginning. In none of its aims had the Revolution failed more signally than in the establishment of equality. It was essentially a middle-class movement, and as such it had abolished but a few of the inequalities between classes. Inequality between the sexes, despite the two reforms we have mentioned, it left more strongly accentuated than it had ever been. For relations between men and women, which before the revolution had been regulated by vague custom, were now clearly defined by law and generally to the disadvantage of the woman. The most notable instance is that of the franchise. In 1789, as we have said, 
women were admitted to the outer court of citizenship by reason of a very limited property qualification. But the property vote of 1789 was swept away with other vestiges of the feudalism of which it was a relic. And the revolution left French women, as they have remained ever since, without votes for any governing body. End of chapter 10 End of Women of the French Revolution by Winifred Stevens Recorded by Céline Major.